contemporary patriot opinion expressed no elation, but, on the contrary, disappointment, indignation, and severe censure for an expedition which was said to have been rash in conception, discreditable in execution, and narrowly escaped overwhelming disaster. Asterisk the patriots abused their troops for going into a trap on the peninsula as loudly as the loyalists abused the regulars for not closing the trap, and not pursuing when they had the opportunity. In contemporary opinion Bunker Hill was regarded as having accomplished nothing for either side. Looking back through the long perspective, it of course seems most dramatic and interesting, but that must not be allowed to obscure historic sense. The Patriots wanted no more Bunker Hills. They knew that something very different was required, and, fortunately, at the suggestion of John Adams, the Congress on June 15 had made Colonel Washington, of Virginia, a general, and placed him in command of the unorganized force of farmers at Cambridge. He arrived at Cambridge July 2, and during the whole summer was engaged in trying to persuade the rabble to become an army. This duty was difficult, but not from lack of time, for he had the whole summer and the following autumn, winter, and spring for the purpose. The revolution differed from modern wars in having long periods of quiescence, and we have now reached one of the most striking of these periods. After the Battle of Bunker Hill June 17, 1775, there was, it is true, Arnold's and Montgomery's romantic dash at Canada the following autumn, but there was no fighting in the rebellious colonies, where we would naturally expect it, until the summer of 1776, when Clinton attacked Charleston, South Carolina, June 28, and the Battle of Long Island was fought August 27. England would not in modern times allow such a long interval to elapse in the suppression of independence. It was a great advantage to the patriots to hold themselves independent, unsuppressed, and even unattacked, for a whole year. It helped to prove the Whig position that the Tory ministry had raised a rebellion which they could not suppress, and it increased the possibility of that aid from France which was the dread of England and the best hope of the Americans. The army if we may call it by that name, which was besieging Boston was composed almost exclusively of New Englanders. But it was joined during the summer by a few troops from the frontiers of Pennsylvania and Virginia, who aroused much interest, because they were expected to make deadly use of the rifle at 300 yards instead of using the smooth bore musket, which was useless at only half that distance. Shortly before the Battle of Bunker Hill the Congress passed a resolution for raising six companies of riflemen in Pennsylvania, two in Maryland, and two in Virginia. Subsequently, on June 22, they increased the number of Pennsylvania rifle companies to eight, which were to be formed into a battalion and join the Patriot Army at Boston. Asterisk. During July these eight companies were rapidly recruited in the interior of the colony among the Scotch-Irish frontiersmen and hunters. No money had to be appropriated to buy their weapons, for, like the Boer of South Africa, each one of them procured his rifle by taking it down from the pegs on which it rested above his fireplace. He slung his own powder horn across his shoulder and strapped his bullet pouch around his waist. As for his uniform, it consisted of a round hat, which could be bought for a trifle at any country store, and a garment made at home by his wife, and sometimes called a smock frock, which was nothing more than a shirt belted around the waist and hanging down over the hips instead of being tucked into the trousers. It was the same sort of garment used by farmer laborers, and it was made of the cotton cloth which is now used for overalls, or of ticking such as we use to cover mattresses and pillows. When used in the woods it was called a rifle shirt or hunting shirt, was sometimes ornamented with a fringed cape, and into its ample looseness above the belt were stuffed loaves of bread, salt pork, dried venison, a frying pan, or a coffee pot, until the hardy woodsman became most unsoldier-like in figure. It may be said that our pictures of handsome revolutionary uniforms are very misleading. It is pleasant, of course to think of the revolution as a great spontaneous uprising of all the people, without doubt, hesitation, or misgiving, and that each hero put on his beautiful buff and blue uniform, 
brought to him presumably by a fairy, or found growing on a tree, and marched, with a few picturesque hardships, to glorious victory. But the actual conditions were very different from what most of us have been led to believe. Some companies and regiments tried at the start to have uniforms. We find uniforms mentioned here and there, and boards of officers adopted fashion plates of beautiful garments for all ranks, but there is many a slip between a fashion plate and getting the beautiful garment on a rebel's back. Those who actually saw the Patriot troops in the field described them as without uniforms, very ragged, and at best clothed in homemade hunting shirts. Many regiments stained their hunting shirts with butternut, which was used for a similar purpose by the Confederates of the Civil War. The hunting shirts were usually white, and butternut gave at once the color that the white cotton cloth would assume after a few weeks of dirt and smoke in camp. Washington, in an order of July 24, 1776, recommended the hunting shirt for all the troops. The general, sensible of the difficulty and expense of providing clothes of almost any kind for the troops, feels an unwillingness to recommend, much more to order, any kind of uniform, but as it is absolutely necessary that the men should have clothes, and appear decent and tight, he earnestly encourages the use of hunting shirts, with long breeches made of the same cloth, gaiter fashion about the legs, to all those yet unprovided. Force, 5th series, volume I pp. 676, 677. Lafayette has described in his memoirs the Patriot Army he found in this country on his arrival in the summer of 1777. About 11,000 men ill-armed, and still worse clothed, presented a strange spectacle. Their clothes were party-colored and many of them were almost naked. The best clad war hunting shirts, large gray linen, cotton, coats which were much used in Carolina. As to their military tactics, it will be sufficient to say that, for a regiment ranged in battle order to move forward on the right of its line it was necessary for the left to make a continued counter-march. They were always arranged in two lines, the smallest men in the first line. Ely. P. 19, London, 1887. At first the officers could not be distinguished from the men, but on May 3, 1776, they were ordered to wear colored cockades of ribbon. A major general was marked by a purple or blue ribbon, a brigadier by pink or light red, the staff and the adjutant by green. Asterisk when the French officers appeared among us after the alliance, our officers were often unable to entertain them from lack of decent clothes and food. Many of us have, of course, seen scores of portraits of revolutionary officers in very good uniforms, which do away with all appearance of rebellion. Those were uniforms for a picture, in order that our officers and men might appear as smart looking as European troops, but they were not the garments worn by our ancestors in the war. Good uniforms could always be painted in a picture. Who would have an ancestor painted in a butternut rifle shirt and labeled rebel, when an artist could paint a portrait and paint on it a uniform from the fashion plate of the board of war comma such a uniform as our ancestors would have worn had they had the time and money to obtain one. The Patriot Army consisted for the most part of mere squads of militia, over whom Washington, and even their own chosen officers, had little or no authority except that of enthusiasm and persuasion. The army often melted away before their rise without any power on their part to stop the disbanding. In 1777 the Continental Line was formed of men who enlisted for three years or for the war, and they constituted a small but somewhat steady nucleus, round which the militia squads could rally. The militia served for six or three months, or a few weeks. It was a come and go army and Graydon tells us that the officers as well as the men felt that they could leave with impunity when they were dissatisfied. Asterisk. The rifle companies were rapidly recruited in Pennsylvania and Virginia during July, and as each company got ready it started for Boston, and for several weeks these hardy fellows were scattered along the beautiful route through the mountainous region of Pennsylvania and New York, crossing the Hudson above West Point thence through another mountainous region by Litchfield, Connecticut, 
and on through Massachusetts. Their first destination was Reading, in Pennsylvania, where they received their blankets, knapsacks, and ammunition. These supplies were all they required from the Patriot government, and when these were furnished they immediately sought the enemy. Their expectations from the long range of their weapons were partially realized. The rifle companies did good service, their numbers were increased, and we hear of them in almost every battle. Besides those already mentioned, there was a corps of the Munden McCall, another under Wills, and there were numerous temporary organizations. The British also had a few riflemen, but the rifle was not generally adopted by the military profession until about 100 years afterwards, when the breech loader came into use. As a muzzle loader it was too slow in reloading, and required more care and skill than could be had from the ordinary recruit. To ensure accurate and long range the bullet had to be carefully wrapped in a leather patch and forced with difficulty into the muzzle, often aided by a little mallet. The weapon was also easily fouled by repeated firing, and would then lose its range and accuracy, and become almost useless. At Boston the riflemen seemed to have done little or nothing except to pick off an occasional regular who incautiously showed himself above the line of fortifications round Bunker Hill. Poor the rest of the time they were inactive with the others. One day they picked off an officer in his handsome uniform, and the report quickly spread that this man's income had been ten thousand pounds a year. On another occasion William Simpson, who had accompanied the rifleman as a gentleman volunteer, was shot in the foot and died of his wound. They had a grand funeral over him, and eulogized and mourned for him as though he had been a statesman. Incidents were few in that long summer and autumn, and they had to make the most of anything that happened. It must have been a rare sight to see that Patriot army living in huts made of field stones and turf, or twisted green boughs, some in improvised tents made of sailcloth or any stuff they could stretch over poles, some quartered in friendly houses, some sleeping in Massachusetts Hall of Harvard College, and all the supposed 16,000 scattered in this manner through Cambridge and half round Boston, with the patient Washington and the humorous Green trying to coax them to submit to discipline. General Green was a Quaker from Rhode Island, there were many jokes at his expense, and Washington made a point of referring to him all suggestions of peace. Asterisk. There was cannonading almost every day from the British. Thousands of balls and shells were fired during the summer with the most trifling result. The ground was ploughed up, the apples came rattling down in the orchards as the big missiles thumped the trees and the shells spluttered among the limbs. Occasionally a ball would pass through a house, filling every room and the plates and dishes with a cloud of plaster dust. McCurtin tells us of a loyalist who, being, one evening, the only man in company with a number of young patriot women, began to abuse the Congress. The girls seized him, tore off his coat and shirt, and, instead of tar, covered him to the waist with molasses, and for feathers took the downy tops of flags that grew in the garden. Patriots deserted to the British, and regulars deserted from the army in Boston and came into the Cambridge camp in twos or threes. Sometimes they had to swim the water which surrounded Boston, and were not infrequently drowned in the attempt. McCurtain kept a steady record of their arrivals, and they were heartily welcomed to the Patriot ranks, which were believed to be growing to such stupendous numbers that they would soon be able to overwhelm all the armies that could be sent from England. Asterisk. Asterisk some of the Patriot pamphleteers, for the sake of encouraging their party, made most extraordinary statements of the number of troops that could be raised. In the farm refuted, Hamilton, Works, Lodge Edition, Volume I. p. 158, it is said that America would have at least 500,000 soldiers, while England could send only 15,000. Another writer places the number at 300,000 to 400,000, considerations on the measures carrying on with respect to the British colonies, etc., 5th edition, p. 25, London, 1774. The famous loyalist pamphlet, Plain Truth, says that, after deducting Quakers, Anabaptists, 
and loyalists, the patriots might have 60,000 to 70,000 capable of bearing arms. As it turned out, the British government sent Howe over 50,000 men, and Washington never had 25,000. There seems to have been a systematic exaggeration of numbers at this time, as well as later on, in the revolution. It could not be very well prevented, because the officers were quite willing to have it so. There was much coming and going, and consequently an apparent increase, because some of the men were returning to their farms, and others were coming in to take their places. The best instance of the exaggeration is a passage in McCurtain's journal, of September 20th, this day also our army is computed to be above 60,000, and that we have taken and killed of the regulars 2,500. This was a very gross exaggeration. The army was never above 16,000, and as soon as autumn came it quickly decreased to less than 10,000. It was an army in which, in most instances, you could not distinguish the captain or the colonel from his men, an army in which there were applications every day for leave to go home to help get in the hay, or to see how the wife was getting on, and, if leave were granted, the fellow always took his allotment of powder with him to shoot squirrels and he seldom brought any of the powder back. Shaving was more universal than now, and the greatest fuss was made over it. It was believed that it could be made a good starting point for regular discipline, and a colonel was sometimes seen shaving one of his own men. The New Englanders of the time, and more especially the lower classes, were full of what the colonists' father South called the leveling spirit. Their horrible manners are described by Mrs. Knight in her diary of 1704, and at a much later date in Mrs. Grant's memoirs of an American lady. The rank, crude, and unpleasant side of democracy seems to have had its first foothold in New England. Mrs. Grant describes the disgust of the New Yorkers when they were first invaded by the Yankees, whose insolent and brutal abuse of rank and titles was as revolting as their nasal drawling voices and their uncouth phrases and slang. They would fasten themselves upon you, pressing you with their drawling questions about your most private affairs, railing in the meantime against aristocrats and orating on liberty and the eternal rights of man. They were the beginning of a class which, becoming inflated by the success of independence, spread over the country to the horror of all well-educated people and in fulfillment of loyalist prophecies. They gave Grant the material for his famous speech in Parliament, and many years afterwards they furnished the stock material for Dickens and other Englishmen who found profit in ridiculing the Americans. In the army before Boston leveling was so necessary that the officers, instead of cultivating the usual severity and dignity of manner, were obliged to cultivate the most extreme and absurd humility. It was their only way of controlling their men who were almost out of their minds on the subject of equality. Graydon gives us some amusing glimpses of this. He was not with the army before Boston, but he saw the New England troops the next year at New York. The appearance of things was not much calculated to excite sanguine expectations in the mind of a sober observer. Great numbers of people were indeed to be seen and those who are not accustomed to the sight of bodies under arms are always prone to exaggerate them. But the propensity to swell the mass has not an equal tendency to convert it into soldiery, and the irregularity, want of discipline, hat arms, and defective equipment in all respects, of this multitudinous assemblage, gave no favorable impression of its prowess. The materials of which the eastern battalions were composed were apparently the same as those of which I had seen so unpromising a specimen at Lake George. I speak particularly of the officers who were in no single respect distinguishable from the men, other than in the colored cockades, which for this very purpose had been prescribed in general orders, a different color being assigned to the officers of each grade. So far from aiming at a deportment which might raise them above their privates and thence prompt them to due respect and obedience to their commands, the object was, by humility to preserve the existing blessing of equality, an illustrious instance of which was given by Colonel Putman, the chief engineer of the army, and no less a personage than the nephew of the major general of that name. 
what I says a person meeting him one day with a piece of meat in his hand, carrying home your rations yourself, Colonel yes, says he, and I do it to set the officers a good example. Memoirs, edition of 1846, p. 147. See, also, Stedman, American War, edition of 1794, p. 206, London. A colonel often made drummers and fifers of his sons for the sake of the small additional revenue to his family chest, and a captain was known to have made money by stealing blankets. Small money making, pettiness, and pilfering of every kind were so rife as to cause Washington and many others the greatest discouragement and anxiety. The first outburst of the rights of man was by no means promising or in good taste. Many of the New England regiments had Negroes mixed promiscuously among the white troops, which, to a person like Graydon, coming from no farther south than Pennsylvania, had a very disagreeable and degrading effect. He also noticed that none of the subordinate officers belonged to the upper classes of colonial society. Accustomed to a totally different state of things farther south, he inquired the cause, and was curtly told that the sons of such people had all been sent to Europe to be educated and to keep out of harm's way. Probably the real reason was that such men could not have controlled the troops gone mad with leveling. Graydon also tells us of the famous Connecticut cavalry troop composed of rather elderly men who had armed themselves with their long, single barrel duck guns that were used in those days. The barrel alone of one of those guns was seven feet long. When the tallest man stood leaning on one it extended two feet above his head. Those cavalry duckers were worth going a long way to see. The loyalists always made much sport of the northern patriot cavalry and their old farm and cart horses of every color some with long tails, some with bobtails, and some with no tails at all. But if a Connecticut ducker could get a rest for his old piece across the back of the horse, and a red coat would stand still for a while at about forty yards, he would surely make great windows in his stomach, as they did at Bunker Hill. It is always very easy, however, to ridicule the appearance of a rebel army. No army of freedom or independence was ever well dressed. There was plenty of good fighting material at Cambridge. Daniel Morgan, the commander of the Virginia Riflemen, was one of those frontier characters of superb manhood and intelligence, of which we have, fortunately, had many specimens down into our own time, but with another generation they will have all passed away. He was not appreciated by the Congress, but at the close of the war he showed remarkable military capacity. He was a powerful looking man and capable of rousing the enthusiasm of his men. General Putnam, or Old Put, as they called him, the hero of the French War, was the life of the camps. In his shirt sleeves, which was his usual summer garb, with an old hanger slung by a broad strap across his brawny shoulders, he was to be seen everywhere, and he was clamorous to have a fight every day. People listened by the hour to the tales of his cutting out expeditions and adventures. The troops who believed in leveling could have no objection to him as an officer, for he was a plain jovial farmer. When their Boston Port Bill went into effect he started from his farm in Connecticut with 130 sheep, driving them before him to Boston to relieve the suffering of the people. 12. There is no mention of any colors or flags carried by the farmer troops at Cambridge, and possibly they had none. A flag for the Patriot cause had been designed about this time, and was used soon afterwards. It had on it a pine tree and a coiled rattlesnake about to strike, with the motto, Don't tread on me. It was a good enough pirates or smugglers flag, the loyalists said, a very proper air drag of rebellion, undignified, crude, with the snake as the emblem of low cunning, ingratitude, and treachery. Paul Jones was so disgusted with it that he was hardly willing to hoist it on his ship. The stars and stripes were not designed until nearly two years afterwards. 13. 17. The Attack Upon Canada The attempt to take Canada was the most aggressive and daring effort that the Patriots made during the war. It might have been successful, but the success could not have been long continued. 
because we had not sufficient force to hold such a large tract of country, unless a large part of its population would join our cause. It was an invasion of British territory, an invasion of a colony that had not rebelled or voluntarily joined us, and in that respect it might appear inconsistent with our position of merely defending our own liberties, and might by some be thought to justify England in acts of the severest retaliation and suppression. But as we were at war with England our people thought that the more vigorous war we waged the better. Canada was a vulnerable point, and might perhaps want to join us. The attempt was made in the first flush of enthusiasm for the rights of man, when it was fondly believed by many that they could put in the field fifty thousand or even several hundred thousand men. A year or two later, when great difficulty was experienced in keeping together an army of ten thousand, they realized how utterly out of the question it was to take Canada, or hold it if they should take it, and no more attempts on it were made. The strategic importance of Canada was obvious, because the line of water communication, up the Hudson and through Lake Champlain to the Street Lawrence, if controlled by Great Britain, would enable her to cut the colonies in half, isolate the New England colonies, and separate them from the less rebellious communities to the south. This line of water communication was one of the great natural highways of that time and might come into the complete control of England if she continued to hold the upper end of it in Canada. During the inactivity of the summer of 1775 two bold expeditions were planned, which, by their united efforts, would, it was believed, drive out the small force of British in Canada, secure the adhesion of the French population to the new colonial union, atone for the mistake of not securing that adhesion sooner and punish England for passing the Quebec Act establishing Romanism and despotic government in such close proximity to New England. The first expedition was put under the command of General Philip Schuyler and General Richard Montgomery, but by the ill health of Schuyler the whole command soon fell to Montgomery, who had been a British soldier and had served with distinction in America during the French War. He was an Irishman by birth and education and his father had represented Lifford in the British Parliament. In the French War General Montgomery, like Howe and Barr, had been a close associate of Wolfe and had partaken of his liberalism in politics. In fact, Montgomery went so far in liberalism that he left the army in 1773 and settled in New York, where he bought a farm near King's Bridge, and married Janet Livingston. He is described as a very efficient soldier and a man of most attractive personality and bearing. In reading about him one cannot help being reminded of George Howe, and the thought naturally occurs that a slight change in circumstances or slightly increased conviction might have led all of these men, Barr, Burke, Admiral Howe, and General Howe, to follow Montgomery's example and remove themselves to America. In his expedition against Canada, Montgomery at first met with the most encouraging success. He proceeded by the route of Lake Champlain, fighting his way to the Street Lawrence, and so long as he was successful some of the Canadians were willing to join him. The British governor and commander, Guy Carleton, abandoned Montreal and retreated down the river to save Quebec. Montgomery entered Montreal and prepared to unite in an attack on Quebec with Benedict Arnold's expedition which had moved directly against Quebec through the main wilderness. Arnold had visited Quebec and traded there in horses and merchandise, and was supposed to be familiar with its people and fortifications. His dash through the wilderness was desperate, romantic, and very American in its character. He was to lead his men through more than a hundred miles of unknown forests, swamps, mountains, lakes, and rivers, impenetrable by the military methods of Europe, and to emerge suddenly from these fastnesses into the heart of the enemy's country, and by surprise and strategy attack his great citadel. He was to proceed from the coast of Maine up the Kennebec as far as its waters would carry him and then cross the watershed as best he could to the Chaudia, which would bear him to the Street Lawrence. He took with him about 1,100 men most of them ordinary New England musketmen from the army at Cambridge, but to complete his force he was given three companies of the riflemen, selected by lot. 
the companies on which the lot fell were Daniel Morgan's Virginians and Matthew Smith's and Hendrick's Pennsylvanians. A great many of Arnold's men kept journals of their experiences, and several of them, notably those by Henry and Morrison, are most graphic and vivid in their descriptions. Asterisk. Towards the end of September Arnold's troops marched from Cambridge to Newburyport, where sloops and schooners took them across the Gulf of Maine to the Kennebec, and very seasick they were before they entered the river. At Fort Weston, where Augusta now stands, their boats were ready for them, rough bakes, built of common boards, 220 of them, very badly constructed and leaky. They started up the stream, rowing and pulling, in four divisions a considerable distance apart, with the indefatigable Daniel Morgan and his Virginians at the head. But soon they could neither pole nor row in the rocky stream. The men jumped overboard and dragged the boats, wading in the cold water all day, often sinking to their necks or over their heads in the deep pools, upsetting the leaky boats, losing provisions and often guns. They reached carrying places where they had to transport the heavy bakes and cargoes round falls and rapids. The black soil was soaked with rain, and they sank knee-deep, stumbling over stones and roots and fallen logs. With the heavy batter grinding into their shoulders, or almost dragging their arms from their sockets, as they carried it on hand spikes, a misstep of one man in the mud would bring the whole party, batter and all, to the ground. They would rise, covered with black mud, cursing and laughing, and laugh still louder to see the next boat crew in a similar plight. The glory and enthusiasm of the rights of man was heard on every side. They were no coerced soldiery, they said, and the officers were given to understand that they must know their place and keep it. The men had taken charge of the expedition and tolerated the officers as assistants. They bluntly let it be understood that for any officer to attempt compulsion would be fatal, for the men were going through to Quebec of themselves. Soon they were amazed at the sights they saw. The swamps, thickets, and hillsides were covered with a vast network of the fallen trees of centuries, through which a man could climb and crawl at scarcely a mile an hour. Their most violent efforts with the baits could move them at only about six miles a day. The character of the country through which they passed has been greatly changed by lumbering operations and fires. The woods are less encumbered and dense, there is less water, and the Chordia has become a less important stream. They saw in the black mud the great hoof marks of the moose. Almost every day they would rouse some of the strange, ungainly creatures from their lairs to see them disappear with a crash into thickets that seemed impenetrable to a squirrel. There seemed to have been few if any deer, and the riflemen killed scarcely any game. They were apparently working so hard with the boats that their weapons were seldom ready, and the necessity of pressing forward prevented any delay for hunting. It would have required a great deal of hunting and consequent delay to kill enough moose to feed a thousand men. Aaron Burr, the son of the president of Princeton College, a mere lad, and an adventurous one accompanied the expedition in the capacity of what was called a gentleman volunteer, uncommissioned and unlisted. He found a pretty Indian maiden, Jikataqua, of a romantic disposition, whom, with her dog, he persuaded to accompany him and help hunt. He took her all the way to Canada, where it is supposed the nuns near Quebec befriended her and her child that was born there. They reached Dead River, which was to connect them with the headwaters of the Chaudia. It was deep, black, and still, but they had so few paddles or oars that they could take but little advantage of the lack of current, and it was too deep for their setting poles. Famine had set in, provisions, guns, ammunition, and the money for wages had been lost from the leaky, overturning boats. Colonel Enos and three companies of musketmen in the rear, appalled at the difficulties, had abandoned the expedition and returned to Massachusetts. It was the end of October, cold and snowing. Torrents of rain had swollen the streams, overflowed the shores, and made nearly the whole country a black morass. To send the sick back with the guard and press on was the order agreed upon. Arnold and a small party started ahead to reach the Canadian settlements and send back provisions. 
the romance was fading, and even the rights of man and equality seemed less glorious. They had reached the Chordir and decided to abandon their boats with the exception of one or two to carry some of the crippled and sick who would not give up. It was downhill to the street Lawrence on the rushing Chordir. But the river was too swift. The boats narrowly escaped being dashed over falls, and all took to the land along the shore. The situation had become alarming. Jesting and good nature had ceased. When a rifleman fell headlong in the mud no gay voice sang out, come here and I'll pick you up. Some of them killed and ate a pet dog, comma flesh, skin, and entrails, and then boiled the bones. They dug roots out of the half-frozen mud with bleeding hands. They boiled and ate their extra moose skin moccasins. Some six hundred men, strung out in a long line by the chord deer, a line that reeled, stumbled, and fell, and bent up and down over the high wooded hills, were these the conquerors of Quebec? Dazed, delirious, half blinded by famine and exhaustion, they would look back as they ascended a hill to see others falling over one another and rolling down the opposite slope. On the top of the hill they would halt as if calculating whether their strength would take them down, and then they would start, felling over logs and stones and sending their guns flying into the muddy snow. Then up the next slope they would wearily go, pulling themselves by any twig and bush that seemed to offer assistance. Every man for himself, was the word now passed along the line, and there were loud protests against it. But stern necessity compelled it. The strong were convinced of it, and they stopped their ears as they left a companion who had taken his last fall over a log and could rise no more. On November 2nd Morrison emptied the bullets out of his leather pouch and boiled it, and soon all of his comrades were boiling bullet pouches. Then the leather breeches were cut up. A mere twig across the way would now bring the strongest man to the ground. And still it was on and on while from every hill they could see a thousand more monotonous wooded hilltops stretching away forever and ever like a bad dream, with the rushing chore deer always winding in and out among them, as if it too could never escape. The men at the head of the line saw cattle driven towards them, and men leading horses with great sacks laid across their backs, and they sat down and stared at one another as if this was part of the bad dream. But it was true, Arnold had returned from the Canadian settlements with provisions, and soon great fires were built and the beef and potatoes were cooking, and the men with the horses were going back along the line to restore the dying. Arnold himself arrived, strong, enthusiastic, and jovial. The French Canadians were on their side, he said, and would give provisions, and Montgomery had already beaten the British in Canada and taken many prisoners. So, after those who would not listen to reason had killed themselves with overreaching, all that was left of the expedition marched down among the French Canadians, and truly those simple-minded people looked with blank amazement at the pale ghosts and spectres with muskets in their shadowy hands, coming out of the impenetrable winter forest to drive the English from the continent. They reached the shore of the Street Lawrence at Point Levi. The British had removed all the small boats, and the Americans saw the strongly fortified Quebec, 1200 yards away across the water, guarded by armed merchantmen and two men of war. They caught a little midshipman, 15 years old, who, imprudently venturing ashore, was deserted by his boat's crew, and his good-natured and plucky refusal to give information amused the grim hunters. They had set out with 1,100 men. 300 had gone back with Colonel Enos. The sick that returned and their guards had been 200. The wolves were gnawing the bones of 80 or 90 in the woods. Those who stood looking at Quebec half-armed and in rags were about 510. The expedition had already failed. The dash through the main wilderness had produced nothing but a tale of disaster and some interesting diaries and reminiscences. The 1,100 men would have been more efficiently used if they had been sent with Montgomery by way of Lake Champlain. They were now too late to take Quebec by surprise, as possibly they might have done earlier. Letters sent forward by Arnold, as he supposed to friends, 
and by trusty messengers, had fallen into the hands of Guy Carlton, the commander of Canada, a capable and energetic officer, who was prepared to defend Quebec to the last. But Arnold and his men were as hopeful as ever. They collected canoes and dugouts from great distances, and on the night of November 13, by the skillful still paddling of the hunters, they dodged the merchant vessels and men of war and landed before Quebec on the plains of Abraham. Arnold soon after sent to the town a summons of surrender, but his flags were fired upon and the summons never received. Many of his men believed that they could now take the town by assault. But conservative councils prevailed, and they waited to be joined by Montgomery. Meantime, General Carlton, hearing of the danger that threatened Quebec, abandoned to Montgomery unfortified Montreal, which it was useless to attempt to hold, and escaped by daring and good luck down the street Lawrence. He entered Quebec by water and his forces were soon raised to some 1800 men. He felt confident of holding Quebec and making it a base from which to save Canada. Sir Guy Carlton, afterwards Lord Dorchester, was an accomplished and rather interesting man. He is said to have suggested the Quebec Act, and probably learned from subsequent experience that it was a mistake. He is described as firm, humane, and of the most unvarying courtesy under all circumstances. He was troubled with no Whig principles or doctrines of the rights of man, although he had been Wolfe's quartermaster general. He believed in subduing the colonies by the most overwhelming severity and force, but that all rebel prisoners, after a short confinement, should be allowed to return to their homes on parole, to be afterwards, if advisable, exchanged. Montgomery soon joined Arnold, and they began the mild siege of Quebec. They built breastworks of snow and poured water on them to freeze them solid, for scarcely any earth could be scraped from the frozen soil. Such protections were easily shattered by the enemy's cannon, and the American artillery was of such small caliber and so ineffective that the women came out on the ramparts of Quebec to ridicule it. But the riflemen were very effective. Creeping close to the walls and sheltering themselves behind houses, or any object that presented itself, they dealt destruction with their tiny bullets to any incautious soldier in the town. The addition of Montgomery's troops raised the American force to about 1,200 men, hardly enough to take such a stronghold as Quebec. To take it by siege seemed impossible. An assault must be tried, and they grimly waited for their opportunity, while the winter snows fell deeper and deeper. The signal finally agreed upon was to come from nature comma a snowstorm at midnight. The evening of December 31, 1775 was an intensely cold one, the men were scattered among the farms and tippling houses enjoying themselves and keeping warm. But as they started to return to their huts the snowstorm began. Soon it was a stinging blast carried horizontally along the ground and cutting the face. By two o'clock in the morning they were hurrying through it, every man holding the lapel of his coat wrapped over the flintlock of his gun, stumbling and falling in the snow drifts. Montgomery, with his aid, Macpherson, of Philadelphia, and also, it is said, accompanied by Aaron Burkham Asteris led the attack on one side of the town, and Arnold on the other. Arnold's command was a long column, almost in single file, with Daniel Morgan and his Virginians in front and the Pennsylvanians closely following. Presently were heard the sharp reports of their rifles at the first barrier. The riflemen sent their little bullets through the portholes with such unerring aim that the gunners were killed or driven from their posts. Morgan was the first to spring upon the barrier and throw himself down among the enemy. The rest of the column followed and swept the English before them. Those who were not riflemen quickly seized the excellent English muskets from the dead and wounded in place of their own inferior weapons. Arnold was wounded in the leg before the barrier was taken and had to be supported back to the American camp. The taking of the first barrier led them into the lower town, and they rushed through it up a street to another barrier, from which the cannon and the muskets of the Englishmen were spitting flame through the dim light of the driving snow. The riflemen again tried their device of shooting carefully into the portholes, but it failed. 
the cannoneers and musketmen were too well settled at their work. Pennsylvanians and Virginians were falling on every side. It was strange that they were not all killed, for the British had them hemmed within the narrow street. As the wounded rolled over into the deep snow they quickly died of the intense cold which stiffened their limbs into the last frantic or fantastic attitude of their death agony. There was confused fighting in the streets and houses for a long time. Some of the Americans rushed up close against the barrier, they crowded under it in a mass, the cannon could not be sufficiently depressed to reach them, and they could inflict instant death on a musketman who showed himself at a porthole. In the lull they called out to the English to come out and fight in the open. Come out and buy our rifles, they shouted, they are for sale cheap. The tall, powerful figures of Morgan and Hendricks were conspicuous in every part of the fight encouraging the men. The stentorian voice of Morgan could be heard above all the din. He fought like an ancient knight, a curder lion, killing Englishmen with his own hands and in one of the intervals disguising himself and penetrating far into the town to learn its condition. The rear of Arnold's column arrived with scaling ladders, which they threw against the barrier. But the neighboring houses were filled with English, and volleys of musketry were poured upon the assailants. They could not longer crouch under the barrier or man the ladders. The barrier could not be carried, and the Americans were ordered into the houses. They battered down the doors with butts of guns and rushed up to the windows in the full belief that they could shoot all the gunners in the barrier. Pennsylvanians and Virginians were aiming their rifles through every opening. It was at one of these windows that the gallant Hendricks was shot. He staggered back into the room and fell across a bed in the corner. There was now a short time when the Americans, thoroughly convinced of the hopelessness of their task, might have drawn out and escaped. Some of them did so, especially the few Indians and Canadians who had joined them. These hurried down to St. Charles Bay and started across the two miles of ice heaped up by the tide and full of air holes deceptively covered by the snow. The rest were presently caught in the streets and houses as in a trap. General Carlton sent Captain Laws on a sortie out of the palace gate, and he came in behind the Americans in the street. On the other side of the town Montgomery broke through the palisades by the aid of his carpenters, and, rushing in, shouted to his men, Push on, brave boys, Quebec is ours. He was met by the discharge of a cannon from a barrier which stretched him and his aide, Macpherson, lifeless on the snow. It was subsequently learned that the British were so demoralized by the onset that they were retreating from the barrier which could easily have been carried and the town entered. But Colonel Campbell, who succeeded Montgomery in command, ordered a retreat. The attack on Quebec, whatever may have been its possibilities, had failed. It is supposed that about 600, or half the American force, were killed, wounded, or prisoners. It was a sad fate for so many of Arnold's column to have to surrender after such a gallant struggle, and be ridiculed for the piece of paper pinned on their hats on which was written liberty or death. Morgan, weeping with vexation, at first refused to surrender, and, placing his back against a wall, with his drawn sword in his hand, defied the enemy to take it from him, but he finally consented to hand it to a priest whom he saw in the crowd. The officers were confined in what was called the seminary, and the privates given a less comfortable jail. The English, as often happened afterwards, were much amused at finding the officers to be men of no social position. You can have no conception, wrote Major Caldwell, what kind of men composed their officers. Of those we took one major was a blacksmith, another a hatter, of their captains, there was a butcher, a tanner, a shoemaker, a tavern keeper, etc., yet they pretended to be gentlemen. Asterisk. Henry who was among the prisoners, relates the extraordinary appearance of the dead whom he saw hauled through the streets in carts. They were frozen as stiff as marble statues in every imaginable attitude of agony or horror. They were tossed into the carts like rigid boards, with outstretched arms, pointing fingers, and contorted legs and necks. Among the privates who were prisoners, those who admitted that they had been born in England, Scotland, 
or Ireland were told that they had their choice of enlisting in the British Army or going to England to be tried for treason. Under the advice of their comrades, and in the belief that the oath of allegiance under those circumstances would not be binding on any conscience, about 95 of these men enlisted, and took their chances of an opportunity to desert. Two of them, Connors and Kavanaugh, soon made an opportunity for themselves. They walked up to a sentinel guarding the edge of the high precipice that surrounded part of Quebec, and offered the man a bottle of rum. While the sentinel hesitated they wrenched his gun from him, knocked him down with the butt of it, and then ran to the precipice and leapt over. It was a daring leap, but in some respects a safe one, for the snow was drifted twenty feet deep at the bottom. They nearly suffocated in the drift but managed to scramble out while the British were shooting at them from above. Cannon balls and grape shot were fired at them as they ran over the snowy roads, but they escaped out into the country where the remains of Montgomery's and Arnold's commands still maintained an unconquered and sullen siege of Quebec. The privates that remained in the jail planned a most ingenious method of escape, which failed by a mere accident. Most of them were heavily ironed and looked forward to a hard fate, from which, however, they were unexpectedly released the following summer. Carlton, with the greatest kindness, set them all free on parole, and a year or so afterwards they were regularly exchanged. This treatment was in striking contrast to the cruelty and suffering usually inflicted on the patriots in English prisons. It released Morgan and saved his health to win the Battle of the Cowpens. The prisoners were taken in a ship to New York Bay, in the summer of 1776, and turned loose on the Jersey Shore at midnight. Morgan threw himself flat on the ground and kissed it. They then all ran a race to Elizabeth, where they danced, sang, and gave the Indian war whoop for the rest of the night. Arnold clung to his position in the snow before Quebec all the rest of the winter, keeping up a feeble and ineffective blockade of the old town which regularly received its most important supply, firewood, in spite of all he could do to prevent it. In April General Wooster moved up from the Patriot position at Montreal, superseded Arnold for a time, and cannonaded Quebec. But General Burgoyne arrived from England with large reinforcements. The British marched out of the town and began slowly driving the Americans from Canada. They beat them badly at the Battle of Three Rivers, halfway to Montreal, killing and taking prisoners, and scattering hundreds of them in the swamps and woods. Carlton then issued a remarkable proclamation addressed to those dispersed Americans. They were perishing, he heard, from hunger and cold, and, lest a consciousness of past offences should deter such miserable wretches from receiving that assistance which their distressed condition might require, he promised that, if they would surrender, they should be cared for in the hospitals, and, when restored, should be free to return to the rebel colonies. This policy was much admired by some of the loyalists, who said that if it had been universally carried out by all British commanders it would quickly have ended the rebellion, because there would soon not have been a rebel willing to fight an empire of such generous liberality. There was no officer in the British army, it was said, so dangerous to the cause of independence as Carlton. One but it is not reported that any patriots took advantage of his proclamation. Prisoners whom he released, of course, spoke highly of him. But the independence movement was beyond the reach of kindness and conciliation, as the ministry soon discovered. Slowly but surely Carlton defeated and hammered out of Canada the little patriot army under Arnold. They made a good retreat, however step by step, all that summer and autumn of 1776, down the Sorel River and down Lake Champlain, where they fought naval battles, until at last they stopped in Old Fort Ticonderoga. It has been supposed that Carlton could have pressed on to Albany or even to New York, but he was content with having saved Canada for his government. He accomplished more than any other officer in the British service, except Clinton. He held open the upper portion of the water communication down the Hudson Valley, and in the following year Burgoyne started down by it to meet Howe halfway from New York and cut the colonies in half. In March, 1776, just before Arnold's retreat began, a committee, 
composed of Franklin, Samuel Chase, and Charles Carroll, of Maryland, went to Canada to help win it to the side of the revolted colonies. John Carroll, a Roman Catholic priest, accompanied them in the hope of influencing the French Canadian clergy. It was a terrible journey for them in the month of March, and nearly cost Franklin his life. They found only defeat and disaster and large debts contracted by Montgomery's army with the Canadians, which could not be paid. The Canadians were friendly to the extent of supplying the Revolutionary Army with food and treating them with kindness. They wished us well, they would accept us if we were successful. Many of the English held a neutral position, waiting to see what we could do. But there was no strong spirit of independence or rebellion among either the French or the English. The French hated Carlton, who held them down by martial law, and they hated the British regulars who kicked and cuffed them, but their temper and character were altogether of the submissive kind. They knew little or nothing of the rights of man, and were rather shocked by them. They could see no proof of their merit in the rough followers of Arnold and Montgomery who brought with them a depreciated paper currency and the smallpox. Our troops sometimes forced supplies without paying for them, even in paper, and it is probable that many of them, especially the New England troops, found it difficult to conceal their contempt for the Canadian religion. The French-Canadian peasantry were possessed of very limited intelligence and knowledge. They knew little or nothing of the merits of the rebellion to the south of them except that it had originated in Boston, and they called all the troops Bostonians. They had no training in self-will, smuggling, or semi-independence, like their southern neighbors. They had not the heart to fight losing battles, and to fight such a power as England seemed to them madness. They were altogether lacking in what Graydon called revolutionary nerves. Asterisk. Their priests were against us, and refused absolution to those who joined the Americans. Our wild boys finally found a priest who absolved rebels for a salary, and the promise of a bishopric if we conquered Canada, but he could not, it seems, work fast enough to add a new state to the American Union. The attack upon Canada as an invasion of British territory was a bad failure, but it was superb in its daring and confidence, its possibilities as well as its impossibilities. If it had been more successful we might have won more quickly the alliance of France. Considered in all its circumstances, the persistent slowness with which, even after defeat, it was abandoned, and its picturesque romance, it was the ablest and most striking, the best, as it was the first of all the Patriot campaigns. It was well, however, that it did not succeed, for the Canadians would not willingly have amalgamated with us, and die attempt to force them would have been contrary to our principles, and would have involved discord, cruelty, and suffering. They were, and still are, a naturally separated people, far removed from our way of thinking, and their best career, if they should succeed in separating from Great Britain will be in developing an independent Canadian nation. 18. The Evacuation of Boston and the Declaration of Independence In October, 1775, when Arnold's expedition was on its perilous march through the Maine woods, General Gage retired and Howe took supreme command. During that same autumn Lord George Germain became Colonial Secretary and the Ministry's means of communication with the commander in America. The rebellion extended from Maine to Georgia, but England, with 10,000 troops cooped up in Boston and the possibility of the loss of Canada, was not making a very vigorous beginning in the way of suppression. Such a rebellion could never be suppressed by merely holding Boston, which was of no strategic importance. It might be held for years while the rebels in the rest of the country created an independent nation and became self-sustaining. The only way to conquer the rebel country was to occupy such portions of it as would effectually break up the union of the patriots and prevent intercourse among them. This plan, reinforced by a blockade of the coast to prevent supplies entering by sea, followed by the destruction of any regularly organized armies the patriots might form, forcing them to mere guerrilla warfare, which could be gradually suppressed, was the natural method of subjugating America. The ministry seemed to have had some such plan in mind. 
their strategy, as it gradually unfolded itself, was first of all to occupy New York City, and make that the headquarters of British control. From New York City the line of the Hudson Valley all the way to Canada must be secured, which would immediately isolate New England, the hotbed of sedition, from the other colonies, and cut off not merely the interchange of ideas, encouragement, and reinforcements of troops, but also the provisions and supplies which New England drew from the more fertile agricultural communities to the south. In New England itself they finally decided to hold only one point, Newport, because it was the most convenient harbor south of Halifax for sailing vessels to enter and take shelter. They could easily beat into it, in almost any wind, while at New York, in addition to the difficulty of beating in against headwinds, the water on the bar was at the time very shallow and some of the men of war could not cross it. 2. South of New York the strategic position was the line of Chesapeake Bay, with strong positions in Virginia and Maryland, as at Alexandria and Annapolis, with, perhaps, part of the Susquehanna River. This line, if well held, would isolate the middle from the southern colonies and stop communication. As for the south, the best method of controlling it was found to be by occupying Charleston, Georgetown, and two or three points on the Santee River in South Carolina. It is easy to see that if this strategy had been vigorously carried out with a sufficient force, aided by a blockade of the coast, there was every probability that the Patriot Party would soon have been driven to mere guerrillaism, and from that to a retreat beyond the Algonies, which Burke so eloquently described, and for which Washington was prepared. As the war developed, only part of the British plan could be carried out. Newport was held during most of the war, as was also New York, until after the Treaty of Peace. But for reasons with which General Howe was largely concerned, the vital line up the Hudson to Canada could not be secured. The position on Chesapeake Bay was not seriously attempted. It would have required a larger force than could be spared from more important places. General Charles Lee, when a prisoner, recommended it to Howe, and General Cornwallis was in favor of the Virginia part in preference to holding South Carolina. The South Carolina position was taken towards the end of the war and most securely held until broken up, and in effect abandoned, by the rather extraordinary conduct of Cornwallis. Independently of these strategic positions and theories, the important thing, as in all wars, was to break up and destroy our armies by defeating them in battle, followed by relentless pursuit and by devastating and ruining the country from which our armies drew their supplies and moral support. This method, for reasons which will be explained, was not carried out by the Ministry and General Howe during the first three years of the war, and after that, with France, Spain, and the whole continent of Europe aiding us, it was too late. To defend themselves against the British methods of attack, the Americans pursued three lines of conduct. The first was to prevent the British from securing control of the line of the Hudson Valley. This was the great contention and controlling motive of the first three years of the war. The Patriots could not prevent the British occupying the city of New York, but by holding what were called the Highland Passes and forts near West Point on the Hudson, and by preventing Burgoyne from coming down from Canada, they completely balked the accomplishment of this most important British movement. West Point and the Highland Passes constituted the most important American strategic position. It was this position which Arnold intended to surrender to the British so as to end the war at one stroke, retain the colonies for the British Empire, and save them from falling into the hands of France. In the last years of the war, after the French alliance, and when the British held South Carolina and the city of New York, it seemed as though General Clinton, by conducting raids from those two positions, might be able to wear out the Patriot Party and suppress the rebellion without holding the line of the Hudson Valley. This was the most serious period for the Patriots, comma, the time when, even with the assistance of France, their cause was almost lost. They had the choice either of trying to drive the British out of New York or of trying to drive them out of South Carolina. 
In no other way could they break the very exhaustive raids and wearing out methods which the skill and energy of Clinton were inflicting upon them. They abandoned the attack upon New York as too difficult, and turned their attention to South Carolina, where at first they were disastrously defeated, but soon afterwards were most fortunately and unexpectedly aided by Cornwallis's strange notion of changing the British position from South Carolina to Virginia, a movement which brought about his surrender at Yorktown in 1781. Map showing the strategical points which might be occupied by the British Army to obtain complete military control of the colonies, viz., Newport, New York, with the line of the Hudson Valley to Canada, Chesapeake Bay, and Charleston, with outposts in South Carolina. This brief review of the theory of the war will disclose the meaning of the military movements. The Ministry wanted how to abandon Boston that autumn of 1775 and go at once to Long Island, where he could procure provisions in a fertile country, among a loyalist population, receive supplies from the sea as easily as at Boston, and be ready to take New York when reinforcements should be sent to him. 3. But he refused to do this, because he did not think he had sufficient ships to carry him there, and he remained inactive in Boston all winter. He was in America to enforce the Acts of Parliament against which he had voted, and it was asking a great deal to expect him to prove that his own convictions and those of his party were at fault, or to expect him to be very actively severe against a people with whose cause he sympathized. Moreover, the Ministry had announced that their policy was to be a combination of the sword and the olive branch, and how, by reason of his associations and experience in America had been selected as well qualified to carry out this method of conciliation. The force under Washington at Cambridge, which the first enthusiasm raised to 16,000, dwindled down as soon as winter came to less than 10,000. For weeks at a time the Patriots had no powder except what was in their cartridge boxes. It is difficult to believe that Howe did not know of this with all the intercourse through the lines, the numerous desertions the loyalists, and his spies. 4. His large reinforcements, it is true, had not yet arrived, and his army was something less than 10,000. But when we consider that he was the most experienced and most intelligent officer of Great Britain, and that his personal courage was beyond dispute, it is a little extraordinary that he made not the slightest attempt to take the aggressive. He was allowing himself to be shut in by an undisciplined force, sometimes equal to his own in numbers, sometimes fewer, always wretchedly equipped, and at times without ammunition. He allowed his enemy's force to be disbanded under his eyes and sent to their homes while others came to take their places. Washington was amazed. Search the volumes of history through and I much question whether a case similar to ours is to he found common namely, to maintain a post against the flower of the British troops for six months together, without, and then to have one army disbanded and another to be raised within the same distance of a reinforced enemy. Apostrophe Ford, Writings of Washington, Volume 3. p. 318. In January Clinton left Boston with a small force, and, sailing southward to the Carolinas, was joined by a larger force from England under Sir Peter Parker, accompanied by General Cornwallis. On June 28 they made a fruitless attack on Charleston, which was heroically defended by the Carolina Patriots under Moultrie. In Boston that winter General Howe began a romantic attachment for a loyalist lady, Mrs. Loring, who accompanied his army through the three years of his campaigning, and was often spoken of by the officers as the Sultana. She encouraged the general in his favorite amusement, for she was passionately devoted to cards and capable of losing three hundred guineas at a sitting. Her influence secured satisfactory arrangements for her husband, who was given the office of commissary of prisoners, which was an opportunity for making a fortune. 5. Being thus provided with a congenial companion, abundant leisure for card playing, and with the war going exactly as a good Whig would wish it to go. It is difficult to tell how long Howe might have remained in Boston were it not for the unkind and possibly impolitic perversity of the rebels. 
Dorchester Heights and Nukes Hill commanded Boston from the south as effectually as did Bunker Hill and Breeds Hill on the north. How could have seized and fortified Dorchester at any time during those long months, but he would not do it. The farmers could not occupy it because they had not enough cannon. They were able, however, to collect cannon from all over New England, and they dragged down many on sledges during the winter all the way from Lake Champlain. When they were all collected, Washington, on the night of March 4, 1776, began a tremendous cannonading all round his lines, to which the British replied. It's impossible, says McCurtain, I could describe the situation. This night you could see shells sometimes seven at a time in the air, and as to cannon, the continual shaking of the earth by cannonading dried up our wells. Under cover of this tumult a couple of thousand men with wagons, cannon, and bales of hay, made a detour far inland behind the hills, where the rumble of the wheels on the frozen ground could not be heard, and suddenly descended upon Dorchester Heights. The earth was frozen so hard that they could not dig entrenchments, but they made breastworks of the bales of hay on Dorchester Heights, and some days afterwards took possession of Nukes Hill. How directed Lord Percy with a force of 2,400 men to attack Dorchester, but a rainstorm coming on, the expedition was abandoned, and the Americans remained in peaceful and undisturbed possession of their new stronghold. Howe was determined to make not the slightest resistance. He decided to evacuate Boston without firing a shot, and Lye made a very peculiar sort of informal agreement with Washington, that if he would not fire on the British they would leave the town without doing it any injury. Asterisk he withdrew with his army on March 17, accompanied by some 2,000 loyalists, and sailed away to Halifax. Another extraordinary circumstance of this evacuation was that he did not consider it necessary to follow the usual military rule of destroying the ammunition and supplies that he was compelled to leave behind, or to make any arrangements to prevent the supply ships that would soon arrive from falling into the hands of the Patriots. He left as a present to the rebels over 200 cannon, tons of powder and lead, thousands of muskets, and all sorts of miscellaneous military stores. From that time the favorite toast in the rebel camps was, General Howe? They were not again favored with such profuse assistance until some years afterwards, when France began to send them supplies. To the loyalists and to the Tories in England this seemed a strange proceeding, this going to Halifax and deserting the rebel country when he could have gone to Long Island or to Staten Island just as well. In the previous November he had declined to go to Long Island because he had not sufficient shipping. But now when he seemed to have sufficient shipping, his going to Halifax was almost like retreating back to England. What greater encouragement could he give to the rebellion without actually taking its side? His Whig friends in Parliament were delighted. It was another piece of strong evidence to show that the war was impracticable, and the thunders of Whig eloquence again resounded. At this important juncture, when the British army had abandoned the rebellious colonies, and the rebellion was apparently victorious, with most of the colonial governors and British officials driven out of the country or prisoners, the patriots in the Congress decided to declare independence. This decision was reached within a couple of months. The time of actual debate on it occupied less than a month for it was on June 7 that Richard Henry Lee offered his resolutions which formed the basis of the Declaration of July 4. The first instructions to any set of delegates to urge an immediate declaration were given on May 22 by Virginia. The question of declaring independence, or speaking of it openly, was still, as it had always been, purely one of policy. In the Congress at Philadelphia, in the spring of 1776, we find the delegates differing very seriously as to the advisability of declaring it so soon. The argument against an immediate declaration seems to have been that we had not been sufficiently successful in arms, and nothing but success in arms would make the declaration respectable. We must wait till we had secured the alliance of France. A reverse in battle in our weak state would make the declaration seem contemptible and destroy the possibility of help from France. We were not yet sufficiently united, 
and the declaration would alienate many who had not grown accustomed to the thought of complete independence. At first the colonies stood seven in favor of an immediate declaration common namely, the four New England colonies, Virginia, North Carolina, and Georgia. The conservative minority, led by Dickinson, was made up of Pennsylvania, South Carolina, New York, New Jersey, Maryland, and Delaware. It was very important, however, to have a unanimous vote, and great exertions were made to have the Patriot Party in every colony instruct its delegates to vote for an immediate declaration. Previous to July 2, when the final decision was made, four colonies were still in opposition. Of these, the vote of the Pennsylvania delegation was carried for the declaration by Dickinson and Robert Morris absenting themselves. Delaware, whose vote had been evenly divided, was brought over by the arrival of Caesar Rodney, and South Carolina was also persuaded. The New York delegation, being without fresh instructions, declined to vote. But the decision was almost unanimous, and on July 4 the formal paper prepared by Jefferson and his committee was adopted. Such men as Dickinson and Robert Morris still held to their opinion that the declaration was premature. It was an improper time, said Morris, and it will neither promote the interest nor redound to the honor of America, for it has caused division when we wanted union. It seems to have alienated many people who were hesitating and increased the number of the loyalists. Men like Morris and Dickinson could soon point to terrible disasters, and the Patriot cause sunk almost to its lowest ebb, and the declaration did not bring us the alliance of France, which came at last only as a result of a great Patriot victory in the field. On the other hand, the declaration gave the real Patriots a rallying point. It showed their purpose, interested the French king and was a basis for his action when a victory convinced him of the advisability of an alliance. It was probably well to declare independence as soon as possible after what seemed to be our first distinct success, because it was a long time before we had another, and we never had one which at once put all the British troops out of the country. Those who advocated an immediate declaration seemed to have relied on several circumstances which they thought had prepared the minds and sentiments of the Patriot Party. The Congress had recommended the Patriot Party in each colony to abolish their charter or any connection they had with England and set up a constitution and an American government of their own, to do, in short, what Massachusetts had already done under the Suffolk resolutions. This, it was hoped, would commit them more than ever to independence, and break up the sentiment which attached them to the old order of things. The Patriots were now at work on these constitutions in all the colonies except Connecticut and Rhode Island, which, always having enjoyed practical independence, required no change. Two atrocities, as they were called, had been committed by the British. Norfolk had been sacked and burned by Lord Dunmore, the Governor of Virginia, and Portland, in Maine had been shelled and burned by Lieutenant Mowat in revenge for his arrest in the town and interference with the crews of British cruisers. These were, in a sense, accidental, and not part of the plan of either how or of the ministry, but they were believed to have won over many doubting patriots and to have given them sufficient active hatred of England. Cruelty and atrocity by the British were supposed to be important in winning over the doubtful. Lord North and the Ministry seem to have had this in mind in their olive branch policy and in their wish to be forbearing and moderate. From their form of government and steady attachment heretofore to royalty, wrote Washington at this time of the Virginians, my countrymen will come reluctantly into the idea of independence. But time and persecution bring wonderful things to pass. Asterisk. The declaration was received very quietly by the people both patriot and loyalist. There was none of the flourish and excitement with which we are familiar on its anniversary. Mrs. Deborah Logan, sitting at the window of her house at the corner of Fifth and Library Streets, in Philadelphia, heard the formal reading of it before what is now Independence Hall, and records in her diary that few people were present except some of the lower orders. Captain Graydon, who was with part of the Patriot Army, tells us that the troops also took the announcement very quietly. They regarded it as a wise step, 
though closing the door to accommodation or compromise. Asterisk. We also find some of the troops expressing their feelings in words which sum up the whole doctrine of independence. Now slash they said, we are a people. We have a name among the states of the world. Asterisk. 19. The Battle of Long Island. While the Congress was debating in June the question of independence Howe was on his way back from Halifax. He could not stay there indefinitely, because there were limits within which he must keep his conciliatory policy, and he was about to receive the large reinforcements which the ministry had been preparing to send him, and which were necessary for an effective occupation of the rebel territory. On June 30, two days before the final vote on independence, he arrived at Staten Island, opposite New York. On July 12 his brother, Admiral Howe arrived with a large fleet and reinforcements. Some 12,000 Hessians also arrived, the first of these troops to reach America. Clinton, returning from his fruitless attack of June 28 on Charleston, still further increased Howe's forces. The whole British force of subjugation was thus concentrated on New York, and it was a huge army to have been sent across the Atlantic in those times. Its size has been variously stated, sometimes at 26,000, but according to the best sources of information, without counting the sailors and marines in the fleet, how had the before New York 34,614 men in good health and perfectly armed and disciplined? The fleet included 52 large war vessels, 27 armed sloops and cutters, and 400 transports. Asterisk. The ministry had exerted themselves to the utmost to supply such an overwhelming force as would render the acceptance of their conciliation and peace policy a certainty. The olive branch was twined round a most stupendous sword. But Howe was continually calling for reinforcements and in his narrative he complains that they were not sent. During the three years of his command in America they sent him, according to Galloway, over 50,000 men, and Lord North told Parliament that it was over 60, 000 asterisk with which to destroy ragged rebel army that only once reached 20,000 and usually varied between 4,000 and 10,000. How did not at once attack and take New York? which he might easily have done while the Patriot forces were weak and unprepared. He remained on Staten Island nearly two months. He and his brother, the Admiral, were very anxious to conclude some sort of Whig or compromise peace. The Admiral had succeeded in obtaining from the Ministry a qualified authority to make peace, and he seemed to have had much confidence of success relying perhaps on the large and threatening military and naval force to compel a compromise without fighting. He sent a flag and messengers to Washington, and it was in these negotiations that he addressed his letter to George Washington, Esquire, ignoring his title of general. He had been instructed not to recognize the Congress or admit legitimate authority in anyone. For this reason, and because Washington had no power to treat with him, the attempt came to nothing. The Admiral expressed great regret that he had not arrived before the adoption of the Declaration of Independence, which had now made his mission of peace more difficult. As for Admiral Howe's naval operations during his command, they were certainly good Whig methods, but most exasperating to loyalists like Galloway. In 1776 the Admiral had with him 56 war vessels, and in the next year he had 81. He could have placed them within sight of one another along the coast from Boston to Charleston. But he never attempted any such blockade. He maintained a blockade of New York and a partial blockade of the Delaware Bay and the Chesapeake. But his vessels were easily evaded. American ships and small privateers, which preyed on English merchantmen, found a safe entrance at Egg Harbor, on the Jersey coast, whence, by way of the Mullica River, goods were hauled in wagons to Philadelphia and other points. His blockade of the Chesapeake was easily avoided in the same way by means of the Machipongo Inlet, 25 miles above Cape Charles, and in the Carolina Sounds the Americans did as they pleased. When asked why he did not commission loyalist privateers to destroy American merchantmen, the Admiral is said to have replied, will you never have done oppressing these poor people?
will you never give them an opportunity of seeing their error? He was a most ardent believer in conciliation. 6. When his peace negotiations at Staten Island failed there was nothing that he and his brother could do but take New York and see what effect that would have in bringing about a satisfactory compromise. The town at that time extended from the Battery only to Chatham Street, and the point of land on which it stood was much narrower than it is now. Breastworks and Redoubt, planned by General Diaries Lee and a couple of committees, had been thrown up along the shores of both rivers and cannon planted in them. How strong these fortifications were cannot be determined, for no serious attempt was made upon them by Admiral Howe. After the Battle of Long Island he seems to have entered the East River without any serious opposition from them. There is every reason to suppose that he could have demolished them and knocked the town to pieces with his large fleet. But the policy of the Howes, and apparently also of the Ministry, was to destroy no towns and to do no devastating. This brings us to the important question in the conduct of the war. How far was the conduct of the Howes a carrying out of their own ideas and those of the Whig party, as the loyalists charge, and how far was it merely obeying the olive branch instructions of the ministry? Numerous declarations of Lord North and the ministry in Parliament, and the testimony before the Committee of Inquiry, show that the ministry intended some sort of severity, coupled with some sort of extreme mildness, a severity which, without great injury, devastation, or cruelty, would, as Germain expressed it, lead America to see her error, and discover that she could not be truly happy but when connected with some great power. Asterisk it has been supposed that the Howes were placed in command because, being Whigs, and having had very friendly associations with the Americans, they were well fitted for carrying out such a policy. But in the end, Lord North, Lord George Germain, and the whole ministry declared that they were disappointed in the methods and conduct of the Howes. 7. The ministry, it seems, had at last, through the secretary for the colonies, Lord George Germain, written letters to the Howes calling for more severity in the conduct of the war. Fox Reed in Parliament extracts from these letters which seemed to require that the war should be so conducted as to convince America of the determination to prosecute it with unremitting severity. Eight, the Ministry and the Tories seemed to think that these instructions had not been obeyed. General Howe, in his defence before the Committee of Inquiry, denied that he had received such instructions, and his statement is most interesting and significant. 4. Sir. Although some persons condemned me for having endeavoured to conciliate His Majesty's rebellious subjects, by taking every means to prevent the destruction of the country, instead of irritating them by a contrary mode of proceeding, yet am I, from many reasons, satisfied in my own mind that I acted in that particular for the benefit of the King's service. Ministers themselves, I am persuaded, did at one time entertain a similar doctrine and from a circumstance not now necessary to dwell upon, it is certain that I should have had little reason to hope for support from them, if I had been disposed to acts of great severity. Had it been afterwards judged good policy to turn the plan of the war into an indiscriminate devastation of that country, and had I been thought the proper instrument for executing such a plan, ministers, I presume, would have openly stood forth, and sent clear, explicit orders ambiguous messages, hints, whispers across the Atlantic, to be avowed or disavowed at pleasure, would have been paltry safeguards for the honour and conduct of a commander-in-chief. Cut. Parliamentary History, Volume 20. pp. 682-683. If the suspicion which seems to be in Howe's mind were correct, the Ministry wished to avoid the responsibility of severe devastating measures because the cruelty of them would arouse Whig eloquence and perhaps increase the Whig forces to a majority. If, however, by means of expressions, the meaning of which was uncertain and could be avowed or disavowed, they could lead Howe, a Whig general, into measures of severity, the blame for cruelty, if the measures failed, could be shifted to a Whig, and if the severity succeeded in bringing about a peace or compromise, the cruelty would be of little moment or soon forgotten. The instructions or messages which Fox read in Parliament, and which Howe said were ambiguous whispers across the Atlantic, 
seem to be contained in two or three letters written to her by Lord George Germain, the colonial secretary. The first one is dated March 3, 1777, and was received by Howe on May 8. After regretting the loss at Trenton, enjoining care against similar accidents, and referring to certain inhuman treatment said to have been inflicted by the rebels upon Captain Phillips, the letter closes by saying, and here I must observe that if that impudent people, in contempt of the gracious offers contained in the late proclamation, shall persist in overt acts of rebellion, they will so far aggravate their guilt as to become altogether unworthy of any further instances of His Majesty's compassion, and as they who insolently refuse to accept the mercy of their sovereign cannot, in the eye of impartial reason, have the least room to expect clemency at the hand of his subjects. I fear that you and Lord Howe will find it necessary to adopt such modes of carrying on the war that the rebels may be effectually distressed, so that through a lively experience of losses and sufferings they may be brought as soon as possible to a proper sense of their duty, and in the meantime may be intimidated from oppressing and injuring His Majesty's loyal subjects. Apostrophe Parliamentary Register, House of Commons, 1779, Volume 11, p. 394. Bancroft quotes a passage from a letter which he says was sent at this time, but follows his custom of giving no authority for it. At the expiration of the period limited in your proclamation, it will be incumbent upon you to rise the powers with which you are entrusted in such a manner that those persons who shall have shown themselves undeserving of the royal mercy may not escape that punishment which is due to their crimes and which it will be expedient to inflict for the sake of example to futurity. Bancroft, History of the United States, edition of 1886, volume V. p. 146. In another letter, written February 18, 1778, and received by Howe April 14, Germain says that the king has accepted Howe's resignation, but he is to remain until his successor arrives and the letter goes on to describe the serious attempt at peace the ministry was making by sending out a strong commission for that purpose, and adds that the king has full confidence that while Howe remains in command he will lay hold of every opportunity of putting an end to the rebellion and inducing a submission to legal government. If the rebel colonists obstinately refuse the offers of the peace commission, every means will be employed to augment the force. In the prosecution of the war, at the close of the letter Howe and his brother, the Admiral, are directed to make such an attack upon the New England coast as will destroy the rebel privateers and incapacitate the people from fitting out others. This expedition against New England Howe declined to make, giving as his reason that it was too hazardous, because of the fogs, flatness of the coast, together with other very peculiar excuses. Asterisk. Asterisk Parliamentary. Register, 1779, Volume 11, pp. 462-466. It is necessary to warn the reader that owing to the peculiar way in which the parliamentary register is published, there are often two volumes bearing the same number and distinguishable only by their dates. The contents of these letters have been given somewhat at length in order that the reader may judge for himself whether they are ambiguous. They do not contain positive instructions, and yet they do not appear to have been considered ambiguous by Fox and Meredith, who commented upon them in Parliament. They showed what the Ministry wished the General and the Admiral to do. They are very like numerous other directions and suggestions in the other letters from Germain printed in the Parliamentary Register. How was not sent out to America under binding or positive instructions. 9. He was sent out, as is usual in such cases, with full discretionary power to suppress the rebellion, and at such a great distance the ministry was obliged to assume that, as a rule, he was the best judge of his surrounding circumstances. As commander-in-chief he could take the responsibility of refusing to carry out a direction or request of the ministry if he deemed it unwise impracticable, or too hazardous, unless he had positive instructions that it was to be carried out at all hazards on the responsibility of the ministry alone. He knew all the political, military, and other conditions of the time, and had assumed responsibility for his actions. 
while I myself incline to the opinion of Galloway and the loyalists that he adroitly stretched the conciliatory and olive branch part of the ministry's policy so as to favour the Whig party in England and the Patriot party in America, and while I think that it is only on this supposition that his extraordinary military movements can be explained, I do not wish to force this opinion on readers who have not had my opportunities of examining the evidence, I have endeavoured to give the facts and the sources of information in such a way that anyone, if he wishes, can form a contrary opinion, and believe that Howe was merely carrying out in letter and in spirit the policy of the ministry, or that he was the most extraordinarily stupid and ignorant bungler that ever held the position of commander-in-chief. The Patriot Military Forces at New York when General Howe first arrived, were only about 10,000. His delay of nearly two months allowed them the opportunity to increase this number. Enthusiasm and rumours soon had their numbers up to 45,000 or 50,000. It had seemed to both the Patriots and their Congress that before long they must surely have that number. Many expected more. But by the actual returns made by Washington, his forces, all told, were only 20,275. Of these the sick were so numerous that those fit for duty were only about 14,000. The large sick list was apparently the result of shocking unsanitary conditions, which for long afterwards were characteristic of the Patriot camps, and in winter they were always afflicted with the smallpox. Besides disease which was so prevalent among them, they were a most badly armed, undisciplined, disorderly rabble, marauding on the inhabitants and committing all kinds of irregularities. Ten except a few troops, like Smallwood's Marylanders, they were for the most part merely a collection of squads of farmers and militia bringing with them the guns they had had in their houses. It was no longer exclusively a New England army. It contained numerous troops from the Middle and Southern colonies, and its size may be said to have indicated the high watermark of the rebellion under the influence of the Declaration of Independence, and the belief that a great victory had been gained some months before by compelling how to evacuate Boston. It was the largest number of patriots that were collected in one army during the whole war. To handle such a disorganized mob so as to offer any respectable resistance to Howe's superb army was a task requiring qualities of homely, cautious patience and judgment which few men besides Washington possessed. John Jay, General Charles Lee, and others believed that no attempt should be made to hold New York. The risk of an overwhelming defeat was too great. In fact, the General Patriot plan for that summer of 1776 was to wear it away with as little loss as possible. It was a delicate question to decide, and no doubt a great deal could be said in favor of making a present of New York to the British without a battle, allowing them to lock themselves up there and reserving the Patriot force to check their subsequent expeditions. But Washington seems to have been influenced by a principle of conduct on which he frequently acted. He must make some sort of resistance to Howe's entering New York if the rebellion and its army was to retain any reputation. He also wished to delay Howe so that after settling in New York he could make but few expeditions into the country before winter dot asterisk. Washington was obliged to use nearly half of his effective force in the fortifications and in guarding various points in the town. The most important place to defend was Brooklyn Heights, on the Long Island side of the East River, directly opposite New York, and commanding it very much as Bunker Hill or Dorchester Heights commanded Boston. If Howe took Brooklyn Heights, he had the city. Washington accordingly sent across to these heights some 8,000 of his men under Putnam, who made rough entrenchments of earth and fallen trees. These 8,000 men were, of course, in a trap, for if Howe attacked them in front, their chance of escaping across the river was doubtful, and he could absolutely prevent it by sending the fleet into the river behind them. Military critics have commented on this risk and the only answer is that, under all the circumstances, Washington thought himself justified in taking the chances rather than abandon New York without a blow. General Howe proceeded to dispose of the Patriots on Brooklyn Heights, and he showed the same perfect knowledge of the ground and of the enemy opposed to him which he afterwards displayed at Brandywine, 
he also showed his skill in winning easily so far as it suited his purpose to win. He had remained on Staten Island from his arrival on the 30th of June until the 22 d of August, when he took across to Long Island about 20,000 asterisk of his men, a force which was certainly ample for defeating the 8,000 Americans on Brooklyn Heights. Between Brooklyn Heights and the place where Howe had landed on Long Island there was a wooded ridge, and a large part of the Patriot force, leaving their breastworks at Brooklyn Heights, went out on this ridge to check the advance of Howe's army. Their right was commanded by William Alexander, of New Jersey, or Lord Sterling, as he was called from a lapsed Scotch title which he had ineffectually claimed, and their left was commanded by Sullivan, of New Hampshire. This movement in force to the ridge has been criticized as risking too much, because the army was not organized or elicited, and had not the sort of troops necessary for advanced positions. Asterisk. Several roads led directly from Howe's position to the ridge and to Brooklyn Heights. On the night of August 27 he sent nearly half his force by these roads, Grant on the left along the Shore and Heister with the Hessians on the right. Taking the rest of his force under his own personal command, Howe, with Clinton and Cornwallis, went by another road far to the eastward, and, making a long detour, came upon the American flank and rear just as the battle was beginning with the regulars and Hessians, who had come by the direct roads. The timing of the movement was most exact and successful, and the Patriots, as usually happened, had no means of obtaining information or detecting a movement of this sort. Sullivan's division, which had Howe on its flank and rear and the Hessians in front, were nearly all killed or taken prisoners. Sullivan was taken hiding in a field of com. Alexander's division, composed of Delaware troops and Smallwood's famous Marylanders, made a most desperate and heroic stand for four hours against the regulars under Grant and succeeded in escaping back to the fortifications at Brooklyn Heights, but with heavy loss in killed and prisoners, and Alexander was captured. Among the prisoners, Graydon tells us, was one of the famous Connecticut cavalrymen armed with a long duck gun, who was compelled to amble about for the amusement of the British Army. When asked what his duties had been, B is said to have replied, to flank a little and carry tidings. Map of the Battle of Long Island. Clinton, Cornwallis, and Vaughan all urged how to pursue the rebels at once into their entrenchments, and the common soldiers were with difficulty restrained from pressing on. He admitted that the entrenchments might be easily taken, but declined to take them in that way. He thanked his officers for their zeal and advice, said enough had been done for one day and that the entrenchments could be taken by regular approaches with less loss. The battle was a curious one, because it now largely depended upon the direction of the wind. It had apparently been intended to use the men of war, and possibly send them into the East River behind Brooklyn Heights. But the wind was northeast, and after beating against it they were compelled to anchor when the tide turned, and only one vessel, the Roebuck, exchanged shots with Bedhook. Possibly Howe expected that in making his approaches the next day the fleet would cooperate with him, go round into East River, and entrap the force at Brooklyn. But the wind continued from the northeast, with rain. Washington crossed over to Brooklyn Heights, raising the force there to possibly 10,000 men. He remained there all that day, evidently believing that as long as the wind blew northeast he was safe. The next day the wind and rain continued, but the British were pushing their approaches, and Washington was unwilling to trust to Providence any longer. He collected boats, and that night, although it became bright moonlight, he slipped all his men safely across to New York, although, according to Stedman, Howe knew of the movement in time to have prevented it. 11. Instead of following up his advantage, as a policy of severity would require, Howe now remained on Long Island for over two weeks. The Patriots were astonished. Twelve when he finally entered New York he allowed the Patriot Army plenty of opportunity to evacuate the town, and made no attempt to hem them in on the narrow island. Thirteen landing near what is now 33rd Street, 
he occupied the high ground between 5th and 6th avenues and 35th and 38th streets. Most of the Americans had escaped northward, but Putnam was still within the town with 4,000 men. He also escaped northward by the Bloomingdale Road, passing within sight of the British right wing unmolested while Howe and some of his officers were lunching with Mrs. Robert Murray at that part of New York still known as Murray Hill. Mrs. Murray was a patriot, and, as the pretty story goes, invited Howe to lunch for the purpose of delaying him and saving Putnam's force, or, at any rate, her offer of lunch and entertainment, as we are solemnly informed by historical writers, is supposed to have had that effect but that how and the officers with him and all the other officers who were not at the lunch were deceived in this way is absolutely incredible. There must have been an intention to move easily and give the Patriots every chance. The lunch at the Patriot House and the jokes that are said to have passed at the table were a part of the conciliatory method thus far adopted by the ministry or by how? They appear to have thought that under this method the movement for independence would finally collapse, but under modem British methods Mrs. Murray would have been captured and locked up in a reconcentrado camp. But why detail all the extraordinary care and pains Howe took at this time? Must he do what the Whigs had said was impossible common namely, crush the rebellion? Had he not instructions from the ministry to be lenient and hold out the olive branch? The peace negotiations were renewed by the Admiral, and this time he addressed himself directly to the Congress through General Sullivan, who had been taken prisoner. The Congress allowed an informal committee to meet the Admiral on Staten Island, where he entertained them at lunch in a rustic bower of branches. But as his peace powers extended no farther than the issuing of full pardon on return to allegiance and obedience, nothing could be accomplished. He afterwards issued a proclamation containing vague promises or intimations that in return for obedience all objectionable acts of Parliament would be repealed. As a Whig he undoubtedly intended to accomplish a settlement which would give him the reputation of having solved the American problem and be very advantageous both to the Patriots and to his own party in Parliament. He seems to have believed that if the ministry had given him proper authority he could have settled the question by conversation with the leading patriots. He had tried hard to get from the ministry sufficient authority for that purpose, and delayed his departure from England for two months in the hope of obtaining it. 14. After escaping from New York, Washington's army went no farther than to the upper end of the island, where, at Harlem Heights, along the Harlem River, he fortified himself in a strong position. He could be forced from that position or entrapped within the narrow strip of land on which he was if a British force went around behind him to the north. Howe started to entrap him in this way, and both Lafayette and Stedman agree in saying that Washington would have remained in the trap had it not been for General Charles Lee, who urged him to go out to White Plains, from which it was easy to retreat. 15. Howe confronted him there on October 28 and took by storm a small American outpost on Chatterton Hill. But he would not attack Washington's main force, although, in the opinion of most people, he had a chance to inflict on it irreparable damage. 16 He admitted in his narrative that he could have inflicted some damage, but would not tell why he refrained, except to say that he had political reasons and no other for declining to explain and his confidential friend, Cornwallis, when questioned before the Committee of Inquiry, made the same enigmatical statement. We are therefore left to the inference that he was either trying to bring about a compromise by lack of severity or that he was determined to stop just short of crushing the rebellion and prove the Whig position that the rebellion was unconquerable. Map showing the movements of Washington and how to White Plains. The Patriots still held Fort Washington, on the Hudson, two and a half miles below King's Bridge. Washington was in favor of abandoning it, but between the bungling of the Congress and General Greene it was retained and reinforced. It was not really a fort, but an open earthwork without a ditch or outside obstruction of any consequence, and with high ground in its rear. It had no barracks, casemates, fuel, or water. The troops that were supposed to be holding it found that they could protect themselves better by remaining outside of it. 
but it was decided to retain it against the British for the sake of inspiriting the Patriot cause, and the New Englanders, Graydon complains, were quite willing to see the southern troops, some 3,000 Pennsylvanians and Marylanders, sacrificed in the attempt. There was desultory fighting round them for many days, and Graydon's descriptions are interesting. There was the Patriot lad of 18 who killed a regular and brought in his shining, beautiful arms, such a contrast to the brown and battered American weapons, and those shining arms were with much ceremony formally presented to the boy at evening parade. There was the sergeant who killed a British officer, stripped him of his uniform, and wore it like a glittering peacock in the Patriot camp. Graydon describes the British soldiers as absurdly bad marksmen. They threw up their guns with a jerking motion and pulled the trigger the instant the gun reached the shoulder. Ten of them fired at him within forty yards and missed him. Fort Washington was practically within Howe's lines. He took it because it was almost thrust upon him, and he had also the advantage of one of its garrison deserting and revealing all its approaches. So he plucked the ripe plum, almost ready to drop into his lap, with trifling loss on either side, and had another large batch of ragged prisoners for the amusement of his officers. Graydon, who was one of them, gives most vivid descriptions of the scenes. They were threatened with the butts of guns, reminded that they would be hung, and, cursing them for damned rebels, mock orders were given to kill prisoners. The patriots had any sort of clothes and accoutrements they could get and some of their equipments had once been the property of the British government. Graydon had a belt with the British Army Marks G. R. stamped upon it, and as soon as this was recognized it was wrenched from him with violence. The officers surrounded them in crowds, and were as much amused as they had been in Canada at the inferior social condition of the Patriot captains and lieutenants. As the names were written down there were shouts of laughter at each tattered farmer who announced that he was a captain, or capon, as one of them pronounced it. Young officers, insolent young puppies, anxious to show that they were soldiers, were continually coming up to curse the captives in affected Billingsgate, and to parade them over and over again under the pretense of looking for deserters. Fort Lee, on the other side of the Hudson, was untenable and the rebels abandoned it as they should have abandoned the so-called Fort Washington. It was a terrible clearing out and wiping up for the supporters of independence. In spite of all his restraint, Howe was accomplishing more than he intended. The great size of his army and the two battles it fought at Long Island and Fort Washington so demoralized the patriots that their force was cut in half and was melting away. Lee was on the east side of the Hudson, with 7,000, soon reduced by desertions to 4,000. He refused, though repeatedly requested, to join Washington, who, having retreated into New Jersey, was now falling back towards the Delaware. Washington wished to keep himself between Howe and Philadelphia, which everyone now supposed would be taken by the British. Washington, however, could not have offered any real resistance to a movement against Philadelphia because as he kept retreating his force dwindled until, when he crossed the Delaware, he had only 3,300 men. This retreat through New Jersey brought another storm of abuse upon Howe from the Loyalists and Tories. They could not understand why Washington and his handful of men were not all captured or destroyed long before they reached Trenton. Cornwallis, who was a Whig member of Parliament and Howe's most trusted and confidential officer, had been sent into New Jersey with 5,000 men, apparently to capture Washington. But although Washington moved slowly Cornwallis never came up with him. A Hessian officer entered in his diary that Cornwallis had been instructed to follow until the Patriots should make a stand, and then not to molest them. 17 Cornwallis admitted before the Committee of Inquiry that Howe had instructed him to stop at New Brunswick. He could, he said have disregarded this order, but saw no opportunity to pursue, and his troops were too tired. They must have been very tired, for, reaching New Brunswick December 1st, they did not reach Trenton until December 7th. They rested 17 hours in Princeton, and took 7 hours to march the 12 miles from there to Trenton, where Washington crossed the river just ahead of them, 
taking all the boats. How, with reinforcements, bad joined Cornwallis at New Brunswick, and went with him to Trenton so as to make sure of careful work, and he certainly succeeded in securing as much slowness and caution as though Washington had outnumbered him ten to one. Philadelphia could easily have been taken and occupied by the overwhelming numbers of the British, but Howe would not do it. He said he had no boats with which to cross the Delaware, when the lumber to make boats and rafts was lying in piles before his eyes in Trenton. Asterisk. The situation expressed in figures is the most extraordinary one ever recorded. Comma, a victorious army of 34,000 declining to end a rebellion represented by only 3,300 wandering, half armed guerrillas. No great nation, no general representing a great nation has ever before or since accomplished such a feat as that. For Ellis' victory at Long Island, however, the king now made her a knight companion in the Order of the Bath. He had done so much, in spite of himself, in spite of his obvious desire to nurse the rebellion for the sake of Whig politics, that he had almost crushed it. One vigorous pursuit, one following up of any one of his advantages, any of the usual methods of war, might have been an overwhelming disaster to the patriots. The loyalists awaited impatiently the blow that would give them their country again under the orderly government of the British Empire. The patriots had now no army, only wandering, scattered commands. Their congress had fled from Philadelphia to Baltimore, it was a migrating congress, carrying its little printing press and papers about the country in a wagon, meeting at Lancaster, York or any place that was safe, for many a day afterwards, and Washington prepared to retire to the West as a guerrilla marauder. We must then retire to Augusta County in Virginia. Numbers will repair to us for safety, and we will try a predatory war. If overpowered, we must cross the Algony Mountains. Apostrophe Irving, Washington, Volume 2. Chap. Xli Thus the romantic retirement of the patriots to live among the Indians and the buffalo, which Burke had so eloquently described, very nearly came to pass. It would have been a migration away from British rule very much like the grand trek of the Boers of South Africa in the next century, and some fierce and free republics might have grown up in the Mississippi Valley. Among the supposed disasters of the patriots was the capture of General Charles Lee after he had crossed the Hudson into New Jersey. He had been a British officer, but joined the Patriot side apparently from belief in Whig principles. He was one of those curious Englishmen who down to our day have been able to impose themselves on Americans. He talked in a striking, clever manner, with a shrewd affectation of great knowledge of the world and high society, which is a form of humbug that our people have always been very slow to detect. He gained some of the credit, which properly belonged to Moultrie, for having defended Charleston, he had assisted in preparing the defenses round New York, and was believed to have rendered most valuable assistance to the Patriot cause by advising Washington to move from the Harlem River to White Plains. These services secured for him a continuance of American confidence, and the two dogs which always accompanied him helped to keep up his eccentric and conspicuous character. He had been 32 years in the British Army, the last 12 on half pay, and had never had command of a regiment. His chief military service had consisted in wandering about among the courts and armies of Europe, where he talked himself into notoriety, and was given a generalship in Poland. He despised American soldiers and had no confidence in their ability to withstand British regulars. So far as he had any convictions, they seem to have been half loyalist, somewhat like those held by Arnold. He did not believe in the Declaration of Independence, or believed in it only as something to see as the price of a compromise. Arnold was retained in our service for his undoubted ability, and Lee for his imaginary genius. Lee was a most absurdly incompetent soldier to be given high rank, and yet we made him a general next in rank to Washington who was completely deceived by him, and had faith in him up to the Battle of Monmouth. 20. The Battles of Trenton and Princeton. Howe had gone so far in his plans as to conquer New York and New Jersey, and thousands of people who had been hesitating now came in and took the British oath of allegiance. 
they had been for the rebellion if it should succeed, but they could now see nothing but futile wickedness in prolonging such a struggle and the sacrifice of life and property to the patriotic sentiment that it was better to die than to live political slaves. It seems probable that Howe expected some sort of voluntary peace or compromise which would show that the colonies could be retained without subjugation, as Burke and Chatham supposed was possible. His successes, as he afterwards put it in his narrative, had very nearly induced a general submission. But to loyalists like Galloway the waiting for peace seemed to give the rebels a chance to recuperate. It seemed as if Howe purposely refused to move again until Washington had a sufficient number of men to meet him. Months passed away before Washington was able to collect 10,000 men, and nearly a year after, and as late as September, 1777, he had only 11,000 with which to fight the Battle of the Brandywine. He never again got together as many as he had had at New York. Settled down in New York with Mrs. Loring and cards for the winter, Howe made no effort to wear out the scattered patriot commands or to complete and make permanent his conquest. He never did anything in winter. The three winters he spent in repressing the rebellion were passed in great luxury in the three principal cities, Boston, New York, and Philadelphia, waiting for a voluntary peace. It would have been Charleston's turn next. Before settling down in New York he sent, on December 8, some 6,000 troops to occupy Newport, Rhode Island. His great army of nearly 30,000 was larger than the population of New York, and filled the houses, churches, and public buildings, crowding out alike both the loyalist and the rebel, spreading out into the suburbs and cutting down the woodlands for miles in every direction to supply fuel. Fine old mansions, and the neat, pretty houses of the thrifty, where domestic morals had prevailed, were filled with trules, doxies, little misses, dulcine ars, and all the other female followers of the armies in that age. Before returning from Trenton, on December 13, he adopted a plan for keeping possession of his great conquest of New Jersey. He placed a cantonment of troops at Amboy, near New York, one at New Brunswick, another at Princeton, and two cantonments of 1500 Hessians each at Trenton and Bordentown on the Delaware. The cantonments at Trenton and Bordentown were six miles apart, Trenton was twelve miles from the small force at Princeton, and New Brunswick eighteen miles from Princeton. Such weak outposts as Trenton and Bordentown, so far away from support and from the main army in New York on the other side of the Hudson, were tempting objects of attack, and Washington prepared to destroy them. 18. The Hessians at Trenton were under the command of Colonel Rawl, who was drunk most of the time, could speak no English, had no fortifications for his men, and allowed them to plunder and disaffect the inhabitants. 19 The 1500 Hessians at Bordentown were under Count Dunop, and seem to have been intended to cover the neighboring town of Burlington. Map showing the position of the British Army in New York in December, 1776, with ITS cantonments for holding New Jersey. Washington collected the remains of Lee's force, which, together with his own and some sent down from Lake Champlain, gave him 6,000 men which represented all there was left of fighting enthusiasm in the Patriot population. It was only by the greatest persuasion that he kept this small force together, for the enlistments of many of them were expiring. Artists and sculptors represent these troops as dressed in handsome uniforms. But those who saw them agree in describing them as dressed in ragged summer clothes, with their shoes so worn that the frozen roads cut their bare feet. Their camps along the Delaware were filled with loyalists and spies, for most of the people in that region were lukewarm or hostile, had given up the rebellion as hopeless, and thought that the best plan was to make some sort of peace with Howe. Washington divided his force into three divisions, which were to cross the Delaware through the floating ice at about the same time. One under Cadwallader was to go against Dunop at Bordentown, another under Ewing was to cross directly in front of Trenton, and the third, of 2,500 men, which Washington himself commanded, was to cross above Trenton. 
Crossing the Delaware through the floating ice was cold and unpleasant but not dangerous work. If the ice was floating loosely the passage could be made, but if the pieces were closely packed together by the tide, boats could not be forced through them. Where Washington himself crossed, above the influence of the tide, the ice appears to have been floating loosely. It was Christmas night, cold, and at eleven o'clock a northeast snowstorm began, which became sleet before morning. It was severe exposure for patriots with ragged summer clothes and worn-out shoes, but the darkness, the storm, and the Christmas carousing of the Hessians were well suited to Washington's purpose. He marched quietly down upon Trenton, where the drunken ball, though worn through the numerous loyalists and spies of the intended attack, allowed himself to be taken by surprise, was mortally wounded, and most of his men were made prisoners. The other divisions seemed to have found the ice jammed by the tide, for they failed to cross that night. But the next day Cadwallader crossed at Burlington, to find that Dunop had retreated. The Hessian prisoners were sent to Philadelphia to be paraded in triumph. It was a great success, and the first event which impressed upon Europeans the ability of Washington to seize an opportunity. Washington immediately fell back to the Pennsylvania side of the river, but finding no vigorous movement made from New York, he recrossed and again occupied Trenton. The appearance, however, of Cornwallis with 8,000 men compelled him to abandon Trenton and cross a creek immediately south of the town, where he encamped for the night. Cornwallis might have shut him in against the Delaware and the creek and captured him, but he postponed this until the next morning. It was a narrow escape for Washington, and, as Clinton remarked, rather extraordinary conduct on the part of Cornwallis. Asterisk. During the night Washington left his camp fires burning and men working noisily on entrenchments, and with the rest of his little force, passing out through the way Cornwallis had left unguarded, performed the brilliant maneuver of marching to the rear of that general towards New York. He had made up his mind that he could penetrate into the interior of New Jersey, and attack Princeton and possibly New Brunswick without any interference from Howe. The men who now followed him were comparatively few, and not supported by the surrounding population, but they were the enthusiasts of the rights of man, the desperate and determined element of the Patriot Party, and the roads to Princeton were marked with blood from their naked, frostbitten feet. Asterisk. He reached Princeton about daybreak, where three regiments of British reinforcements were starting out to join Cornwallis at Trenton. One of them, under Colonel Moorhood, followed by part of another regiment, passed out of Princeton on Washington's left as he entered by another road. Seeing the Americans enter the village, Moorhood turned back and attacked Mercer's brigade. Mercer was mortally wounded, and the brigade in danger of retreating, when Washington rode to its head and led them enter within thirty yards of Moorhood's regiment, which was repulsed, and went on to join Cornwallis at Trenton. The other regiment and a half fought for a while in the streets of Princeton, but were compelled by the superior numbers of the Americans to retreat to New York. The Battle of Princeton was a small affair. The engagement with Moorhood is said to have lasted hardly twenty minutes, and the troops engaged in that affair and in the fighting in the streets of Princeton were only about two thousand British against some four thousand or five thousand Americans. But, coupled with Trenton as part of a sudden success in the midst of overwhelming defeat, it aroused great rejoicing among the friends of the Patriots in Europe, and deserves all that has been said of it. It was brilliant work on the part of Washington, in a time of utter hopelessness, when the belief was becoming general that the only safe place for the Patriot Party was on the other side of the Algony Mountains. Howe, with his army of 28,000, now quietly allowed Washington to reconquer New Jersey with 5,000. After the battle at Princeton Cornwallis abandoned Trenton, Bordentown, and Princeton, removed all the British troops from them, and quietly returned to New Brunswick. Washington found that there would be too much risk in attacking New Brunswick immediately after Princeton, so he passed on northward into the heart of New Jersey, and took up a strong position at Morristown Heights west of New York, and halfway between New York and the Delaware. 
Putnam came from Philadelphia with a few troops and occupied Princeton, and Heath had a few more on the Hudson. In other words, Washington, with scarcely 10,000 men, made a line of cantonments through New Jersey and held it without opposition from Howe's 28,000 all that winter and the following spring until June, 1777. He was constantly picking off stragglers from the British posts at New Brunswick and Amboy, and, as Galloway remarked, killed more regulars in that way than Howe would have lost by surrounding and defeating or starving him out at Morristown. In March Washington's force had sunk to less than 3,000 effectives, and yet he remained undisturbed by the vast force in New York. Asterisk. Washington had taken Howe's measure. For the rest of the British general's year and a half in America, the Patriot general, no matter how low his force dwindled, always remained encamped within a few miles of the vast host of his Whig antagonist undisturbed and unpursued. There was no need of retreating among the Indians and the Buffalo of the West. When we think of the measures of relentless severity and slaughter, the persistent and steady hunting down of the men, the concentration camps for the gradual destruction of the women and children, which we have known England use in our time to destroy all hope of independence. The extraordinary conduct of Howe is difficult to explain except by the method which his loyalist critics adopted. That was a marvelous winter in New York with a gorgeously caparisoned army far outnumbering the population of the town, and crowding the poor, devoted loyalists out of their houses. Judge Jones was there, and he has left us a graphic and indignant description of what happened in this and the following year. The commissaries, quartermasters, barrack masters, engineers, and their assistants and followers, were making prodigious fortunes by the most wholesale fraud. The loyalists about New York had supplied the invading army with horses and wagons in the campaign of 1776, and were cheated out of their payment. In the campaign of 1777 they again supplied the horses and wagons, and were again defrauded. The quartermaster, Judge Jones says, netted for himself £150,000 out of that campaign and retired to England a rich man. His successor made another fortune. During the seven years of the war, four quartermasters in succession returned with fortunes varying from £150,000 to £200,000. These were enormous sums in those times, fully the equivalent of $3 million in our own day. The fifth quartermaster was stopped halfway on his road to a fortune by the arrival of Sir Guy Carlton to take command in 1782. Howe's favorite engineer received for merely leveling the rebel fortifications about New York a fortune, with which he retired and bought a townhouse and a country seat. His successor was given greater opportunities. The barrack masters seized private houses, public buildings, and churches, for which, of course, they paid nothing, and rented them to the army. They cut down the oak and hickory forests all round New York and for sixty miles along the Sound, selling two-thirds of a cord to the army at the price of a cord, sixteen to twenty-eight shillings, and selling the fraudulently reserved third to the loyalists at four pounds and five pounds for two-thirds of a cord. Like the quartermasters and engineers, they too became nabobs of the West. And then there were commissaries of forage, commissaries of cattle, and commissaries of artillery, not to mention the commissaries of prisoners, together with all their dependents, male and female, who enjoyed a perfect carnival of plunder and wealth. Asterisk. 21. The Battle of Brandywine. The necessity Howe felt of going through the form of a little fighting before autumn caused a break in the gaieties in New York. The important strategic line up the Hudson to Canada had now for some time been controlled at both ends by the British. The Ministry decided to control the whole length of it during this summer of 1777, and to that end had arranged that a force coming down from Canada should meet at Albany a force from Howe coming up from New York. As the plan was worked out, two expeditions were to come from Canada, one under Burgoyne was to come straight down by way of Lake Champlain, and a smaller force under Street Ledger was to go up the Street Lawrence to Lake Ontario as far as Oswego, 
capture Fort Standwix, and sweep down the Mohawk Valley to reinforce Burgoyne at Albany. New York at that time was settled only along the lines of the Hudson and Mohawk Valleys, so that these two expeditions, reinforced by Howe from below, would be a complete conquest of New York. The plan also included an attack upon the coast of New England to prevent the militia and minutemen of that part of the country from being massed against Burgoyne as he came down from Canada. Howe had full information as to this plan, professed to approve of it, and, in his letter to the Colonial Secretary of October 9, 1775, spoke of it as the primary object. It was obviously necessary and vital that he should play his part in it with vigour or there would be a waffle disaster to the British arms and great encouragement to the rebellion, as well as encouragement to France to ally herself with the rebels. In a letter to the Ministry of November 30, 1776, he shows how he will carry out his part of the plans by sending 10,000 men to attack New England, 10,000 to go up the Hudson to Albany, and 8,000 to make a diversion towards Philadelphia 20 this plan he gradually changed until nothing of it was left but the movement to Philadelphia. His reason for this change was that the ministry would not send him the reinforcements for which he asked. But this was hardly a sufficient excuse for refusing to send any assistance to Big Oin. On April 5, 1777, he wrote to Carlton in Canada that he would not assist Burgoyne, because it would be inconsistent with other operations on which he had determined, that he would be in Pennsylvania when Burgoyne was advancing on Albany, and Burgoyne must take care of himself as best he could. 21. A copy of this letter to Carlton was sent by Howe to the ministry, and about a month afterwards the ministry sent to Carlton instructions for sending Burgoyne to Albany, and directed that Burgoyne and Street Ledger should communicate with Howe and receive instructions from him, that until they received instructions from him they should act as exigencies might require, but that in so doing they must never lose sight of their intended junction with Sir William Howe as their principal object. 22. A copy of these instructions from the Ministry to Carlton was sent to Howe for his guidance, and received by him July 5 so that as commander-in-chief with discretionary power he was made aware of the whole situation, knew the wishes and plans of the ministry, and on him was placed the responsibility of effecting or not effecting a junction with Burgoyne. In accordance with the instructions from the ministry, Burgoyne before starting from England wrote to Howe, wrote to him again from Quebec, and again on July 2, when on his way down Lake Champlain, informing him of the nature of his expedition, that he was under orders to effect a junction, and that he expected support from the south. The letter of July 2nd Howe received July 15th. Asterisk. In order that discretionary power and responsibility might be entirely cast upon Howe, Lord George Germain wrote to him, May 18th, saying that the copy of Howe's letter to Carlton changing the plan of a junction with Burgoyne had been received, and adding, as you must, from your situation and military skill, be a competent judge of the propriety of every plan, His Majesty does not hesitate to approve the alterations which you propose, trusting, however, that whatever you may meditate, it will be executed in time for you to cooperate with the army ordered to proceed from Canada, and put itself under your command. Parliamentary Register, House of Commons, p. 416. This letter was received by Howe August 16, and on August 30 he replied to it, saying that he would not be able to cooperate with Big Oin. Asterisk the correspondence was now closed, and this brief review of it may be of assistance in understanding the events which are to be related. Carlton was much disappointed in not receiving command of the invasion from Canada, and asked to be recalled. But he was retained in Canada which he had so successfully defended, and directed to send out Burgoyne and Street Ledger. On the 17th of June Burgoyne started and began to fight his way down the rivers and lakes towards Albany. For some days before that time Howe had begun to maneuver about New York in a way to make it appear uncertain what he would do. At first it seemed as if he intended to march 18th, oh, oh, oh of his men straight through New Jersey to Philadelphia. 
he had them carried across the Hudson, and they were provided with boats and rafts apparently for the purpose of crossing the Delaware. Washington immediately placed himself in a position about ten miles from New Brunswick and close to what was, apparently, Howe's intended line of march. Washington had about 6,000 men, with 2,000 more at Princeton, but Howe with 18,000 never attempted to attack or captured the 6,000 patriots, although they were there almost alongside of him for over two weeks while he maneuvered about, leaving his boats at New Brunswick and marching as if to go to the Delaware without them, and then coming back again. He could surely have defeated the 6,000 patriots at this time as easily as he defeated 11,000 three months later at Brandywine. If they were in a strong position in the hills, their numbers were so small that he could have gone behind them or surrounded them. Asterisk his explanation in his defense before Parliament was that he was trying to bring Washington to a general engagement. But he must have known that to do that he must attack Washington as he had done at Long Island, and as he did three months afterwards at Brandywine. Washington, with 6,000 men, was surely not going to be foolish enough to attack Howe, with 18,000 nor could Washington's 6,000 prevent Howe's 18,000 from going to Philadelphia, and many believed that Howe now had his best opportunity of forcing his way up the Hudson to meet Big Oin. After this two weeks fooling in New Jersey Howe, on the last day of June, withdrew his army from that province and began putting it on board the transports. Then his maneuvers began to indicate that he was going up the Hudson or round into Long Island Sound to New England. Washington was sure he must intend to assist Big Oin. It seemed impossible to think otherwise, impossible to suppose that his uncertain movements were anything but feints to cover his real design of effectually cooperating with the army from Canada. But finally, after all his maneuvering, Howe took his force out to sea. Clinton was left in command of New York with the rest of the British Army, consisting of about 6,000, a force utterly inadequate to hold New York and at the same time cooperate with Burgoyne and Street Ledger. Just before sailing from New York Howe sent a letter to Burgoyne which he carefully arranged should fall into the hands of Washington, for he gave it to be carried by a patriot prisoner whom he released and paid a handsome sum of money as if he really believed that such a person would prove a faithful messenger. In this letter he said that he was making a feint at sea to the southward, but that his real intention was to sail to Boston, and from there assist Burgoyne at Albany. Asterisk. This letter was itself a feint, Howe's ships disappeared in the hot July haze that overhung the ocean, and for a week nothing more was heard of him. A Connecticut newspaper printed an advertisement offering a reward for a lost general. Washington, who had separated his army into divisions for a rapid movement, now brought his force together at Cory Ells Ferry, on the Delaware above Trenton, prepared to move quickly either to the Hudson or to Philadelphia. He could not quite believe that Howe intended to abandon Burgoyne. But on the 30th of July, the people living at Cape Henlopen, at the entrance of the Delaware Bay, saw the ocean covered with the vast fleet of 250 transports and men of war, a beautiful but alarming sight as they sailed over that summer sea and anchored in the bay. Washington now hurried his army to Philadelphia, and camped north of the town, near the falls of the Schilkill, on the line of what we have since known as Queen Lane, which runs into Germantown, this was the first appearance of the rebel army in mass at Philadelphia. Their sanitary arrangements as Stuart's orderly book tells us, were particularly unfortunate on this occasion, and in that hot August weather a most horrible stench arose all round their camp. Asterisk. But within a day or two how sailed out of Delaware Bay. He decided, as he and his officers afterwards explained, that it was impracticable to go up the river to Philadelphia, because that city was defended by obstructions in the water, and the shores below were inconvenient for landing an army. Again he disappeared beyond the horizon, heading eastward, as if returning to New York with the intention of seizing the Highland Passes on the Hudson and assisting Burgoyne by a sudden stroke. Washington was now completely puzzled. Unwilling to march his army in the torrid heat, 
he held it in the unsavory camp at Queen Lane until reflection and increasing anxiety compelled him to move again towards the Hudson. But he had not gone far when he was stopped by messengers. The people who lived by fishing and shooting wild fowl at St. Pukes and Inlet, below Cape and Lopen, had caught a glimpse one day of a vast forest of masts moving slowly to the southward. But quickly, as if conscious that they could be seen from the land, the masts disappeared again. This was stranger than ever, and Washington thought that Howe might be making for Charleston, either to occupy it or to lead the Patriot Army into a long march in a hot and unhealthy climate, and, having enticed them there, return quickly in his ships to any part of the middle or northern colonies, and easily and effectually cooperate with Burgoyne and Street Ledger. But it was not Charleston's turn. Howe's progress was now very slow, for he was beating against headwinds. At last he was reported sailing up Chesapeake Bay, and then all was clear. He landed at the head of the bay, at the mouth of the Elk River, and from there in September marched on Philadelphia as a comfortable place in which to settle for the winter. In order to place himself beyond the possibility of assisting Burgoyne, he had made a circuitous voyage of three hundred miles, which became a thousand, beating against the headwinds, and a march of fifty miles by land, to reach a place from which he was less than one hundred miles by land when he started. Asterisk. When it was known that Howe was about to land at the head of the Chesapeake, Washington hurried across the country to get in front of him. On this march he paraded a large part of his force through Philadelphia, coming down Front Street and marching out Chestnut Street and across the Schuylkill. He wished to encourage the Patriots in the town by this display, and, as the Loyalists had been saying that there was no Patriot army, he would in this way impress its size upon them. The greatest pains were taken with this parade. Earnest appeals were made to the troops to keep in step and avoid straggling. The axemen or pioneers headed the procession, and the divisions were well spread out, with fifes and drums between them rattling away at marching tunes. To give some uniformity to the motley hunting shirts, bare feet, and rags, every man wore a green sprig in his hat. The best clothed men were the Virginians, and the smartest looking troops were Smallwood's Mary Landers. But they all looked like fighting men as they marched by to destroy Howe's prospects of a winter in Philadelphia. With the policy Howe was consistently pursuing, it might have been just as well to offer no obstacle to his taking Philadelphia. He merely intended to pass the winter there as he had done in Boston and in New York. But for the credit of the Patriot cause and his own reputation, Washington had to do all in his power to stop him. It would not do to hang on his rear and flanks and annoy him in guerrilla fashion. He must fight a pitched battle, and such a battle Washington must necessarily lose, for he had only 11,000 badly equipped troops with which to oppose Howe's 18,000 regulars. Asterisk. Asterisk Bancroft estimates Howe's force at over 20,000 without counting the Engineer Corps. History of the United States, edition of 1886, volume V. P. 175. The Battle of the Brandywine, stripped of its details, is a very simple affair. Washington placed himself directly across Howe's front, along the shore of the Brandywine at Chad's Ford, with that river between him and his enemy. No one has ever doubted that this was the best and all that he could do. It is an elementary principle that an inferior force, placed in a strong position like this, with a river in front of it, and acting on the defensive, can resist the attack of a much superior force, if the superior force is content to attack in front. It is also equally elementary that the best policy for the superior force is not to confine itself to a front attack, but to use its greater numbers in flanking. How fought only two battles of his own in this war, Long Island and Brandywine both of which were absolutely necessary to enable him to get into towns for the winter, and he fought them both by flanking. He would probably have fought Bunker Hill in the same way if he had been allowed to use his own judgment. Knowing thoroughly the composition of the rebel army, the inadequacy of its staff, and its inability to obtain quick and sure information on the field, 
the flank movement was for him both obvious and easy. At Brandywine he sent Niforson to make a violent attack on Washington's front, while under cover of the early morning fog he and Cornwallis took the rest of the army far up the Brandywine, crossed it, and came down with irresistible force upon Washington's right. A young man of the neighborhood who wandered among the British troops, as non-combatants, whether patriots or loyalists, were allowed to do, has left a brief but rather interesting account of what he saw. He described how and Cornwallis as very large, heavy men, mounted on horses exhausted by the long sea voyage. He watched the troops piling their blankets and knapsacks in the fields when preparing to fight, and he noticed their fresh-looking, smooth faces in strong contrast to the sunburnt Americans to whom he was accustomed. The subordinate officers he described as short, portly men, with very delicate white skins. One. Washington heard a vague rumor of this flanking, and was preparing to make what is often the counterstrobe to such a flank movement. He intended to lead his whole force in person across the river and crush Niforson, who was in front of him. He would then have been in the position of having divided Howe's army in half, defeated one division of it, and placed the river between himself and the other division. By a similar counterstroke, Napoleon, when his right flank was being turned, brought victory out of defeat at Austerlitz. But presently the report of Howe's flanking movement was denied. Washington abandoned his counterstroke, and learned the truth of the flanking movement too late. His army was so wretchedly organized, especially in means of rapid communication with itself, that it could not do justice to its own fighting qualities. Washington could now only resist stubbornly, and retreat in good order, and how, of course, did not pursue. Military critics like Du Portail and other French officers were all agreed that Howe now had a good opportunity of exterminating the rebel army. He could have crowded them into the triangle formed by the Delaware and Schuylkill rivers. But he would not do it. He followed most precisely and consistently the line of conduct which he seems to have laid down for himself from the beginning, too. Map of the Battle of the Brandywine If he had pursued Washington and inflicted a crushing defeat he might have left part of his force to occupy Philadelphia and then marched rapidly to Big Oin. This was what the ministry expected when they heard of the Philadelphia expedition, and it would have made that expedition an intelligent movement. Asterisk they also expected that Howe would have at least sent a force into New England to prevent the militia of that region being massed against Big Oin. As he had neglected to do this, and neglected to leave a sufficient force with Clinton to assist Big Oin, it was to little purpose that he argued that he had sufficiently assisted Burgoyne by withdrawing Washington's army to Philadelphia. As Washington had at most only 11,000, and how 18,000, and later 20,000, it was rather Washington drawing away Howe's army. The 20,000 were ill-used in drawing away 11,000, when they left Clinton so weak that he could not assist Burgoyne and when none were spared from them to make a diversion on the New England coast. As General Robertson aptly put it, in his testimony before the Committee of Inquiry, the movement of Howe to Philadelphia was a diversion, but a more powerful diversion in favor of Burgoyne would have been to go straight up the Hudson to his assistance. Howe's excuse that it would have been impossible for him to reach Burgoyne with Washington's force blocking the way on the Hudson at the Highland Passes also seems inadequate in view of Clinton's success at those passes with a very small force. The combined force of Clinton and Howe could surely have as well occupied the attention of Washington's army on the Hudson as at Philadelphia, could in all probability have forced their way through and could have detached a considerable force for the vital service of an attack on New England. Howe's explanations are rendered more than doubtful when we find that he would not make the slightest diversion on the New England coast to prevent the movement of the militia of that region which finally defeated Burgoyne. The ministry had repeatedly told him of the importance of this, and he could easily have spared 5,000 men for the purpose. Washington, after his defeat at Brandywine, retreated with most of his army to Chester on the Delaware. There seems to have been some scattering among his men, although it cannot be said that his army was demoralized. 
his wounded were sent to Chester and various places. Among the wounded, young Lafayette, with a ball in his leg, was carried to Bethlehem, to be cared for by the Moravians. The next day Washington took most of his army up the Delaware towards the Schuylkill. Howe now had him forced into the angle of the two rivers, and could have compelled his surrender or destruction. But Washington passed on unmolested, crossed the Schuylkill, and encamped in Germantown between the two rivers. Having declined to destroy Washington's army when he had it in his power, it was now somewhat difficult for Howe to cross the Schuylkill and enter Philadelphia. The floating bridges were all taken away, and the steep banks of the river made crossing doubly difficult so long as Washington was at large and might attack the first small force that got across the stream. The desire of the British army to get into Philadelphia and of Washington to prevent it kept up for two weeks a contest of wits between Washington and Howe. Howe was determined to do no more fighting if he could help it. He appeared to be in no hurry and remained camped near the battlefield of the Brandywine. Wayne's scouts who watched him reported that his men were quietly resting, cooking, and washing their clothes. Stung by his defeat and seeing the laxity of Howe, Washington was impatient to try another issue. He soon crossed the Schilkel to the same side with Howe, and marched twenty miles until he found the British a little west of Paoli at the Warren Tavern. Though the two armies confronted each other, apparently ready for battle. But there was no battle. The extraordinary spectacle was presented of a small defeated army returning to the victor and standing in front of him, daring him to fight. It was the situation at White Plains over again. After defeating the Patriots at Long Island, Howe had refused to follow up the advantage and refused to fight at White Plains, so he now refused to fight at Warren Tavern. His excuse was that rain began falling, which continued for 24 hours. As Washington could not very well assume the offensive against a force which was double the size of his own, he marched back through the rain, which dampened his powder and seriously distressed his half-naked, barefooted men, and having reached the Schilkill, he crossed it to the eastern side. While this movement was in progress some of the British under General Grey on the night of September 20th, guided by loyalists, surprised Wayne, who had been left to watch the British and was encamped with about 1500 men near the Paoli Inn. Gray, whose only distinction in the war was in prisoner killing, had recently arrived in America. He compelled his men to draw the loads from their muskets and take out the flints, a method which at that time was very effective for a night attack. Wayne and most of his men escaped but Gray committed most ruthless slaughter with sword and bayonet on the remainder, killing and wounding three hundred of them. It was generally regarded as an excessive massacre, which amounted to prisoner killing, and the commander was ever afterwards known among the patriots as No Flint Gray. 3. Soon after this Howe followed Washington to the Schuylkill and marched up the shore, with Washington following on the opposite side, keeping even pace with him, when, by a sudden backward movement, Howe slipped a sufficient force over one of the forts to protect his crossing, and almost before Washington was aware of it the whole British army was across. It was a neat, clever piece of work, conforming with the utmost preciseness to the general plan of Howe's conduct in America. Washington's explanation was, that all the people in that part of the country were loyalists and he could obtain no information of Howe's backward movement. It was also at this time that he reported a thousand of his men marching barefooted, for Philadelphia was lost to the Patriots. Part of the British army, under Cornwallis, marched into it September 26th in grand display, the bands playing and the Hessians with their moustaches upturned and scowling in the most terrible manner. At Germantown, directly north of Philadelphia, Howe formed a strong outpost, under his own command covering some of the roads that led to the city, until he could protect the city by fortifications on its northern side. As this outpost was isolated seven miles away from the rest of the army, somewhat in the same way that the outpost had been placed at Trenton, Washington attacked it with most of his army early in the morning of October 4. But he was less fortunate than at Trenton. The outpost was too strong, and, 
with its center at Market Square inches Germantown, was spread out for three or four miles at right angles to the roads that led to Philadelphia. Washington, in attacking, had to spread out his troops almost as widely, and the old difficulty, lack of a proper staff and quick communication on the field, spoiled his opportunity. He lost about a thousand men in killed, wounded, and prisoners, and returned unsuccessful. But he struck so hard and courageously that he raised the reputation of the Patriot cause among all its friends. Asterisk. The Loyalists were in despair at the spectacle of himself that Howe was making. But Howe, with the utmost good humor, proceeded to settle himself and his official family most comfortably in Philadelphia, and Galloway was made superintendent of police of the town. Howe's force of 18,000 was soon increased to 20,000. As in New York, they surrounded themselves with gaiety of every kind, comma, cricket, theatricals, cockfights, balls, music, and the wit, clever verses, and sketches of Andre. Just as they had begun to settle down in this pleasant way, on October 17, about two weeks after the Battle of Germantown, Port Ori Burgoyne surrendered at Saratoga. On October 22, Howe wrote to Germain saying that he had heard a rebel rumor of Burgoyne's surrender, but did not believe it. He is greatly surprised, he says, to hear that Burgoyne had complained of the failure to cooperate with him. He thought that it was distinctly understood through his letters to Carlton and to the ministry that no direct assistance could be given by the Southern Army. He then adds that so little attention has been given to his recommendations that he would like to be recalled and allowed to resign from this very painful service, wherein I have not the good fortune to enjoy the necessary confidence and support of my superiors. 5. As his resignation was not accepted for many months, he remained in Philadelphia, which he completely protected from attack on the North by redoubts, stretching from the Delaware to the Schuylkill along the present lines of Green and Poplar Streets. On all other sides Philadelphia was protected by the two rivers which came together somewhat like the letter V. The Patriots still held the forts below the city comma Red Bank, Mifflin, and Billingsport. These were reduced by combined action of the Army and Admiral Howe's fleet, which had now come up the river. The forts were defended heroically, and there were few battles of the Revolution in which there was such desperate furious fighting. 6. It was the only fighting done by Admiral Howe during his command, and the Hessians, as usual, bore the brunt of it. They were always clamoring for distinction and the honors of war, and Howe was entirely willing to gratify them. The river being now opened and free to the British, there was nothing more for the army to do except to live comfortably inside the redoubts. One expedition was made by Howe before winter began, he took a force out to White Marsh, took a look at Washington's army without attacking it, and came back again. In the following May he made a similar expedition to capture Lafayette's force at Barren Hill, and came back equally unsuccessful. The army's peaceful sojourn in the town from September 26, 1777, to June 18, 1778, was a source of great enjoyment and an unrivaled opportunity for social advancement to the Loyalists. It was the harvest of their lives. Even a wicked rebellion could have advantages. One of the loyalist ladies has left some enthusiastic and rather good verses on the delights of that winter. 7. It was a strange scene in the good old Quaker town with the rebel prisoners eating rats in the Walnut Street jail, while the commissary of prisoners grew rich, and extravagance, speculation, gambling, and European indifference to morals filled the respectable plain brick houses. A Hessian officer held a bank at the game of Pharaoh and made a considerable fortune by ruining young Englishmen, many of whom were obliged to sell their commissions and go home penniless. The officers made no attempt to keep their mistresses in the background. One of them drove in her carriage with footmen up and down lines at a review of the troops, dressed in a costume that was a feminine imitation of the uniform of her paramours regiment. Howe's plan, as Lord Chatham said in Parliament, was merely to occupy stations. Washington followed the same plan he had found to work well enough the previous winter which Howe spent in New York. 
he fortified himself with entrenchments on some high ground at Valley Forge, about twenty miles away, very much in the same way that during the last winter he had occupied Morristown Heights, he could there play the long waiting game with Howe as well as anywhere else. How could have attacked him at almost any time at Valley Forge and destroyed or captured his starving army. Howe had twenty thousand men. Washington had nine thousand, counting the sick, starved, and half-naked, and by March three thousand had deserted to the British, and so many others were sick or at home that there were only four thousand men at Valley Forge. If Howe had wished to avoid the loss of a direct attack, even on so few, he could have easily surrounded Valley Forge and taken them all by siege without any loss to speak of, for there were often not enough supplies among them to keep them alive, even on starvation rations, for more than four days, or a week at the utmost, eight they deserted in tens and fifties, appearing in Philadelphia half-naked, barefooted, a tattered blanket strapped to their waists, and their first thought was to sell their guns to buy food. Howe obtained most of his supplies by his ships, which was the usual method of the British throughout the war. He kept the river open and certain roads out into the country for the loyalists to bring in the produce of farms and gardens. It was by robbing this produce on its way to Howe that the patriots at Valley Forge received a large part of their scanty subsistence. 9. They had a force organized for this purpose and scouting between the Delaware and Schuylkill rivers under the command of Alan Maclay, a rough rider and free poter of the most gallant type. He made dashes up to the very line of redoubts which stretched from river to river along the line of green and poplar streets. His men, who seized provisions intended for the British, were known as market stoppers. They were very apt to be captured in their daring work and were then paraded by the British through the streets, with the vegetables strung around their necks and market baskets on their arms, before being jailed or publicly whipped and turned adrift. In retaliation, the Patriots would often whip loyalist market men, brand them in the hand with the British Army letters G. R., and send them into the British lines. People who had favored the Patriot cause were still continually dropping out of it. Many of them became altogether hopeless soon after the Battle of the Brandywine. The disasters and the imbecility of the attempt at independence seemed to them too absurd to be longer endured. A typical specimen of these was the Reverend Jacob Dush, a brilliant young clergyman of the Church of England, settled in Philadelphia, who had at first taken sides with the Patriots and gained prominence by opening the session of the Congress with a very eloquent prayer. Disgusted with the hopelessness of the rebellion, the petty peculation and frauds in the rebel army, the deterioration in character of its officers and of the members of the undignified wandering rebel congress, and similar things which make a deep impression on men of a certain kind of education and refinement, he felt compelled to write a long letter to Washington, imploring him in the name of God and humanity to put an end to the absurd contest for independence and at the head of his army negotiate some sort of compromise with England. The letter was widely circulated, and is well worth reading, as showing the conditions of the time. One of Dush's arguments was that the long time which had elapsed without active aid from France proved that it could not be obtained. He seemed unable to appreciate the effect of Howe's plan of leaving Burgoyne to his fate. An attempt has sometimes been made to save the trouble of investigating the evidence and to explain Howe's conduct in a few words by telling a rather curious story about certain peremptory and positive written orders to cooperate with Burgoyne which had been prepared by the ministry but accidentally forgotten by Germain and not sent to Howe from England. In his speech before the Committee of Inquiry, afterwards published as his narrative, Howe said that no explicit instructions had been sent to him, but that he did not rely on this as a defense. He preferred to rest his Philadelphia expedition on its merits as the best military maneuver that could be made under the circumstances. 10 He was compelled to take this ground because the ministry, after giving him full information about the expedition from Canada, left him, as they had done all through the war, to act according to his discretion. He knew all about the Burgoyne plan, 
and had the responsibility of deciding whether to support it or not. He knew without peremptory orders the importance and necessity of such a junction, as did also his officers, the rebels, and everybody at that time. Sir Henry Clinton, in his manuscript notes to Stedman's American War, says, I owe it to truth to say there was not, I believe, a man in the army, except Lord Cornwallis and General Grant, who did not reprobate the move to the southward and see the necessity of a cooperation with General Burgoyne. The Patriots believed that such a junction would seal their fate. Nothing under heaven can save us, wrote Trumbull, but the enemy's going to the southward. 11. Still another attempt at a short and easy explanation has been made by assigning to that adventurer, General Charles Lee, the responsibility for Howe's movement to Philadelphia. While a prisoner in New York he was well treated by Howe, who possibly may have been amused by his gossip and affectation. Lee, who was in some danger of being hanged, offered, it seems, to help the British conquer the Americans, and drew up a plan of campaign for Howe, recommending a movement to the southward. 12 This plan, dated March 29, 1777, was found among Howe's papers, or the papers of his private secretary, many years after the revolution. In an essay read before the New York Historical Society in 1858 the plan and its influence upon Howe are represented as causing his failure to cooperate with Burgoyne, and at least one historian has adopted this suggestion as a full explanation of Howe's conduct. 13. It would seem, however, that inasmuch as General Cornwallis and General Grant favored the movement to Philadelphia, it would be better accounted for by their influence rather than by the influence of a most contemptible character, who was a prisoner, afraid of being hung for treason. Moreover, Howe had formed the plan of going to Philadelphia early in the winter, before Christmas, and many months before the date of the plan. We also find, when we read the plan, that it does not recommend the move to Philadelphia which Howe made. It recommends the occupation of the well-known strategic position of the Chesapeake, seizing Alexandria in Virginia and Annapolis in Maryland, and, as an accompaniment to this position, the occupation of Philadelphia. Howe knew all about this without any suggestions from Lee that such a movement into territory full of loyalists would end the rebellion and make an expedition to the north unnecessary. The Lee plan is an interesting curiosity, but the suggestions of scared prisoners, and even the suggestions of subordinate officers, cannot relieve Howe from the responsibility of having reasons of his own for all he did. As it has been so difficult to find good military reasons for his conduct, and as it has been deemed inadvisable to disclose the political reasons given by Galloway and the Loyalists, and the evidence that was before the Committee of Inquiry, the historians have strained hard to invent other explanations, and the boldest one of all has been adopted by Bancroft, who assigns General Carlton as the cause of all the trouble. Carlton, he says, originated the expedition from Canada, he was ambitious to come down from Canada into the rebellious colonies and take the supreme command. Howe refused to assist the expedition from Canada because it might be commanded by Carlton, who, when he arrived in New York, would outrank Howe and supersede him. The discovery or suspicion of this design on the part of Carlton, Bancroft assures us, led Howe to announce to Germain and Carlton that he would not assist the northern movement down Lake Champlain. Asterisk Bancroft gives no proof of this supposition, but the reader has now all the explanations and their sources before him, and can test them for himself. 22. The Battle of Saratoga and ITS Results General Clinton, who had been left with a small force in New York, started up the Hudson to do what he could for Burgoyne. But as soon as he let Howe know what he was doing, he was discouraged and requested, instead of going up the Hudson, to send part of his force to Philadelphia to help reduce the forts on the Delaware. 14 Howe would not make an attack of any kind on the coasts of New England to check the movement of the militia of that region against Burgoyne. Clinton did his utmost. He waited for some 1700 reinforcements that were to arrive, and then started up the Hudson with only two or three thousand men, meeting with some success. 
he took the highland forts October 6, with thousands of rebel muskets and vast quantities of ammunition, military tools, and supplies. But he moved slowly, and was too late. Even if he had been able to advance farther up, his little force was hopelessly inadequate to cope with the New England troops that were collecting far to the north of him, near Lake Champlain. For a time after leaving Canada Burgoyne and his 8,000 men met with good success, drove the Americans before them, took Ticonderoga, and gained a decided victory at Hubbardton. But difficulties increased as they advanced. The greatest efforts were made all over New England to collect and send forces that would overwhelm Burgoyne, now that Howe and his 18,000 men had gone to Philadelphia, and Clinton, on account of his small numbers, was helpless in New York. The English appear to have believed that violence and handcuffs were used to force patriots to serve, and that the New England prisons were filled with delinquents. Asterisk Washington also sent reinforcements from his little army that was playing around Howe. By this means, about 11,000 patriot militia were collected and hurried into the region above Albany, where they inflicted the first check upon Burgoyne at the Battle of Bennington. Bennington was fought on August 16, 1777, while Howe was leisurely sailing up the Chesapeake with his 18,000 men. A few days afterwards, while Howe was landing his men at the mouth of the Elk River, Burgoyne heard that Street Ledger, who was to have taken Fort Standwix and then come down the Mohawk with 1,700 men, had been disastrously defeated and put to flight by Herkimer, Gansevoort, and Arnold. Under all the circumstances it might now have been the best course for Burgoyne to retreat back to Canada, but he considered himself under peremptory instructions to proceed and effect a junction with Howe, upon whom he and all his officers and men relied to come and meet them. Asterisk but with his force reduced to about 6,000, he was soon at the mercy of Gates, who, with 11,000, on October 17, 1777, at the Battle of Saratoga, easily compelled a surrender. 15. By the agreement that was signed, Burgoyne's soldiers were to be paroled and allowed to return to England. But disputes arose as to furnishing lists of the prisoners, and they were held in a camp in Virginia until the close of the war. It was certainly a most extraordinary event. After over two years of continuous, almost uninterrupted, defeat and disaster, with the rebellion generally believed, even by its own followers, to be on the eve of completely collapsing into mere predatory and bandit warfare, suddenly a whole British army surrenders to a patriot officer of no military reputation whatever. It was the turning point of the revolution, because although it may possibly be true that Virgin and the French king intended before long to assist us openly, Yet Saratoga was a strong inducement to them to come out plainly and make a treaty of alliance. Fighting was continued for four years more, and even with the assistance of France the Patriot cause had so dwindled in 1780 that most people had given up all hope of independence. But looking back upon the contest as a whole, one cannot help feeling that without Saratoga independence might have been defeated and our country turned into an island. The King of France had hesitated a long time. He wished to cripple England, and yet to assist the American insurgents seemed like wronging the cause of monarchy. But Prussia and Russia encouraged him to do everything to injure England, and when the greatest, the best, and the most far-reaching plan for crushing the rebellion broke down completely by the surrender of a whole army, there was no more need for hesitation. Three months afterwards, in spite of the protests of his most important ministers, except Virgin, he signed a treaty of alliance with rebels, set the fashion for the aristocracy to run after Franklin and lay insurgents, took upon himself the task of giving them independence, and changed their condition from absolute helplessness to what proved in the end to be absolute security. So it came to pass that the greatest advancement, the greatest expansion and development of the ideas of free government, self-government, the rights of man and liberty, that ever was given to the Anglo-Saxon race was given to it by a Frenchman, a Celt, half Bourbon, half a Pole. The Spanish government, under the influence of its minister, Florida Blanca, 
was at first opposed to giving aid to such extreme republicans as the American insurgents. But gradually, Spain, as a good hater of England and a good friend of the French House of Bourbon, began to supply the patriots with money, sent through France, without the knowledge of the English government, to which government the warmest expressions of regard were given. How was a good Whig, the patriots drank his health, and we should build a monument to him. Nothing like it has ever happened. No other independence-loving minority, or independence-loving majority, has ever escaped by such romantic and fortuitous circumstances from the independence-hating British lions more. It was most extraordinary good fortune. The Abbe Carreau always used to say that there was a special providence for somnambulists, drunken men on horseback, and the citizens of the United States. One cannot help wondering what our subsequent history would have been if Whig principles and how had not had such a large share in suppressing our rebellion. What would have been the result if the Tories had from the start really got to work at the suppression and devastation which has been inflicted by them upon Ireland, South Africa, and other countries? If Howe, when his large force gave him the opportunity to do it, had seized and imprisoned boys and all non combatant patriots of any age, who might in the future join the Patriot Army, and had reconcentrated over the Patriot women and children whom he allowed to wander among his troops, he might have considerably altered the course of history, and Graydon would not have been able to write that he passed from New York to New Jersey in the winter of 1776-77 and found no particular evidences of war. Howe was quietly resting in New York and Washington quietly waiting at Morristown. 16. Loyalists like Judge Jones, of New York, and William Franklin, the governor of New Jersey, called for the most relentless severity, slaughter, hanging, exile, and confiscation, the severity that had been inflicted on Ireland, 17 no mercy to men, women, or children, the same call which, in our own time, we have heard from literary men of England for effecting the extermination of the Boer republics. If the call in our case had been answered in time and the whole Patriot Party had been literally exterminated or banished, it might have been effective. If it had left the Patriots in the country, we should have become a perpetual political sore like Ireland, with an endless contest and undying hatred, continued for centuries, aided, no doubt, by assassination societies, between the Patriots and the Loyalists. The atrocities and retaliation committed by these two divisions of our people in New York, New Jersey, and the South, even at the close of the Revolution, show what would have happened if England as a conqueror had restored the country to the Loyalists and placed them in power. We should have become, like Ireland, an arena for repression, confiscations, colonization, hangings, torture, assassinations, reform bills, home rule bills coercion bills, crimes acts, and all the other marvellous measures of British statesmanship which have been used to pacify Ireland during 700 years, for, like Ireland, the spirit of patriotism and independence was so far developed among a large part of our people that it could be stamped out only by the destruction of each individual who entertained it. And now we must prepare to take leave of our hero, General Sir William Howe, the conqueror of America. His resignation was finally accepted. And why not? His work was done. He could do no more either for the Whigs or for the Americans, and he might as well return to his place in Parliament and at all max. London was more interesting than the colonies, even when assisted by Mrs. Loring. If the charge is true that he had purposely allowed the rebellion to develop, he could now laugh at the Tory ministry and his voluntary retirement was an open Whig declaration to all Europe that the attempt of the government to establish its sovereignty in the colonies would not only certainly fail, but had already failed. His career and the gaiety of his sojourn in Philadelphia reached their climax in May, when some of the officers subscribed among themselves to give a magnificent phaeton tournament for the amusement of the loyalist ladies and in honor of the general who was about to return to England. It was called the Mischianza, or Medley, and was an imitation of one given at Lord Derby's country seat in England four years before, for which General Burgoyne had written his play, 
the maid of the oaks. It was too bad the poor fellow could not be in Philadelphia to help at this one. But the taste and versatile accomplishments of Major Andre were amply sufficient. We understand Andre's character better when we remember that both his parents were French. The town was ransacked for blue, gold, and scarlet cloth and every article of finery that could be found. Andre, with the officers and the ladies, was busy in designing extravagant costumes, and in decorating the house at the Wharton country place on the southern outskirts of the town. Wooden buildings and review stands were added to the house, and the grounds arranged for the tournament. The great ballroom was pale blue and rose pink, panelled with a small gold bead, and gorgeous with festoons of flowers, and these decorations were heightened with eighty-five great mirrors decked with rose pink silk, ribbons, and artificial flowers. The supper room was two hundred and ten feet long by forty feet wide and twenty-two feet high decorated in a similar way, and with fifty-six large pier glasses and hundreds of branches, lights, lustres, and tapers. Besides all this, there were drawing rooms, card rooms, and alcoves, and, most interesting of all, André himself was there, so glib in technical terms and the name for every shade of ribbon or hanging. André designed the invitation card. It was a shield with General Howe's crest and a view of the ocean and the setting sun. Any unfavorable implication in the setting sun was saved by the motto Lassio Descendens, Octo Splendori Resurgam which completed the fast dot asterisk. On the afternoon of May 18th the fate began with a grand regatta, which started on the river just where the line of redoubts touched the water side. There were galleys, barges and boats of all sorts covered with streamers and pennants, filled with ladies and officers, accompanied by all the bands and music of the army and surrounding the great central Huzza galley, with General Howe and the Admiral on board. Barges kept the swarms of spectator boats from pressing on the procession. The transports, gaily decorated and crowded with spectators, were placed in a line the whole length of the town's waterfront. The men of war anchored in line out in the stream, manned their yards, and covered their rigging with the flags of all nations, among which could be seen the rebel stars and stripes. The broadsides thundered salutes, and great clouds of white smoke rolled along the tide, while the procession of galleys, heaped up with the most brilliantly colored costumes, passed along. There had never been such a scene upon the Delaware. The procession passed down the river to the southern end of the town opposite to the Wharton Villa, and there, while the cannonading still continued, they landed on the pretty gravel beach and made another procession between lines of grenadiers and cavalry up through the lawn of the old country place to the pavilions. The trumpets sounded, the bands played again, and the mock tournament began on horses most richly caparisoned, ridden by knights and esquires, in white and red silk with banners, pennants, and mottos. The eye was dazzled by the gorgeous display of gold and blue and scarlet, and the lavishness of outlay and extravagance would have fed and clothed all the rebel armies for the rest of the war. There were ladies in gorgeous Turkish costumes with wondrous high turbans. Blue jackets from the ships stood in picturesque attitudes with drawn cutlasses. There were lines of jet black slaves in oriental costumes, with big silver collars round their necks and silver bracelets on their naked arms, who bent their heads to the ground as the general and the admiral, the mighty conquerors of all America, passed by. The trumpets were flourishing, the knights were shivering their spears and clattering their swords in what seemed a terrible conflict for the favor of the ladies and everywhere could be seen their extraordinary and infinitely silly mottos about love and glory. Heralds in black and orange dashed here and there on their horses, and there were proclamations that the knights of the burning mountain would contend, not by words, but by deeds, and prove that the ladies of the burning mountain excelled in virtue and beauty all others in the universe. And at last all the ladies, by their heralds stopped the supposed horrible carnage and declared themselves satisfied. But why should we tell how, when the tournament was over, they crowded about in the old country place, among triumphal arches, columns in the Tuscan order, 
imitation Siena marble, boom shells, and flaming hearts, and as night came on divided themselves among the pharaoh tables, the supper room, and the dancing hall. At ten they had fireworks, beginning with a magnificent bouquet of rockets, as Andre described it. The triumphal arches were illuminated with streaming rockets, bursting balloons, and transparencies. The shells and flaming hearts sent forth Chinese fountains. It was a most wonderful fate artifice, as Andre kept explaining, and why an army that had brought such a supply of fireworks with them had failed to put down the little rebellion was the mystery which he did not explain. The chief engineer had charge of the fate artifice, and his resources seemed to be boundless. At the end, fame appeared at the top of all the arches, spangled with stars, and blowing from her trumpet to conqueror how, in letters of light, the legend, thy laurels shall never fade, followed by a great forter of rockets as a punctuation mark to the legend. Then they all hurried back to the card rooms, the supper rooms, and the dancing hall, and gambled, et, and danced till morning, while all the bands of the army were playing and the wine was flowing to celebrate the most wonderful general that ever fought a war, and who had already accomplished a more extraordinary feat of arms than the world had ever known. So the conqueror returned with part of the fleet to England. Some three thousand Pennsylvania loyalists went with him, and they were best away, for the lives of some of them would be in danger if they remained and few if any of them would have become real Americans. How returned, Walpole said, richer in money than in laurels f and another London which remarked that he had no bays except those which drew his coach. But with that supreme indifference which characterized him he seems to have been entirely satisfied with what he had accomplished. The Tory ministry could not very well move against him for being too easy with the rebels, because he was their own appointed general, specially commissioned to carry out the sword and olive branch policy. Having trusted to his discretion and given him all necessary information, they could not very well assail him for having waived the olive branch to excess. In condemning him they would merely be proving their own mistake and playing into the hands of the Whigs. Their disgust and their desire to punish him were ill-concealed. Attacks upon him appeared in print in all sorts of forms and he finally asked for a committee of inquiry in Parliament. The ministry resisted this inquiry, knowing that it was intended as a covert attack upon themselves, and would be used to assist the Whigs. Asterisk how, with the assistance of two of his witnesses, Cornwallis and No Flint Gray, who stood by him manfully, certainly succeeded to a considerable degree in turning the proceeding to the support of his own party and their rallying cry that the American war was impracticable. 18. Cornwallis began his testimony by expressing the highest admiration for the military capacity and genius of his friend. He then described America, in a most amusing way, as a country of ambuscades at every few yards. It was impossible, he said, to learn the nature of the ground, either from the inhabitants or by reconnoitering, and it was also impossible to get provisions from the country. On the question of the failure to assist Burgoyne he was brief, vague, and evasive, and he refused to give an opinion on any of the military movements. On the vital point of Howe's reasons for all his movements he declined to answer questions, because, having been Howe's confidential officer, it would, he said, be improper for him to reveal to Parliament what he had learned in that capacity. When the dashing prisoner killer, no Flint Gray, was called he also described America as a horrible network of ambuscades. He had not the slightest hesitation in giving his opinion on any subject. He defended the failure to assist Burgoyne, and spent considerable time in showing that it was utterly impossible for the largest force how might have had to pass from New York up to Albany. He impaired the value of his testimony by being too willing a witness and making sweeping assertions. He said that there were scarcely any loyalists in America, and that the people were practically unanimous in favor of the rebellion. When asked about Valley Forge, he said that the rebels were in such large force that it was impossible to attack them. Then Lord George Germain, who was hot with indignation against Howe, called General Robertson and Galloway, 
who contradicted all that Cornwallis and Gray had said. General Robertson was an old Scotchman who had risen from the ranks, had served in the French War, and was very familiar with the colonies. He had been one of Howe's subordinates, had been barrack master at New York, and afterwards military governor of New York, in which offices he gained a very unsavory reputation for having made money by the irregular and fraudulent practices which were so common. His testimony, as well as that of Galloway, was, however, very clear and intelligent. They described the country very much as we know it, denied the ambuscades, said it was easy enough to reconnoitre, that there was no difficulty in procuring information, and Robertson explained how Burgoyne could have been saved by an expedition up the Hudson with a simultaneous attack upon New England. Other minor witnesses were called, but nothing definite was accomplished, and the committee made no report. Howe's defense was published as his narrative, and Galloway criticized it with considerable severity in his letters to a nobleman on the conduct of the war. Howe replied in his observations, and Galloway again assailed him in a reply to the observations of Lieutenant General Sir W. Howe. This last attack seems to have been the severest and most detailed arraignment of Howe that was published. Galloway openly accused him of being in league with a large section of the Whigs to let the rebellion go by default and give America independence. Howe's narrative is a most remarkable explanation. By means of vague general statements he gives the impression that the rebel forces always outnumbered his. If we can believe him, the American continent was swarming with vast hordes of rebels, which almost every hour were threatening the destruction of his little army which the ministry would not reinforce. It was wonderful that he had maintained himself unannihilated for three years. When he gives numbers he gives his own force by leaving out all the officers, but in counting the rebel force he adds officers and imaginary privates without limit. For example, at Brandywine, where he had 18,000 and Washington 11,000, he says he had only 14,000, but that Washington had about 15,000 exclusive of almost any number he pleased of militia. By a similar vague statement he makes it appear that the rebel forces in the year 1777 were 50,000, because the Congress had voted to raise that number. He complains on almost every page that the reinforcements he was continually asking for, with which to meet these vast innumerable hordes, were not furnished him. How, then, could he be expected to put down such a rebellion? The question might be asked how it happened, when the rebels were so numerous and dangerous, and his army was so small, that he placed two small outposts of fifteen hundred men each at Trenton and Bordentown, fifty miles away from his main army at New York. He describes the natural difficulties of the country, the opportunities for ambuscades, and the heat of the weather as insurmountable obstacles. If he had not always taken the greatest care in not going too near the vast masses of rebels, and in not letting them come near him, there would have been the greatest hazard to the king's troops. But he had always protected his army from the slightest check. His plan had been to keep his army intact, keep up the show of force and conciliate the rebels rather than run serious risks or resort to acts of severity. He attached great importance to his taking of Philadelphia and has much to say on the importance of maneuvering and occupying large towns rather than of destroying armies, although he admits in one passage that the defeat of the rebel army is the surest road to peace. 19. He took up again his old occupation in Parliament and joined heart and hand with the Whigs to prove more and more the impracticability of the American war and to cripple the administration of Lord North. Within three or four years, aided by the mistakes of Cornwallis, who returned to America, the Whigs were triumphantly successful, and, once more in power and office, they made, in 1783, a treaty of peace with the Patriots, granting them independence. Howe afterwards held important military offices, but never again took part in active war. He lived to the ripe age of 85, dying in 1814 so that he saw the second war for independence, and his brother's old friends obtain their independence on the ocean as well as on the land. 23. Clinton begins the wearing out process. 
Howe's successor, General Sir Henry Clinton, was about 40 years old, with much less military experience than Howe, but of good ability. He intended to put down the rebellion in true Tory fashion, he had instructions to that effect, and he knew how to do it. If he had had Howe's large army and opportunities he would have undoubtedly altered the course of history. With France against him his task was very difficult and seemed almost impossible, but he came within an ace of succeeding. The alliance of France with the Patriots had completely changed the situation. England could no longer concentrate large forces on the colonies, could no longer furnish the enormous army she had given Howe. Her military and naval forces during the next three years were scattered all over the world to resist France and protect the island of England from invasion. While we must confine ourselves in this volume to the details of the struggle in America, the vast extent of the European conflict in which the Patriot Party had been so lucky as to involve England must be carefully borne in mind. England had to protect herself with a large fleet and army in the West Indies, where, in spite of all her exertions, the French took from her the islands of Grenada and St. Vincent, and seriously threatened Jamaica. The great British stronghold of Gibraltar was besieged, the settlements in Senegambia captured and an invasion of England threatened in the summer of 1779. To save herself from complete overthrow and ruin, she was obliged to maintain for those three years a very large force scattered in various parts of the world. But of these she could spare for Clinton, as he bitterly complained in his narrative, only a third the force she had given Howe and with this reduced force he was expected to conquer the country from Boston to Charleston. In numbers he was at times superior to his enemy, and always superior in discipline, supplies, and the resources of a powerful and long-established nation. Clinton could undertake no extensive military operations or grand movements. The great strategic plan of controlling the whole line of the Hudson and cutting the colonies and Wayne must be abandoned. The two extreme ends of that line, Canada and the city of New York, could be easily held, and that was all that could be done. In short, so far as operations in the colonies were concerned, a totally new system must be adopted. Tarleton, in his narrative of this period of the war, tells us that he and some other military men believed that England should withdraw her force from the colonies and concentrate her whole power in crushing France alone especially in the West Indies. This policy was also recommended to the ministry by Lord Amherst, asterisk and apparently on the principle that if France were completely driven from the field the Patriot Party could be easily tired out, and the peaceful surrender of the colonies would soon follow as matter of course. There was undoubtedly something to be said in favor of this plan, but the plan adopted was to keep up the war at every point. The rebel colonists evidently could not take either New York or Canada. They could restrict the operations of the British Army, but they could not drive it out of America, and it was doubtful if the French could do so much as that. New York and Canada must therefore be held, and from them predatory expeditions could be sent out to all parts of the rebel colonies. British wealth and resources could keep this method going for years, and it would eventually wear out the rebels whose numbers were few and whose resources were limited. A peace of some sort, more or less favorable to the mother country, would be eventually concluded. This plan seems to have been essentially a sound one, more conservative than the plan mentioned by Tarleton and involving less risk. It worked very much as was expected, and came very near to being successful. All history shows that a patriot army like Washington's, living from hand to mouth, with no power to punish desertion or force enlistments, cannot in the long run endure a steady grinding process of a regular military establishment backed by a rich nation which considers it worthwhile to stand out to the end. Before this plan was put in operation and a new method of warfare adopted, the ministry resolved to make one supreme effort for conciliation and a peace which would preserve America as some sort of dependency of Great Britain, even if attached by a very slender thread. An act of Parliament was passed appointing commissioners, who spent the summer from June to October, 1778, in the colonies. 
by this same act the tea tax and the act changing the government of Massachusetts were repealed, the right of raising revenue from the colonies was renounced, and the commissioners were empowered to suspend the operation of any other act passed since 1763 and proclaim pardon and amnesty. In other words, complete independence from Parliament was offered, and the colonies could live merely under the king alone, as all their documents had said was the dearest wish of their hearts. According to an English pamphlet asterisk of this time, it was the intention to allow the colonies their own army and navy, Great Britain retaining the right of declaring peace or war with foreign powers, but every other sovereign power was to remain with the Congress of the colonies. Under the terms of this new offer, the colonies could have obtained far more independence than Canada, Australia, or any British colony now has, or has any prospect of obtaining comma an independence under a protectorate or suzerainty just short of absolute independence. 20. Some of the Whigs, especially the Duke of Richmond, Fox, and some of the followers of Lord Rockingham, were in favor of absolute independence, because it would settle the question at once save expense, and an independent America would trade with England as much as, if not more than, colonial America had traded. The mass of the Whigs, however, could not very well object to the new Tory peace proposals, for they were the same the Whigs had often urged. But they were sorry to see the Tories taking the wind out of the Whig sails. Old Lord Chatham, who, however much he favoured the Americans, was always furious at the thought of their being allowed independence, denounced the new proposals. He was carried into the House of Lords to make against the proposed peace the last speech of his life. At the close of his speech he fell fainting into his seat. His favor to the Americans did not extend so far as such a peace as that. He wanted the colonies to remain subservient dependencies, real colonies so that from his oration on this occasion we do not prepare quotations for our schoolboys to recite. Charles Lee, Arnold, and other patriots tinged with loyalism were in favor of accepting this very liberal offer of peace, and Gates wished for a conference with the commissioners. But the majority of the Patriot Party rejected the offer with derision, which shows how absurd it is to pretend that they had not wanted absolute independence and that it was forced upon them by England. Here was complete redress of grievances offered them, the very redress they had asked for when it was impolitic to use the word independence, and now they would not take it. The Congress was so confident of the temper of the Patriot Party that they freely circulated the printed peace proposals which were ridiculed and publicly burned by the Patriots. The peace negotiation having failed, the commissioners announced that now the character of the war would change. Devastation fire and sword, and the merciless vengeance, which some of the loyalists had already called for, would be wreaked upon the rebel country. In the early part of the war under Howe, they said, the English army went through your country with the greatest forbearance, because it was expected that we should soon be sitting once more with you under the shade of the same vine. We raised no contributions, destroyed no docks or storehouses, quitted Boston and Philadelphia without injury leaving large stores behind. We treated you as children and friends under a temporary separation. But now, as you have allied yourself with France, our hereditary and bitterest enemy, we shall treat you as a foreign enemy, as strangers to our blood, and we shall inflict upon you all the severities of war. There was, of course, an outburst of Whig eloquence in Parliament against the cruelty of this proclamation the barbarity of devastation and slaughter to be inflicted on English people who were to be tortured, killed, and robbed in order to make them affectionate colonists asterisk. The proclamation was issued October 3, 1778. But meantime, before we describe how it was carried out, we must get Clinton out of Philadelphia, where Howe had left him. The farce of occupying the town could no longer be kept up, especially in view of the new policy of severity. To leave Philadelphia and enter New York in safety was, however, no longer the child's play. Such movements had been to Howe with a large army and numerous transports and men of war. Clinton's army was much reduced in size, and while its numbers are uncertain, it was probably barely 10,000 men. 
21 Washington, with his usual advantage of spring and summer recruiting, had now about 11,000. The king appears to have wanted Clinton to go to New York by sea, which would seem to be the safest method, but for some reason he declined that plan. He decided to march his force straight across New Jersey, and he tells us, though without making it at all clear, that by doing this he saved both his army and the fleet. Asterisk. This crossing New Jersey with his reduced force was a somewhat daring project, and his masterly accomplishment of it won him considerable applause in Europe. His first difficulty would be in evacuating Philadelphia and crossing the Delaware, which would give Washington what was considered at that time the great advantage of attacking an army in the act of crossing a large river. His next difficulty would be his long march in hot weather through the Jersey sand, with his army and great baggage train strung out in a long line offering a tempting opportunity for a side attack. If he escaped this danger, how was he to get his 10,000 men into New York, which was surrounded with wide bodies of water? If he went straight towards New York, as the Pennsylvania Railroad now goes, he would become involved in the Raritan River and its marshes, and beyond the Raritan were other rivers and bodies of water. Washington might crowd him into these marshes, and, summoning a larger force of militia from all over the country, succeed in Burgoyning him. Asterisk. The first step of crossing the Delaware gave him no trouble. He placed three regiments on the Jersey side. The main body of his army marched down into the level neck of land south of the city at about three o'clock in the morning of June 18, crossed over to Gloucester by 10 a.m., and he was soon on his way through the sand accompanied by a large number of loyalists who intended to leave the country. The fleet containing General Howe and other loyalists immediately dropped down the river, part of the fleet going to England and the rest going with Admiral Howe to New York to help Clinton get into the town. Washington meantime had gone up to his favorite crossing place, Cory Ells Ferry, some miles above Trenton, and, as Clinton marched across Jersey, Washington was also crossing it, inclining towards Clinton, so that the two armies must inevitably meet. The British, as usual, had an immense quantity of baggage strung out in a line 8 or 12 miles long. A great deal of it belonged to the oilists and the rest no doubt was composed of the elaborate toilet articles, innumerable suits of clothes, bath tubs, and sporting implements of the officers. The heat was so intense that the heavily clad and heavily loaded regulars were sinking from exhaustion, and, many of them were found dead beside the springs and streams. Modern critics have inclined to the opinion that it was a rare chance for Washington to strike a terrible blow, but Washington and his officers, according to the account given by Lafayette, did not think that there was much to be gained by a battle. Asterisk. The two armies drew together at Monmouth, not far from the sea coast, and Washington saw his chance in a sudden early morning attack on a day when the heat registered 96 degrees in the shade. The battle which now took place is involved in some confusion. Washington expected a victory, and possibly might have had one, but George III had wisely abstained from hanging that great military genius, General Charles Lee. He had shrewdly allowed him to be exchanged, and here he was, second in command to Washington, who still had full confidence in him. He was given the honor of leading the attack, and at first declined under the pretense that such an attack was useless. He seems to have been influenced, as Lafayette reports, by the thought that the recent peace proposals might be accepted, and there was no need of risking a battle. Afterwards, when he saw the attack was to be made by Lafayette, he asked for the command of it, and it was given to him. He went forward as if with the full intention of carrying out the orders, but at the critical moment, with everything, as some have supposed, in his favor, La retreated. The British turned upon him, and were inflicting a severe loss, when Washington rushed to the rescue and with difficulty prevented a disaster. It was one of those occasions when Washington lost control of his passionate nature, and he cursed Lee as only he could curse. General Scott, who heard it, declared that in all his life he had never heard such oaths. Yes, sir, he swore till the leaves shook on the trees. 
he swore like an angel from heaven. Asterisk. On the other hand, English officers thought that Lee did all that could have been done, and that the Americans got off easily. Clinton's account of the battle agrees precisely with the account given by Lee. Both sides claimed a victory. Washington, whose eyes were now opened, had an unpleasant controversy with Lee, who was court-martialed and suspended from command for a year. He fought a duel with Lawrence, one of Washington's aides, and when he wrote a sneering letter to the Congress was expelled from the Patriot Army, and henceforth associated with loyalists, among whom he rightfully belonged. It was strongly suspected that his conduct at Monmouth was intended to bring disaster upon the Patriot Army or on Washington Asterisk Lee, as next in rank, might have taken command with an opportunity as head of the army to suggest a compromise peace on the basis of the British proposals just offered, which would have established his fortunes and reputation in English society. Neither side gained anything by Monmouth. Washington's chance, if he had won, was gone. Clinton got into New York in a most clever way. He kept clear of the Barreton and its marshes, and marched out on Sandy Hook, where the fleet took care of him and transported his troops into New York. His praises were sung in England and Europe. His retreat with his 10,000 was compared to the retreat of Xenophon and his 10,000 Greeks from Babylon to the sea. The Raritan was the Euphrates and the sand hills of Jersey were the mountains of Carducci. Asterisk. Washington took possession of the Hudson Highlands, which he began to fortify strongly, so as to prevent any movement from New York to seize that famous strategic point. He held the middle of the strategic line to Canada and the British the two ends. It was now a question of tricks, artifices, treachery, and endurance. The Loyalists and the English were hopeful, many Americans were becoming heartily sick of the anarchy, confusion, and lawlessness in the country, the hopelessly depreciated paper money, the stagnation and ruin of all legitimate business, the weakness and inefficiency of the Congress as a governing body, the selfishness and supposed corruption of many of its members, the danger that the country, unable to govern itself, would fall into the hands of France. At this point, on the 8th of July, the French fleet of 18 war vessels, under Count de Stein, and a force of 4,000 French soldiers, arrived off New York. A plan was formed to attack Clinton in New York, but it had to be abandoned, principally because several of Stein's ships were of too deep a draft for the water on the bar. The chances for the Americans to maintain an aggressive war seemed not to be increased by the alliance with France. One more effort, however, was made. Newport was still held by the British for the reason, as already shown, that it was the most convenient refuge harbour on the coast after Halifax. It would be a great event for the Patriots to take it. The New England militia were collected to the number of about 7,500. Washington sent 1,500, and the 4,000 French troops on the fleet made a force of 13,000. The plan was for the Americans to land on the east side of the island, the French on the west, and intervene between the town of Newport and the garrison on Butts Hill on the northern part of the island. General Pigott, who, with Howe, had led the charge at Bunker Hill, commanded at Newport, and, seeing the design of the Americans, he withdrew his force from Butts Hill and concentrated in the town. Sullivan, in command of the Americans, immediately took possession of Butts Hill, but the French could do nothing against the town, and the next day Admiral Howe was sighted with a fleet of British war vessels. Estain immediately sailed out to meet him, and Admiral Howe nearly had a battle. For two days the fleet maneuvered for the weather gauge, when a terrific storm, amounting almost to a tornado, arose, scattering both the fleets over the ocean, and when it had ceased each sought a refuge to refit. Estain returned to Newport, abandoned the attack, and, taking the 4,000 French troops on board, went to Boston to repair his vessels. Many of the New England militia disbanded in disgust, and it looked as if France, whatever she might do in absorbing England's attention elsewhere, would not be able to give much active assistance to the Patriot Army. Pigott attacked Sullivan on Butts Hill and was repulsed with severe loss. 
But the next day Sullivan had to abandon his position and retreat to the mainland, for Clinton was hurrying from New York with 5,000 men. But although the Patriots themselves were becoming less and less able to keep up anything resembling aggressive war, the aid of France was telling on their enemy. The French fleet, as soon as it could refit in Boston, went to the West Indies to threaten the British possessions there, and immediately 5,000 of Clinton's men were withdrawn and sent to help protect the West Indies. In the autumn of this year, 1778, Clinton felt himself so much weakened that he abandoned the garrison at Newport and concentrated his whole force in New York, which was now the only place held by the British in the rebellious colonies. Washington was also so much weakened that he could only hold himself in a sort of half circle above New York and watch his antagonist. The wearing down of the Patriots by a relentless severity, which the peace commissioners threatened when their negotiations failed, began before they left the country, and, in fact, soon after their arrival in June, 1778. The alliance of the rebel colonists with France was considered as having removed all reason for scrupulousness or restraint. In July of that year there was a terrible raid made into the Wyoming Valley of northern Pennsylvania by the loyalists and Indians of central New York. There was an heroic resistance by a handful of old men and boys but it was quickly overcome by the larger force of loyalists, British, and Indians. The resisting force of settlers was pursued and butchered without mercy, the fort set on fire, the prisoners thrown into the flames and held down with pitchforks, or arranged in a circle and slaughtered by the tomahawk of the Indian Queen Esther. When night came fires were kindled and the remaining prisoners chased, naked back and forth through the flames until they fell exhausted and were consumed. Many of the women and children who tried to escape eastward to the Hudson River perished in the forests and swamps, and the invading force went through the neighboring country burning every house, and shooting and scalping every human being that could be found, and working, in short, that complete devastation which the British in former years had used for breaking the independent spirit of Ireland and which the loyalists had been calling for as the only method that would save the American colonies for the British Empire. Asterisk. This was the first use of the Indians by the British. Howe would not use them, and the whole Whig party were unalterably opposed to their use. But the real typical British Tory was loose at last. Asterisk. It was no longer a half-Whig repression of the rebellion. The Patriot leaders, who had feared that their followers would grow lukewarm for want of British atrocities under Howe, had now enough and to spare. There was another raid into the Cherry Valley of New York, men, women, and children slaughtered, and the settlement wiped out of existence. The whole northern frontier was for months deluged in blood and murders which were not checked until, in the following year, 1779, Washington sent Sullivan with a force of 3,000 which broke forever the power of the Six Nations and the Loyalists of Central New York. In the autumn of 1778, Clinton, in pursuance of the wearing down policy, sent no flint greater raid the New England coast. He swept Martha's Vineyard, New Bedford, and Fairhaven with fire and sword, and destroyed all the shipping in the harbors. On his return he captured Baylor's troop of Virginia cavalry at Old Tappan on the Hudson and killed a large number of the prisoners. Asterisk. Soon afterwards, on October 15, Captain Ferguson made a dash at Egg Harbor and the neighborhood near what is now Tuckerton, on the coast of New Jersey. Admiral Howe had allowed this inlet from the sea to go unblockaded, and the Patriot Commerce and a swarm of thirty or more small privateering craft, which watched for British merchant vessels bound to New York, found it a good refuge. The Admiral had been content with keeping them out of New York and Delaware Bay. But by way of Egg Harbor they could send cargoes up the Mullica Creek to within 35 miles of Philadelphia by land. Ferguson was an officer in a British rifle company, had interested himself in introducing the rifle in the army, and is said to have invented a breech loader. His raid on Egg Harbor was most successful. He penetrated up into Mullica Creek destroying valuable property, and at night surprised Pulaski's legion, 
where there was another slaughtering of prisoners, asterisk. In the same autumn of 1778 Clinton also sent Colonel Campbell with 3,500 regulars from New York to Georgia, where they easily defeated the 1,200 militia of the Patriots, and on December 29th took Savannah, and soon afterwards Augusta. The British General Prevost advanced at the same time from Florida and took Sunbury, so that Georgia was declared to be out of revolt and in the peace of the king. Asterisk the troops were indulged in indiscriminate plunder, the prisoners treated with merciless severity, and most of the patriots who did not escape to the mountains saved themselves by taking the British oath of allegiance, which they afterwards considered themselves justified in breaking. In the hope of checking this British progress in the South, General Lincoln was sent to Charleston. But South Carolina was so much in dread of arising among her slaves that the local militia would render him no assistance. He obtained 2,000 militia from North Carolina, and, the British having been repulsed in an attack on Port Royal, Lincoln, at the end of February, 1779 sent Ash with 1,500 men to invade Georgia. The British retired from Augusta, and when Ash unwisely followed them they turned upon him, inflicting a terrible loss and killing and capturing over 1,000 of his men. In April Lincoln again invaded Georgia, and Prevost promptly invaded South Carolina, desolating the country, burning houses, crops, food supplies of every kind, slaughtering cattle, horses and even dogs, and leaving such a desert that over a thousand slaves died of famine. Prevost, however, could not take Charleston, and was obliged to return to Georgia. In that same spring of 1779, while this work was going on in Georgia and Carolina, Clinton sent General Matthews to Virginia, which had been undisturbed for a long time and was producing a great deal of tobacco. He sacked and burned Norfolk and Portsmouth, shot down unarmed citizens, and allowed his soldiers to ravish delicate and refined women. He plundered the neighboring country and the shores of Chesapeake Bay, destroying over a hundred ships and three hundred thousand hogsheads of tobacco. In July Tryon attacked the coast of Connecticut, burned the shipping at New Haven and the warehouses along the wharves, until he was driven out by the militia. The next day he attacked and burned Fairfield and afterwards Green Farms and Norwalk. All these severities, heavy, shocking, merciless blows, were delivered so as to affect the business and social relations of large districts of country. They were delivered in districts which had heretofore been free from the interference of the war, and where the people were enjoying a more or less profitable trade. They told severely on the Patriot cause, and Washington was powerless against them. Orators may say that the extreme Patriot Party grew more desperate and determined, but unfortunately it grew smaller. It lost the support of thousands who wished it success if it could be successful quickly. These people were not willing to fall back beyond the Algonies, they could not endure destruction of property, annihilation of business of every kind, and long years of waiting in the midst of universal devastation with nothing at the end of it but to go back under England or as might very well happen, become French colonies. It is difficult for us now to realize the deplorable state of the country, devastated and ruined, with the paper currency sunk so low that a bushel of corn cost $150 and a suit of clothes $2,000. This condition of things shows what Howe could have done with his large force if he had not, luckily for us, been a Whig and unwilling to encourage such raiders as Gray, Ferguson, and Matthews. Clinton, within a year after he assumed command, and with a force only one third the size of Howe's, and with France fighting England all over the world, was in a fair way to wear down the rebellion. He had done more in that year, or even in the first six months of it, than Howe had done in three years. If he could now stand steadily by his policy, and not take great risks, he might in time be given reinforcements and wear down the Patriots still faster. At the time Tryon ravaged the coast of Connecticut, in July, 1779, Washington planned an attack on Stony Point, on the Hudson. Stony Point was on the right bank of the river and, 
with Yerplunk Point opposite, guarded the entrance to the highlands. Washington had secured these two forts when, after the Battle of Monmouth, he began to settle himself in his position above New York. But Clinton came up the river and captured both the forts. It was now thought that Stony Point might be retaken as an offset to Tryon's raid into Connecticut. The attack was entrusted by Washington to General Wayne, of Pennsylvania, who, in reply to the request, instantly said that he would storm hell if Washington would prepare the plan. Wayne's command had been massacred at Paoli by no Flint Gray's terrible use of the bayonet. Wayne now followed his adversary's method of preventing his men firing their muskets, and at midnight of July 15, 1779, he led 1200 patriots, with not a gun loaded, across the causeway at low tide and out onto Stony Point. They rushed up over the embankments with such rapidity that they lost only 15 killed. Plunging in among the British garrison, they killed 63 with their bayonets, and the rest surrendered. It was one of the most heroic feats of the war, and there was no prisoner killing. But Stony Point could not be held. The Patriots had to abandon it again to Clinton within three or four days. The taking of it had been inspiriting, and brought Tryon back from his raid into Connecticut, but it was not of permanent value. No real headway could be made against Clinton's wearing out policy. About a month after the taking of Stony Point, Light Horse Harry Lee, of Virginia, the father of Robert E. Lee, of the Civil War, attacked in the same way the fort on Paulus Hook, which was a spitorismus of sand at the present site of Jersey City. He got into the fort and took 159 prisoners, but was obliged instantly to abandon it, because the British were coming to the rescue from New York. In September, 1779, Estain and his French fleet tried to help the Patriots. He had been fighting the British in the West Indies with considerable success. With the assistance of General Lincoln he laid siege to Savannah for three weeks, until, fearing the coming on of the tornado season, he tried to carry the town by assault, only to be heavily defeated with the loss of 1,000 men, while the British lost only 55. He sailed away, was caught in a tornado, and his fleet scattered to the West Indies and to France. Clinton's policy was succeeding to perfection, and he now prepared for another stroke. Leaving Niforson in New York, he sailed with 8,000 men in the end of December to Savannah, where, taking some of Prevost's troops, he marched overland upon Charleston. Lincoln, who commanded the town, should have abandoned it and saved his army. Collecting troops in it was merely increasing their numbers for a surrender. There was no fighting of any consequence and the town surrendered to Clinton May 12, 1780. Clinton immediately sent forces which reduced the whole of South Carolina to the possession of the British, and an incident occurred which shows how important it was to pursue the retreating patriots, and why Howe was so careful to abstain from such pursuits. A Virginia Patriot Corps, commanded by Colonel Bford, was marching down to the assistance of Charleston, but, hearing of the surrender, retreated northward. Colonel Tarleton pursued, and, although they had a long start, he caught up with them and killed or captured them nearly all, putting the prisoners to death with the most inhuman atrocity. Asterisk. Clinton placed Cornwallis in charge of South Carolina, and he inaugurated a most vigorous system of compelling the inhabitants to take the British Oath of Allegiance and also tried to compel them all to take part in re-establishing and maintaining the royal supremacy. Thousands of patriots took the oath of allegiance, intending to break it, as most of them did, at the first opportunity. They considered the oath as forced upon them to save their lives and property, and therefore not binding on their consciences. Other patriots took refuge in the swamps and forests of the interior very much as Washington had feared that the whole Patriot Party might be obliged to do. There was now for a long time a frightful scene of anarchy and confusion in South Carolina, with the British and Loyalists plundering, murdering, and confiscating, the Patriots retaliating as best they could, and the British officers and hangers on selling captured slaves and rice to the West Indies. To break the spirit of the Patriots and enforce submission, 
all non-combatants who would not turn loyalist were imprisoned and sometimes shot in their own houses in the presence of their wives and children, those who broke the oath of allegiance were hanged, hundreds were imprisoned and forced to serve in British ships and regiments, and the prison ships were such pest houses that three-fourths of those confined in them were quickly destroyed. The devastation of plantations and homes was so complete that the line of a British raid could be traced by the groups of women and children once of ample fortune sitting by fires in the woods. All this was done under instructions from the ministry sent through Germain and carried out by Lord Cornwallis, a Whig who had voted against the Stamp Act, but who, now that he was serving under Clinton with explicit instructions from the ministry, had completely changed his character. Asterisk. It was at this time, during the summer of 1780, that the Patriots, who would not take the oath of allegiance, and had retreated to the swamps and mountains of the interior, maintained, under Marion, Sumter, Pickens, and Williams, that partisan warfare which became so famous. Their numbers were insignificant. Their attacking parties were as small as twenty and seldom over one hundred. But the suddenness of their appearance, the fury of their attack, and the swiftness and secrecy of their flight were appalling to European soldiers. No small British outpost or settlement of loyalists was safe from them, and they would even attack a whole column upon the march, slash about with their swords made of old saw blades, shoot pewter bullets from their pistols, and escape. They show that there was good reason for Burke's warning and the anxiety of the ministry and some military men that the Patriot Party, if driven beyond the Algonies, would become a perpetual terror to British authority on the coast. While Marion and Sumter were at their work in the summer of 1780, General Gates, the hero of Saratoga, was sent to Hillsborough, North Carolina, to collect troops and attack the British in the south. In August with some 3,000 men, sick from bad food and exhausted by the climate, he arrived within 15 miles of Camden, the British stronghold in South Carolina, and was confronted by Lord Rawdon's army. Gates, unfortunately, hesitated for several days, and meanwhile Rawdon received reinforcements and Cornwallis came up from Charleston and took command. The two armies finally met, with swamps on the flanks of both sides, so that there could be no maneuvering, and the promptness and energy with which Cornwallis seized and followed up his advantages are in curious contrast to his conduct under Howe. It was a direct front attack. The Patriots were the more numerous, and those among them who had had experience in fighting fought desperately and gallantly. But most of the force was raw militia. The British regulars easily overwhelmed them, and, in reversal of the policy of Howe, such a vigorous pursuit was made that the whole American army was sent flying and scattering, and the number of killed and wounded has never been ascertained, unless we accept Cornwallis's statement of over 1,000 killed, 800 prisoners, and all the ammunition, baggage, and wagons. Asterisk. Howe had no more than held his own in the north and never touched the south. Clinton, with a third of Howe's force, held about as much of the north as Howe had held, did infinitely more damage to the rebels, and had conquered Carolina and Georgia in the south. He secured his hold on South Carolina by Charleston and a well-garrisoned line of forts and cantonments following the line of the Santee River from Georgetown at its mouth to Camden in the interior. There seemed to be no reason, if his methods were not interfered with, why he could not hold the two positions of New York and Carolina indefinitely, wearing out the rebel party more and more by small predatory expeditions, until they accepted such terms as the ministry chose to impose. Historians are agreed that this was the darkest hour of the revolution. French officers felt obliged to admit that the Patriot cause, in spite of the aid they had given it, was hopeless. Washington's army had almost disappeared. His men deserted to the British in hundreds. Only sporadic militia bands could be collected when their own neighborhood was attacked. Washington declared that such a situation could not last. The French would shortly be the only combatants on our side, and if they continued fighting altogether in the West Indies and other distant places the Patriot cause in America would die of sheer exhaustion. 
Lafayette had returned to France in February, 1779 to urge upon the French king the importance of sending an army directly to America as the only method of checking the terrible policy of Clinton, which was ruining the Patriots. He was successful, and a month before Gates's defeat at Camden Count Rochambe arrived at Newport with a fleet and 6,000 troops. Clinton and the Tory ministry were, however, equal to the occasion. The ministry sent Clinton reinforcements exactly calculated to offset this French assistance and keep up the wearing out policy, while in other parts of the world France was kept at bay with England's fleets and armies. Clinton, with most soldier-like promptness, started from New York with a strong force of men and ships, which blockaded the French fleet in Narragansett Bay. Rochambe had to keep his troops in Newport to support the fleet and there they remained inactive for a year, held tight in the grasp of the masterly Clinton, and almost as useless to the Patriots as though they were still in France. The rest of the French army which was coming over was, in a similar way, blockaded by a British fleet in the harbour of Brest, and never came to America. The strain of the situation was increased. The three antagonists, England, France, and the Patriot Party, were, so to speak, lying on the ground and holding one another down, but unable to fight. The weakest of the three was unfortunately the Patriot Party. It looked as if all the cautious careful work of Howe and the Whigs would go for naught. Whatever may have been their courage and their protestations or determination to persist to the last, it is doubtful if there was a single one of our people, not even Washington himself, that had in his heart any real hope for independence. A bad compromise, more unfavorable than the last one offered by the ministry, was the best they could expect. 24. Arnold, the loyalist, tries to save the British Empire. For more than a year Clinton had been preparing for another blow, the most staggering of all. Early in the year 1779 he had found that some important American officer was secretly communicating with him. Clinton continued the correspondence which was carried on for him by his adjutant general, André, the accomplished young Frenchman of Miss Chianza fame. In the summer of 1780, when the French army arrived at Newport and Gates was defeated at Camden, Clinton learned that his rebel correspondent had been placed in command of West Point, the most important patriot fortress on the Hudson and the key to the important strategic position for which all had been contending and that he was ready to arrange for surrendering to the British this Gibraltar of the Patriots, their only stronghold, to fortify which they had used their utmost efforts, and which covered all their stores of military supplies. General Arnold, who was prepared to make this surrender, was in character and temperament a loyalist. Nothing is more noticeable in the revolution than the way in which certain types of mind inevitably gravitated to the congenial side. Among a large number of the colonists one of the strongest motives to loyalism was social ambition, the desire either to remain with what was believed to be the most conspicuous fashion of the time or the hope of some day entering the circle. Arnold belonged to an old and respectable Connecticut family, which, however, had always been engaged in small trade. He was at one time an apothecary. He afterwards traded in horses and general merchandise to Canada, and took command of his own ship. He was fond of horsemanship, in which he excelled, and he was an excellent marksman with a pistol. These tastes and a perfection of courage and physique which won the admiration of both men and women were accompanied by a not unnatural passion to enter a sphere of life in which he believed he could excel. When, on his arrival at Quebec in 1775, he paraded his little army before the town, it was supposed that he was trying to show the people who had snubbed him on his trading expeditions that he now had the important command of a gentleman. Asterisk. Asterisk Codman, Arnold's Expedition to Quebec, p. 150. In the beginning of the revolution we find him quarrelling with an officer and knocking him down with his fists because he would not draw like a gentleman. In the Canada expedition we are told that his troops admired his heroism, and in almost the next sentence we are informed that he was hated, and numerous quarrels with him are described which are quite inexplicable. 
As he passed down to Ticonderoga he had another quarrel with the court-martial which rejected the testimony of the witness he offered. He protested against this rejection as improper and unjust, and as we read his protest there seems to be nothing in it out of the way. But the court instantly flared up against him, demanded an apology, and showed a feeling and indignation which cannot be accounted for by anything that Arnold had said. Their violence naturally drove him to reply with some force, and, as he had done nothing for which to apologize, he intimated his willingness to fight duels with them all. About the same time he had a quarrel with Colonel Brown, in which we cannot find Arnold particularly in the wrong, but Brown followed him up as if bent on vengeance for some offense that does not clearly appear. At the same time we find the great dislike for Arnold spreading to the Continental Congress. In spite of his heroism and his distinguished services they appointed above him five junior major generals, which has universally been regarded as an outrageous piece of injustice, and for which no reason has ever been given, except that many of the Patriot Party detested him. This extraordinary dislike, for which no reason is given, has aroused some comment and surprise comma asterisk and the explanation appears to be that those who came in close contact with Arnold could not endure his obvious loyalism and something in his manner, which may have been that overbearing and insolent tone which the loyalists imitated from the English. Prominent men among the patriots, like Washington and Gates, shielded Arnold as much as they could, regretted the apparent injustice that was done him and tried to soften his asperity and indignation, because they would not, if they could help it, lose his invaluable services. He won such distinction at the Battle of Saratoga, and was so badly wounded, that Congress was obliged to square accounts and give him the rank to which he was fully entitled. But nothing could stop his inevitable tendency. The French alliance, the increasing demoralization of Congress, and the increasing anarchy and devastation throughout the country made him more of a loyalist than ever. He had not been in favor of the Declaration of Independence, although, as he explained, he had acquiesced in it as a means of carrying on the war and obtaining redress of grievances, which was all for which, in his opinion, it was worthwhile to fight. After the victory at Saratoga, when the ministry sent out peace commissioners offering complete immunity from taxation and freedom from all control of parliament, the very redress which the patriots had originally said they wanted, Arnold was of the opinion that those terms should be accepted, and that it was not worthwhile for the patriots to pursue the war any further and dismember the British Empire, with the probability of falling into the hands of France. When Philadelphia was evacuated by the British in June, 1778, Arnold was placed by Washington in command of the town, and his real character and opinions instantly came out in a strong and conspicuous light. He associated exclusively with the Loyalists who had spent the previous winter with the British Army. He became extravagant in his style of living, and went into extravagant and reckless speculations to support it. He showed all the usual symptoms of a man whose consuming ambition is social position and attention. He quarreled with all the patriot leaders, and it was easy to do that because they detested him for the bearing he had assumed among the loyalists. They could not endure anything he did, even when it happened to be right. He soon became engaged to be married to Miss Margaret Shippen one of the most attractive and most prominent of the young loyalist ladies who had been so delighted with the visit of the British. It was a good marriage for his purpose. Her people were of that stripe of loyalists who would not leave the country, and yet clung to everything British in the hope that Britain would save them from the vulgarism of independence and the rights of men on the one hand and the French monarchy on the other. It is easy to understand how a man of Arnold's ability and force, in chief command of an important town, could, from his association with fashionable loyalists, put on an air and tone towards Reed, Mifflin, Robert Morris, and other patriot leaders that was unbearable, especially when they might see in his loyalism a strong tendency to treachery. The unbearableness of it is shown by their desperate attempts to get rid of him, drive him out of the army, and ruin him without giving any strong or reasonable ground for their action. They charged him with improperly admitting a ship into port, 
with using public wagons for carrying private property, of having improperly allowed people to enter the enemy's lines, of having improperly bought off a lawsuit, of having imposed menial offices on patriots, and of having improperly made purchases for his private benefit. They laid these charges before the Congress and sent them broadcast all over the country to the governors and legislatures with a purpose which is obvious. Arnold demanded an investigation, and the committee of the Congress which was appointed found all the charges groundless except granting the pass and using the public wagons, and as in these two instances there appeared no wrongful intent, they acquitted him of all the charges. Arnold now resigned from the army and soon after married Miss Shippen. But Reed and the others who had been in close contact with him in Philadelphia would not relent. They brought the subject again before the Congress, which recommended a trial by court martial. The court martial was appointed and made the same decision as the committee, except that it recommended that Arnold be reprimanded, because in the matter of the pass and the wagons, which were used to save private property from the enemy, while entirely guiltless of a wrong intent, he had been somewhat imprudent. The reprimand was evidently intended as a sort of compromise which would partially satisfy Arnold's persecutors, check their further proceedings, and save Arnold's services for the Patriot Army. Washington delivered the reprimand with the greatest gentleness and forbearance. But Arnold had now been for some time preparing to do what thousands of loyalists would have been glad to do if they had possessed Arnold's unscrupulousness. He was determined by one fell stroke to stop the war, preserve the integrity of the British Empire, put loyalism and loyalists in the ascendant, and give himself imperishable renown and an exalted station in England. In July, 1780, he applied to Washington for the command of West Point, and it was at once and gladly given to him. The events of that summer, the ruinous defeat of Gates at Camden and the locking up of one French army in Newport and another in Brest, were particularly favorable to his purposes. There was every human probability that the surrender of West Point with its 3,000 men, leading inevitably to the breaking up of Washington's whole position in the Hudson Highlands, would end the Patriot cause. Arnold seems to have timed his blow so as to follow closely upon the disaster to Gates in the south. In September he and Andrea were preparing the last details of their plan, and on the night of September 21st they arranged for a final meeting. Andre came up the Hudson in the British warship Vulture, and Arnold sent to the Vulture a boat in charge of Joshua Smith, a lawyer of means and prominence who lived in that region and one of the numerous persons who were not quite sure whether they were patriots or loyalists. The boat, by the testimony of both Arnold and the captain of the Vulture, carried a flag of truce. Andre, however, said it carried no flag when he returned in it. The boat took John Anderson, as Andre had been called in the correspondence, to a thicket of trees on the river shore, about four miles below Stony Point, where he met Gustavus, as Arnold was called. Andre was in his uniform and wore a light cloak or overcoat. Here we see the first slip in this most important plan of Clinton to end the war, this plan of most extraordinary luck and accidents. Andre, an attractive, fresh-faced young Anglo-Frenchman, of pretty accomplishments and parlor tricks, could superintend Miss Chianza tournaments and fireworks or write clever verses, but he was unfit for this terrible enterprise with Arnold. It was a mistake for him to go ashore. He could have arranged everything with Arnold from the Vulture by taking more time or compelling Arnold to come on board. The captain of the Vulture tried to restrain his impatience and dissuade him from going on shore, but to no purpose. The arrangements of the details of the surrender in the shadow of the thicket consumed the whole night and as daylight appeared the boatman refused to take the risk of a return to the vulture. Andre was persuaded to walk about a mile up the shore to the house of Joshua Smith, and there he and Arnold took their breakfast. While they were eating, the vulture was fired upon by Colonel Livingston's battery on the other side of the river and forced to fall down the stream, which was another accident unfavorable to Clinton and his plans. After breakfast Arnold returned in his barge to his headquarters. Having first given to Andre papers describing the fortifications, 
the signals to be given by the approaching British force, and the method of sudden and unexpected surrender. These papers Andre concealed in his stockings and waited at Smith's house all day. When night came Smith thought it unsafe to try to take Andre in a boat to the Vulture. He offered to take him check their further proceedings, and save Arnold's services for the Patriot Army. Washington delivered the reprimand with the greatest gentleness and forbearance. But Arnold had now been for some time preparing to do what thousands of loyalists would have been glad to do if they had possessed Arnold's unscrupulousness. He was determined by one fell stroke to stop the war, preserve the integrity of the British Empire, put loyalism and loyalists in the ascendant, and give himself imperishable renown and an exalted station in England. In July, 1780, he applied to Washington for the command of West Point, and it was at once and gladly given to him. The events of that summer, the ruinous defeat of Gates at Camden and the locking up of one French army in Newport and another in Brest, were particularly favorable to his purposes. There was every human probability that the surrender of West Point with its 3,000 men, leading inevitably to the breaking up of Washington's whole position in the Hudson Highlands, would end the Patriot cause. Arnold seems to have timed his blow so as to follow closely upon the disaster to Gates in the south. In September he and Andre were preparing the last details of their plan, and on the night of September 21st they arranged for a final meeting. Andre came up the Hudson in the British warship Vulture, and Arnold sent to the Vulture a boat in charge of Joshua Smith, a lawyer of means and prominence who lived in that region, and one of the numerous persons who were not quite sure whether they were patriots or loyalists. The boat, by the testimony of both Arnold and the captain of the Vulture, carried a flag of truce. Andre, however, said it carried no flag when he returned in it. The boat took John Anderson, as Andre had been called in the correspondence, to a thicket of trees on the river shore, about four miles below Stony Point, where he met Gustavus, as Arnold was called. Andre was in his uniform and wore a light cloak or overcoat. Here we see the first slip in this most important plan of Clinton to end the war, this plan of most extraordinary luck and accidents. Andre, an attractive, fresh-faced young Anglo-Frenchman, of pretty accomplishments and parlor tricks, could superintend Miss Chianza tournaments and fireworks or write clever verses, but he was unfit for this terrible enterprise with Arnold. It was a mistake for him to go ashore. He could have arranged everything with Arnold from the Vulture by taking more time or compelling Arnold to come on board. The captain of the Vulture tried to restrain his impatience and dissuade him from going on shore but to no purpose. The arrangements of the details of the surrender in the shadow of the thicket consumed the whole night, and as daylight appeared the boatman refused to take the risk of a return to the vulture. Andre was persuaded to walk about a mile up the shore to the house of Joshua Smith, and there he and Arnold took their breakfast. While they were eating, the vulture was fired upon by Colonel Livingston's battery on the other side of the river and forced to fall down the stream, which was another accident unfavorable to Clinton and his plans. After breakfast Arnold returned in his barge to his headquarters. Having first given to Andre papers describing the fortifications, the signals to be given by the approaching British force, and the method of sudden and unexpected surrender. These papers Andre concealed in his stockings and waited at Smith's house all day. When night came Smith thought it unsafe to try to take Andre in a boat to the Vulture. He offered to take him by land all the way to New York, and Andre reluctantly consented. He disguised himself in some of Smith's clothes, crossed the ferry to the east side of the Hudson, and in company with Smith pursued his way on horseback towards the British lines at White Plains. He was within the American lines in disguise and with papers on his person for the betrayal of a fortress. Clinton had specially warned him against the disguise and the papers because they would constitute him a spy in the full meaning of the word. Nevertheless, he and Smith, by the aid of passes which Arnold had given them, passed successfully by Patriot guards and even stopped and talked with them. As they approached the neutral ground, however, 
they feared to enter it and stopped at a farmhouse to sleep for the rest of the night. The neutral ground between the two armies was infested by skinners, so called because they usually stripped and robbed then victims, and by cowboys who seized cattle for the British army. The skinners called themselves patriots, and the cowboys professed to be British, but they were both alike marauders who levied tribute and plundered quite indiscriminately. The next morning Smith conducted Andre a little distance into the neutral ground and then returned to report to Arnold. This was another accident, for if Smith had continued to fulfill his task Andre would undoubtedly have escaped to New York. Even alone he would in all probability have reached New York and carried out all of Arnold's plans if he had not made an unfortunate turn in the road. He was getting on successfully and had even met with and talked to several patriots. But something a boy told him about scouts ahead led him to alter his course, and when near the present Tarry town he was stopped at the roadside by three skinners, Paulding, Williams, and Van Wart, who were playing cards and watching for plunder and vengeance on some cowboys, who had killed and robbed a neighbor some days before. When Andre artlessly said that he hoped they were of the lower party, which meant the cowboys, they said they were, and one of them pointed to his green hessian coat. Andre then foolishly announced himself a British officer on important business. They ordered him to dismount and told him they were Americans. He then helplessly changed his ground and showed Arnold's pass, but in spite of it they searched him and finding the papers in his stockings, declared him their prize to be delivered to the nearest patriot officer. They took from him his watch, money, horse, and equipment, which were divided among them and afterwards sold. Andre offered them large rewards if they would take him to New York, and increased the offer until it is said to have reached one thousand pounds. But after consultation among themselves they refused it and carried him to Colonel Jameson, the nearest patriot commander. They were young men all under twenty-three, and their refusal of the large bribe has been sometimes credited in our history to their sterling patriotic virtue. They were rewarded by Congress with pensions and gifts of land. But it is only fair that the reader should know that their virtue was denied by many people familiar with the circumstances, and particularly by Major Tallmadge, who maintained that they disregarded the bribe because they had no faith in its being paid. They consulted a long time about it and decided that the risk was too great. If they allowed Andre to enter New York, or even if they kept him concealed and sent a messenger with the letter he offered to write, no arrangement for receiving the reward could be made that might not also involve a detachment sent out to capture them. If they had seen the least prospect of safely receiving the reward, or any substantial part of it, Tallmadge believed that they would have let Andre enter New York. They saw more profit in the immediate spoil of the prisoner and in turning him over to the nearest American officer. While they had served as militiamen in the Patriot Army they were regarded as bad and indiscriminate marauders, and some of the people of the neutral ground accused them of being cowboys as well as skinners one. Colonel Jameson was astounded when they delivered to him their prize with the papers. He was unable to believe that Arnold was a traitor. There must be, he thought some honest explanation, and he innocently sent Andre with a guard accompanied by a letter of explanation to Arnold, and sent the papers to Washington. Andre had now a good chance of escape if he reached Arnold. But not long after the guards started Major Tallmadge reached Jameson's quarters, and his remonstrances induced Jameson to send after the guard and bring back Andre, which was accomplished when Andre had only about an hour between himself and freedom but Jameson still insisted on letting the letter of explanation go to Arnold. The game was now up. Andre was sent to Washington. Arnold received the letter when at breakfast, waiting for Washington and his staff, who had just returned from an interview with the French General Rochambe, at Hartford. With superb coolness Arnold read the letter, ordered his barge manned, said that he had been suddenly called across the river, and went upstairs. His wife followed him and fell fainting at the announcement he made. He called a maid to attend her, rushed down to his barge, and displaying his handkerchief as a white flag, was rowed to the British warship Vulture. 
he was rewarded with a gift of at least £6,315 in money, which was a fortune in those days. His wife was given a pension of £500 a year, and each of his children £100 a year. He had also a command in the British Army with perquisites and opportunities. Although some of the Whigs avoided his company, he was well received by the Tory aristocracy and the king, and his family finally married into the peerage. He accomplished a large part of his ambition. Had he succeeded in surrendering West Point, he would have no doubt been made a peer. His sons entered the British Army, and his descendants still occupy positions of respectability in England, devoting themselves to the enlargement of the British Dominion which was the only cause their ancestor had had at heart. Asterisk. Soon after his escape to the Vulture he published an explanation of his conduct, describing his leaning towards loyalism, and his disapproval of the Declaration of Independence, except as a mere means of obtaining a redress of grievances. He denounced the persistence in war and the attempt to dismember the British Empire after the peace terms of 1778 which offered all the redress of grievances which the Patriots had originally demanded. He denounced also the alliance with France, a monarchy too feeble to establish your independence so perilous to her distant dominions, the enemy of the Protestant faith, and fraudulently avowing an affection for the liberties of mankind while she holds her native sons in vassalage and chains. He announced that henceforth he would devote himself to the reunion of the British Empire, and there is no question that there never had been any other project to which he could be sincerely devoted. As to the method he had attempted to use in taking leave of the Patriots he had no excuse to offer, except that if a blow was to be struck the vastness and importance of the issues at stake justified the striking of the most heavy and telling blow that could be given. As for poor Andre, he had been within the American lines in disguise with papers in his stockings revealing a plan to capture West Point. British officers and British historians have usually maintained that he was a mere prisoner, protected from execution by the flag of truce, which Arnold and the captain of the Vulture declared was carried by Joshua Smith when he brought André ashore. But André himself settled this question. The board of officers appointed to try him asked him if he had come ashore from the Vulture under a flag and he frankly replied that he had not, and had never considered himself as under the protection of a flag. There was, therefore, nothing that could be done except to hang him as a common spy. It was one of the saddest and most pathetic scenes in all history. André's French delicacy, frank courage, and charm of manner won the hearts of his captors and of all the patriots in a way that would have been beyond the power of any Englishman, he should have been on the American side, as the rest of his countrymen were. As it was, his utter incapacity for such an enterprise as that of Arnold's had saved them from ruin, and was, perhaps, another debt they owed to France. Crowds of people from all the country round, men, women, and children, came to see him die. Most of them would have torn Arnold limb from limb, but they were weeping over Andre everything he did charmed them, the touching letter he wrote to Washington asking to be shot instead of hanged, the outline of his beautiful, slender figure as he stood upon the gallows, his arranging with his own hands the noose around his neck and turning down his collar. No patriot could be found who would perform the task of executioner. They had to procure one of the halfway loyalist breed, who blackened his face and disguised himself, so that he could never again be recognized. 25. Cornwallis brings the war to an end at Yorktown. The ruin from which the Patriot cause had just escaped by a most lucky chain of circumstances is brought home to us by the mutiny among the troops which followed during that same autumn. The soldiers were almost as ragged and starved as they had been at Valley Forge. They had not been paid even in depreciated continental money for a year. The time of those who, after the Battle of Saratoga, had enlisted for three years or during the war was about to expire. They refused to re-enlist, and demanded their discharge and their money. On January 1, 1781, 1300 of them stationed at Morristown marched for Philadelphia under command of three sergeants, with the intention of forcing the Congress to pay them. 
Such a disorderly event caused much ridicule among the loyalists and the British, and seemed to show that the end was near. By the greatest exertions of leading patriots, who met them at Princeton, the mutineers were quieted and prevented from reaching Philadelphia, but this was done by yielding to all their demands for discharge and pay. Another small detachment that threatened mutiny was subdued by force and by the shooting of two of the ringleaders. But Washington's whole army was on the eve of dissolution. The Patriots had from the beginning of the war fitted out numerous privateers to prey on British commerce. They had met with success which was considered brilliant and heroic for a small and unorganized people fighting the great maritime power of the world. But even with the determination of Admiral Howe to do as little harm as possible, the result of the privateering was against them. They had destroyed 600 British merchant vessels, but British men of war had destroyed 900 American vessels. This proportion of loss, if continued much longer, would wipe out the Patriot shipping, while England could, from her vast commercial resources, easily endure her share of the damage. In the hope of making the loss more equal and of offsetting the raids made by Clinton's army, the French furnished Paul Jones, already distinguished as a privateersman, with a little squadron of four vessels, of which the Bonham Richard was the flagship. On the 23rd of September, 1779, the Bonham Richard fought and compelled the surrender of the British frigate Serapis in one of the most remarkable naval battles of history. The Serapis was the superior vessel, and damaged the Bonham Richard so seriously that she sank soon after the surrender. The purpose for which Paul Jones had been sent out was not accomplished, and he could not get another squadron with which to assail the British Marine. But he won immortal personal renown for having captured and compelled the surrender of the ship that had been able to sink his vessel. The moral effect of his victory in delighting all the continental nations which hated England was not without importance. England bullied and insulted the merchant vessels of all nations. She claimed and exercised the right to seize vessels of any neutral nation carrying the cargoes of a nation with which she was at war. She was driving the continental trading people to unite in establishing the modern principle that neutral ships make free goods except certain military supplies, called contraband of war. From hatred of England all continental Europe was gradually coming to the side of the weak and despairing Patriot Party in America. In June, 1779, Spain, in addition to the money furnished to the Americans, allied herself with France, and declared war against England without recognizing our independence or entering into an alliance with a people who were setting such a bad example to her South American colonies. England made great efforts to secure an alliance with Russia and hire Russian troops to go out to America, as she had hired the Hessians. She even went so far as to offer Russia large territorial concessions and the valuable island of Menorca. But Russia had merchant vessels carrying the goods of all nations and no navy to protect them so she preferred to give the American insurgents every chance of success. Prussia also had a merchant marine, but no navy, and so Prussia encouraged Russia to withhold assistance from England. With Holland England was in a condition of semi-war, seizing and searching Dutch ships and secretly longing for an excuse to exterminate her most dangerous rival in the commercial world, and punish her for joining the League of the Armed Neutrality of the Continent which had for its purpose the establishment of the doctrine that free ships make free goods and the indirect assistance of the American insurgents. The excuse to strike Holland soon came, and in a curious way. The Patriot Congress had for some time been trying to persuade the thrifty Hollanders to give active assistance. Henry Lawrence, of South Carolina, resigned from the presidency of the Congress to go on a mission to Holland, but in crossing the ocean in October, 1780, he was captured by a British cruiser. He destroyed most of his papers, but the draft of a proposed commercial treaty with Holland he threw into the sea, and the British sailors rescued it. Although it was merely a tentative proposal, signed by American and Netherland officials, the British ministry deemed it sufficient for their purpose. Without waiting for a formal declaration of war, 
the British fleet seized 200 Dutch merchant vessels with cargoes valued at $5 million, and on December 20 war was declared. But before news of the declaration could reach Street Eustatius, a powerful British fleet under Rodney hastened to that famous Dutch island, which had been the center and seat of the American smuggling trade against the British navigation laws, and recently the source of supplies which, as Rodney said, alone supported the infamous American rebellion. The island, which had only about 50 soldiers, surrendered, and the British seized and confiscated every article of property on it, public and private, amounting to $15 million, even the private property of their own merchants, took 180 merchant vessels, seven Dutch men of war, turned all the people of the island adrift, and left nothing but the bare rocks. They kept the Dutch flag flying for two months, which decoyed into the trap some 17 merchant ships. Holland, however, did not succumb to these acts, which were intended to crush and terrify her. She replied by making vigorous war on England, so that the Patriot Party had now the alliance of Holland which they had been seeking. It was a question of how long the British ministry could carry on war with France, Spain, and Holland as well as with the Americans, and endure the secret hostility of Prussia and Russia. It was a lucky condition of affairs for the Patriot Party, a situation of such general hostility to England as has never since occurred, or there would be more independent nations in the world. Any serious disaster might now drive the ministry from power and bring about the event for which the Patriot Party had been waiting seven years common namely, the entrance into office of their friends the Buckingham Whigs. Meanwhile, during the winter of 1780-81 a new condition of affairs, contrary to all Clinton's plans, was arising in the South. The ministry was now thoroughly persuaded that the rebellion could never be subdued except by the utmost severity. Clinton's severity having proved itself so successful, they thought that it ought to be carried out more widely and boldly, and made to cover more ground. But Clinton had carefully abstained from such a reckless extension, because he knew the risk of such a policy with his small force. Cornwallis's victory over Gates, and the devastation, cruelty, and killing of prisoners and non combatants by which he had subjugated South Carolina, raised him in the estimation of the ministry as perhaps a better man for their purpose than Clinton. Cornwallis despised Clinton's policy, called it mere tobacco stealing and seems to have urged the ministry to change it. They accordingly encouraged Cornwallis in a way that was very unpleasant for Clinton, and Cornwallis was finally so convinced of his own importance that he would not obey Clinton's orders or carry out his policy. 2. Clinton took the precaution of asking to be recalled, and yet when given permission to resign whenever he chose he seems to have been unwilling to do so and give the command to Cornwallis, who, he believed, was conducting military operations in a way to force the resignation. Cornwallis was a very uncertain person. As how subordinate he had been lax and indifferent to the verge of incompetency. He failed to pursue Washington through Jersey in 1776. He allowed the Patriot Army to escape when he had it cornered at Trenton. He defended Howe's extraordinary move to Philadelphia, and was neither aggressive nor severe but under Clinton and the new methods of the ministry he completely changed. He carried pursuit, energy, and aggressiveness to an extreme, did many of the things which he had testified before the Howe Committee of Inquiry could not be done, and became as cruel and merciless an officer as was ever turned loose to crush independence and patriotism. As he was a Whig member of Parliament, and apparently a chameleon politician without strong convictions, his conduct may be explainable by some political condition of the time of which we are not informed, and mere personal ambition may possibly be the explanation. Clinton who was a rather straightforward person, and not a political general, seems to have been unable to acquire the least respect for either the ability or character of Cornwallis, who before he came to America was described by Junius as a Whig, who toadied to Tories and shifted his company as well as his opinions. Asterisk. The British forces under Cornwallis had a firm control of South Carolina. 
It was Clinton's plan to keep this control and the control of New York, and wait quietly for favorable circumstance carrot, occasionally sending out a severe predatory expedition in such a way that the safety and return of the expedition would be amply secured. As reinforcements were obtained the predatory expeditions could be made more and more severe until the patriots were worn out. Cornwallis, either from the encouragement of the ministry, the elation of his victory over Gates, or for undisclosed ambitions or political reasons, began to branch out recklessly. He started to invade North Carolina in force, and, instead of mere predatory expeditions, separated himself far from his base and strongholds at Camden and Charleston. In September, 1780, just about the time that Andre and Arnold met with failure on the Hudson, Cornwallis left Tarleton with a reduced force to take care of South Carolina, and moved up to Charlotte, in North Carolina. At the same time he sent the prisoner killing Ferguson, of Egg Harbor fame, with about 1,000 loyalists, to press far to the westward near the Algonies, enlist more loyalists, and rejoin him at Charlotte. The fate of Ferguson, and the increasing difficulties of Cornwallis, immediately showed the madness of this move and the soundness of the waiting policy. Patriot partisans and hunters of the Marion and Sumter type swarmed all round Cornwallis, cutting off his messengers and foraging parties, and inflicting endless delay and annoyance. Ferguson, moving westward, followed up the mobile and elusive Americans until he was far into Rutherford County. This was the signal for the Patriot frontiersmen, who now saw their chance. From north, south, and west the riflemen came pouring in by hundreds to catch Ferguson in the trap and cut him off. By the beginning of October, three thousand of these dirty mongrels as he called them, had collected, outnumbering him more than two to one. He began retreating to Cornwallis at Charlotte, but they pressed him so close that he had no choice but to stop and fight. He selected King's Mountain, three sides of which were sloping and approachable while the fourth side was a steep and unapproachable precipice. By placing himself with his rear to the precipice he imagined that he had an impregnable position. But he had made the mistake of placing himself in a position from which, in case of disaster, it was impossible to retreat. He had also made another fatal mistake, for the ground up the slopes was covered with large pine trees standing far apart, with no underbrush but many large moss-covered boulders. It was the ideal ground for the riflemen. They swarmed up all three sides of the slopes, firing as sharp shooters from behind the trees and boulders, moving forward gradually from tree to tree, as they picked off regulars and loyalists. When the British charged down and were scattered and confused by the boulders and trees, they received a deadly flank fire from the riflemen, and whichever way they turned they were shot from all sides, very much as at Braddock's famous defeat. The Americans fought in frontier fashion without particular orders, each man for himself, and thoroughly understanding the work. They kept closing up towards the summit until one of them put a ball through the prisoner killer, tumbling him from his horse, which dashed down the slope among the boulders. His men held their ground for some time afterwards, but, being unable to escape, were compelled to raise the white flag and surrender. They had lost 400 killed and wounded, while the riflemen had lost only 88. It was another instance to show that if England reduced the seaboard communities to colonies, another tier of self-willed and aggressive republics would spring up beyond the mountains. Asterisk. The riflemen, after striking this blow, scattered to their homes in the mountains, showing again what an elusive as well as deadly foe they could be. Before separating they began to kill their prisoners, in retaliation for British prisoner killing, and had hanged ten of them when they were stopped by their commander Campbell. Cornwallis, after the loss of Ferguson's whole command, fell back from Charlotte into South Carolina to recuperate and wait for reinforcements. One would suppose that he had now seen the folly of attempting to penetrate for long distances into North Carolina. The loyalists, upon whom he had relied to rise and assist him, were, as one of his own officers explained, comma asterisk mostly of the sort which have been described as the hesitating, 
uncertain class. They were for whichever side was successful, and since Ferguson's defeat they were refusing to enlist with the British and breaking their oaths of allegiance, a condition of mind which was encouraged by a defeat which Sumter inflicted on Tarleton at the Battle of Blackstock Hill. The Northern Patriots were greatly encouraged and saw their opportunity in the methods of Cornwallis. Washington made great efforts to have General Green put in command of all the Patriot forces that could be collected in the South, and the services of Daniel Morgan were also secured. Both Green and Morgan had been rather ill-used and refused promotion by the Congress, which at this period was a most factious, petty-minded, and ridiculous body which gave no promise of future good government at Patriot hands in America. The language of contempt which the English, the Loyalists, and some of the Patriots applied to it seems to have been entirely deserved. The situation now became a pretty chessboard, a real game of war. Clinton sent Arnold with a force of 1600 to replace in Virginia the force of Leslie, who had sailed for Charleston to help hold South Carolina, while Cornwallis played his pranks to the northward. As a check upon Arnold in Virginia and to prevent him assisting Cornwallis, Washington sent to that province a force under Steuben, and later under Lafayette. Green rapidly collected forces of riflemen, horsemen, militia, and every fighting man he could find. There were not many of them, barely 2,000, while Cornwallis had over 3,000. Green divided his army into two divisions. The larger division of about 1,100 he led in person, and established it at Traw Hill, on the Peddy River, near the coast, whence Marion and Light Horse Harry Lee from Virginia could raid round Cornwallis's right and endanger his communications. The remainder of Green's force, about 900 strong, and commanded by Morgan, was sent westward to annoy the left wing of Cornwallis and here Colonel Washington, a cousin of the general, was the raider, destroying in one dash a British force of 250 men. This disposition of forces by Green has always been regarded as most skillful, for Cornwallis could not very well concentrate his whole force upon either division of his enemy without having the other division fall upon his flank or rear or cut his communications. It was also part of Green's plan, as being the weaker party, to wait until he was attacked, and be attacked upon ground of his own choosing. Cornwallis divided his army to correspond with Greens. He sent Tarleton with 1,100 men to attack Morgan's 900, and he himself led his remaining 2,000 against Greens 1,100. In spite of all warnings and against the advice of Tarleton, he had now returned to his original plan of invading North Carolina and he even destroyed his heavy baggage and wagons and prepared to cut himself loose from all his communications with South Carolina. He was giving the Patriots their grandest opportunity in the war. Morgan fell back to ground that suited his purpose, a place near King's Mountain, called the Cowpens, where cattle were collected from the surrounding grazing country. He placed himself with the river in his immediate rear, which, if he were defeated, would largely cut off his retreat, but he did this, he said, to prevent his militia from running too soon. He then prepared a formation which seems to have been entirely original, the result of careful thought and thorough knowledge of his material. He placed the raw militia far in the front to receive the first onset of the British, and told them that he expected them to fire only two volleys at killing distance. After that they could run and he showed them how to run round the left flank of the rest of his troops, and get behind the main body of them, where they could reform at their leisure and recover themselves. There seems to have been infinite shrewdness in this arrangement. It was a plan which had been much discussed and urged in opposition to Washington, who thought that militia should not be used in that way. About 150 yards behind the militia Morgan placed his picked troops on a slight hill, and 150 yards farther back he placed his cavalry under Colonel Washington. Tarleton attacked, in his dashing, eager style, at sunrise. The militia received him better than was expected, and retreated as they had been told. The British instantly spread out and rushed at the second line of Americans, intending to flank them on both sides. 
The second line avoided this movement by falling back to the position of the cavalry. At the same time the cavalry circled round and attacked the British right flank, and the militia, having been reformed, circled round the other side and attacked the British left. The second line retreated no farther, but, after delivering their fire at thirty yards, charged the British. Asterisk. Asterisk Magazine of American History, Volume 30. p. 207. It was a most remarkable battle, comma, the first originally contrived battle that had been fought by the Patriots. They lost only 73 killed and wounded, while the British lost 230 and surrendered 600 prisoners. In fact, Tarleton was almost as completely rooted as Ferguson had been. He escaped on his horse, after a savage but bloodless sword combat with Washington. Our good friend Cornwallis had now lost two of his commands, and was apparently eager to lose a third. He was pressing north and trying to cut off Morgan from joining Green. It was a race between them, but Morgan was more lightly equipped, and by a rapid march crossed the Catawba ahead of Cornwallis. Green, learning of Morgan's success at the Cowpens, and that he was moving north, with Cornwallis chasing him, at once started his whole force northward from Traw Hill, so as to draw Cornwallis farther and farther northward. Cornwallis was now beaten. Having lost such a large part of his army, his only safe course was to fall back to his stronghold in South Carolina. But he seemed determined to go into the trap, and, having destroyed his heavy baggage, pressed faster and faster northward to the place to which Green was leading him. In doing this he was disobeying Clinton's orders, and running a frightful risk with everything against him. Asterisk. Asterisk Clinton's Notes to Steersman's America Vol. 2. pp. 195, 817, 825. Green, leaving the command of the larger division to General Huger, had crossed over to Morgan's division and taken command of it. The two divisions were moving northward, gradually converging towards each other, with Cornwallis, like a trained dog, closely following Morgan's division. It was the beginning of February, 1781, rainy, muddy, and the streams all swollen. Green's divisions carried boats on wheels, and could cross the streams more rapidly than Cornwallis who could have been led all the way up into Pennsylvania if it had been necessary to take him that far. Green's men were too few to fight, and they were in a wretched, ragged condition, with only one blanket to four men, their shoes worn out and their bleeding feet tracking the ground, as at Princeton and Valley Forge. On the 9th of February Green's converging divisions met at Guilford Courthouse, in northern North Carolina. He wanted to stop and fight but could not get reinforcements from the Virginia Patriot force, which Arnold held in a tight grip. So he moved on, with Cornwallis following, passed into Virginia, and crossed the Han River. This was too large a stream for Cornwallis. He turned back and went southward a few miles to Hillsborough, declared a conquest of North Carolina, and issued proclamations to encourage the Loyalists. Fearing that his prey might escape southward, Green returned into North Carolina, and for three weeks the two armies dodged each other, while Green waited for reinforcements. They came at last. He had 4,000 men to Cornwallis's 2,000. The trap was complete. He selected Guilford Courthouse as the place where he wished to be attacked, and, on March 15, arranged his men in three divisions, one behind the other, with the worst militia in front almost exactly as Morgan had done at the Cowpens. The only difference was that the distances between the divisions was very long, comma, some 300 to 400 yards, comma, and the cavalry was placed on the flanks instead of in the rear. Cornwallis came up and attacked exactly where he was wanted, but he fought better and more carefully than Tarleton. It was a most severely contested battle, lasting five hours, with heavy losses on both sides and at the end of it Green considered himself fortunate to be able to fall back in safety. When he found that his men were in a secure position he fainted from exhaustion. Cornwallis, too, 
was quite willing to retire to a strong position after his nominal victory. In effect he had given the day and the war to the Americans. After his severe loss he could not fight again. He should have fallen back on South Carolina and saved it, as he had been ordered to do by Clinton, in case he should be unsuccessful in North Carolina. Asterisk but to Clinton's bitter mortification Cornwallis retreated to the nearest seaport, which was Wilmington. From there he could have gone back to Charleston by sea and still saved Clinton's policy. Green assumed that he would do this, and as soon as he saw him about to enter Wilmington, he started in hot haste to strike a blow in unprotected South Carolina and Georgia before Cornwallis could reach them by sea. The excellent system of cantonments following the valley of the Santee River, from Georgetown at its mouth up to Camden and 96, by which Clinton's skill had secured British control of South Carolina, had been left weakly manned and were ripe for an attack. Green hastened to reach them, but he need not have been in such a hurry, for Cornwallis gave him all the time he needed. On the 18th of April, while Green threatened Camden, Marion attacked Fort Watson, which was an old Indian mound in the midst of level land. With the originality which had now become so characteristic of the Patriot officers, one of Marion's subordinates, Major Mayhem, suggested cutting pine logs and building them into a sort of tower from which to shoot down into the fort. This was quickly done. The tower filled with riflemen, and the fort surrendered. This surrender broke the line of communication in the British cantonments. Lord Rawdon sallied out of Camden, attacked Green at Hobcock's Hill, and drove him from his position. But Rawdon, with his line of communication to the sea broken, could not hold Camden. He abandoned it and retreated to Monk's Corner, close to Georgetown and the mouth of the river. Green, by merely fighting losing battles, now quickly disposed of all the other interior cantonments, and Light Horse Harry Lee went down into Georgia and took Augusta. Rawdon drove Green from the Siege of 96, but had to fall back to the coast as he had done from Camden. 96 was abandoned June 29th and Rawdon retired to Orangeburg to protect Charleston. The heat was becoming too excessive for the endurance of either army. They went into summer quarters. Rawdon remained at Orangeburg and Green summoned his troops on the high hills of Santee. But where was Cornwallis all this time? Why had he not come from Wilmington to save South Carolina? One would have supposed that he had sufficiently broken up the effective system of Clinton, and might now be willing to save or restore it at the last moment. It seems, however, that he was determined to make a present of South Carolina to Green, and a present of himself to any Patriot officer who would take him. After reaching Wilmington on the 7th of April, he had remained there a little over two weeks, and then, to the surprise of everyone and the disgust and indignation of Clinton, he went, not by sea to South Carolina, but by land to Virginia, which he reached May 20th, and joined the forces which were there under Arnold. Clinton declared that the movement of Cornwallis to Wilmington and thence to Virginia was inexplicable on any military grounds, and by this he may have intended to intimate that he thought there was a personal reason or perhaps a political one. The ministry, Clinton says, finally saw the folly and danger of Cornwallis's methods, but too late. One year more of the careful wearing out process, Clinton said, would have exhausted the Patriot Party and ended the war. Asterisk. Arnold returned to New York, and Cornwallis assumed command of the British Virginia force of about 5,000 men. He actually wrote to Clinton urging him to abandon New York, and to come with his whole force down to Virginia and help hold that province. How had followed the policy of occupying towns and abandoning them. Cornwallis wished to occupy provinces and abandon them. He had previously advised Clinton to scatter his forces by attempting to hold every port where the French might land. During the whole of June, while Green was destroying the enfeebled works in South Carolina, Cornwallis chased the small Patriot force under Lafayette up and down through Virginia. Lafayette was a mere youth of 23, but he never allowed the British general to come up with him, and avoided giving battle. 
they merely played at hide and seek with each other all over the ground which, in the Civil War, was so desperately contested by the Union and Confederate armies. From Williamsburg, where an unimportant engagement was fought, to Charlottesville, where Tarleton tried to capture Thomas Jefferson, through the valleys of the James, Chickahominy, and Panmunkey, was the scene of their game. In August they stopped the sport and went into summer quarters. Cornwallis placed himself at Yorktown, close to Chesapeake Bay and sea communication, and Lafayette stationed himself at Malvern Hill, near the James, to keep watch on his queer antagonist. While they rested in this position green, on the 22 d of August, finding his men increased in numbers and in good condition, would not wait until cooler weather. He marched his army in the cool of the mornings and evenings to attack the British at Orangeburg. They fell back on Newtor Springs, where, on September 8, a battle was fought in which they were at first driven from their position, but formed a new line which they held. Being, however, unable to assume the aggressive, they retreated the next day to Charleston, and that ended Green's campaign. He could not drive them from Charleston any more than Washington could drive Clinton from New York, and, like New York, Charleston was held by the British until the close of the war. But Green had reconquered Georgia and all the interior of South Carolina. The Patriot State Government of South Carolina was restored, and Cornwallis's gift of that province and Georgia was complete. Map showing the wandering campaign of Cornwallis from Camden to Yorktown. Without the slightest military necessity for it Cornwallis had turned the situation in America upside down. From a situation where it was a mere question of time for the British to wear out the Patriots, his genius had brought about a state of affairs in which the Patriots had begun to wear out the British. With South Carolina lost, with New York so weakened to support Cornwallis in his uncertain migrations about Virginia that Clinton could no longer keep the French army locked up in Newport, the opportunity of a deadly and sudden blow was presented to Washington. 3. With the French army set free to aid him, it seemed as if he could surely strike Clinton in New York and take that stronghold. The natural place for attack seemed to everyone to be New York, because it was nearest, and from the time of Greene's first successes in South Carolina Washington had been planning with the French General Rochambe for such an attack. It was proposed to summon to their assistance the French fleet under Count de Grasse which had been fighting the English in the West Indies. The fleet was summoned, and started from the West Indies on the 14th of August. Everybody, including Clinton himself, looked forward to the attack upon New York as the most obvious policy of the Patriot and French forces. On the 19th of August, leaving Heath with about 4,000 men to hold West Point, on the Hudson, Washington, with 2,000 Patriot troops and accompanied by Rochambe with 4,000 French soldiers, started down into New Jersey with the evident intention of going out on Staten Island to cooperate with the French fleet that had already left the West Indies. But after passing New Brunswick the army was surprised to find itself directed away from Staten Island, and not until it had crossed the Delaware and almost reached Philadelphia did the country or Clinton realize that it was making a dash at Cornwallis in Virginia. It had now too much of a start for Clinton to hope to stop it. It quickly reached the head of Chesapeake Bay, was put aboard ships, and on the 18th of September was confronting Cornwallis at Yorktown, with all the Patriot forces in Virginia added to its numbers. This was the first opportunity Washington had had to show any marked ability in what is usually called generalship. For six years his skill had been displayed principally in tact and patience in holding together a half-organized mob, enthusiastic for the rights of man. The tact and patience and force of character with which he did this were marvelous, but they were not what is usually called great military ability. In fact, his tasks during most of the revolution required certain statesmanlike qualities rather than military talent or genius. He had fought two battles, Long Island and Brandywine, which he was sure to lose, and he had lost them as courageously and with as little disaster as could have been expected. Trenton and Princeton were clever, brilliant little strokes, 
but they were mere outpost affairs which might or might not imply the possession of high talent. The move on Yorktown, however, the whole conception of it, which was entirely his, and the sudden and at first veiled execution of it, have given him, in the eyes of military authorities, a far higher position as a soldier than all his previous career was able to bestow. The secret of the movement had been faithfully kept by himself, Rochambe, and de Grasse. The fleet under Count de Grasse had arrived in the mouth of the Chesapeake about the time that Washington and Rochambe crossed the Delaware River. The British fleet under Admiral Hood, that had been protecting the West Indies, outsailed de Grasse in coming up the coast, and reached New York which was supposed to be de Grasse's destination. On learning of his presence in the Chesapeake to assist in the destruction of Cornwallis, the fleet returned under Admiral Graves, together with the ships he had commanded on the New York station. On September 5, the day Washington and Rochambe were embarking at the head of the bay, de Grasse and Graves fought a naval battle at the mouth of the bay, from which, after two hours, Graves withdrew with a loss of some three hundred men and three crippled ships. Seeing that de Grasse was clearly too strong for him, he returned to New York, and the trap round Cornwallis was complete, for he could no longer rely upon reinforcements or assistance from the British fleet, which he had hoped would be able to come into the river at Yorktown. He went through a form of resistance while the Americans and French besieged him, and dug parallels of approach during the rest of September and for two weeks in October. But, seeing the futility of resistance, he finally surrendered on October 17, the anniversary of Burgoyne's surrender four years before. Asterisk. Clinton had gone by sea to his aid, but, arriving too late, he returned to New York. Arnold conducted in September a most savage and murderous prisoner killing raid at New London, Connecticut, but it was too late. Asterisk the predatory expeditions were no longer of any use. There was no more fighting, although the Treaty of Peace was not signed until September 3, 1783. Clinton's clever policy had reached an inglorious end. The ministry could not survive the surrender of Cornwallis in addition to the wars with France. Spain, and Holland. The Whig minority, which had at one time during the war become so small that it almost disappeared, began to increase with great rapidity. The government's majority decreased on every important vote until it had only a majority of one, and on the next vote it was in the minority. The famous Tory ministry of Lord North resigned, and at the request of the King a ministry was formed of Rockingham Whigs. Even these Whigs were slow about signing that most detestable of all things to an Englishman a document admitting that another country has a right to existence as a nation. They delayed long, they avoided the word independence, they wondered if some other arrangement could not be made, if some suzerainty could not be retained, and, as a matter of fact, they retained suzerainty on the sea and searched our ships as they pleased until 1812. An impression prevails among Americans that, as a result of the revolution, England learned to retain her colonies by the affectionate method comma the method without military force or coercion, which such Whigs as Burke and Chatham recommended. It is supposed that England has now acknowledged that the demands of our Patriot Party were reasonable, that they form a proper method of colonial government, which she has herself adopted and that if she had yielded to those demands in 1776 America would still be a part of the British Empire. These extraordinary notions are continually being fostered, either directly or indirectly, in volumes which pass as history. But England, so far from acknowledging the soundness of the method of Burke and Chatham, or the reasonableness of our demands, has governed her colonies ever since our revolution by a method which is directly the reverse. No English colony has now any of the rights which were demanded by the Americans of 1776, nor any hope of obtaining them except by a rebellion and war which would be assisted by some powerful nation. The main contention of our Patriot Party was that Parliament should exercise no authority in the colonies, should be considered constitutionally incapacitated from passing an act to regulate the colonies and that the colonies should be attached to England merely by a protectorate from the crown. This demand was rejected by England, 
and would now be considered as so completely out of the question that no one of her present colonies would think of suggesting it, for if there is anything that is absolutely settled in English political or constitutional law it is that Parliament has the same supreme and omnipotent power in every British colony that it is in London. As for the other demand of our Patriot Party, that England should not keep a standing army in a colony or build fortifications in it except by that colony's consent, it was, of course, rejected by England, because it necessarily destroyed the colonial relation and meant independence, and in England's present colonial system, which is maintained solely by the overwhelming power of an army and navy, such a right in a colony would be too ridiculous to be mentioned. In fact, England considers herself entitled to do, and habitually does, in any of her colonies, almost every one of the things against which our people protested or rebelled. For one of the strongest incentives our people had for taking arms was Parliament's alteration of the Charter and Government of Massachusetts. They contended that Parliament could not alter the Charter or Government of a colony without that colony's consent. But England now alters any colonial charter or constitution as she pleases, withdraws or suspends it, and no colony dreams of denying her right to do so. It is true that England exercises these powers with as much forbearance and caution as is possible, she is conciliatory and friendly, and grants such freedom as she considers is not inconsistent with the maintenance of her dominion. She was certainly extremely liberal and forbearing with us for a hundred years while France held Canada, and most cautious, conciliatory, and even yielding in repealing the Stamp Act and the Paint, Paper, and Glass Act in the early stages of the Revolution. But English colonists, so far from having any of the rights for which we contended, have no rights at all in the American sense of the word. They are dependent on the charitable consideration or the politic forbearance of the mother country. Their condition can be changed at any moment. They are what John Adams and Hamilton described as political slaves. They have what they call their constitutional relations, but the word constitutional does not with them mean a fixed principle as with us. In the statement of constitutional rules, it must be recollected that any emergencies may cause them to be broken. Improper action by the colonists, or a particular party of them, might compel Parliament to legislate in disregard of the ordinary maxims of policy. Jenkins, British Rule and Jurisdiction Beyond the Seas, p. 12. Judging by Great Britain's conduct during the years following our revolution, the lesson she drew from it was that the greatest mistake that could be made in governing colonies was to grant them privileges and concessions or to yield to their violent demands, for such yielding builds up the Patriot Party which always exists in every community. Asterisk our revolution caused England to tighten, not to loosen, her grip on her dependencies. It even caused her to be tyrannical and cruel, which, it cannot be said, she had been with us previous to Clinton's command in 1778. It was after our revolution that she began that system of injustice to the Dutch of Cape Colony, described in Thiel's History of South Africa, which finally drove them to make the grand trek into the interior and found the Transvaal and the Orange Free State. Asterisk Report of American Historical Association, Volume I. pp. 375-386 British Rule and Jurisdiction Beyond the Seas, p. 8. England's colonies can no longer raise, as we did, the question as to what the word colony means. We held it to mean an independent state beyond the jurisdiction of Parliament, making its own laws as it pleased, and connected with the mother country only by a protectorate to prevent foreign interference or invasion. But a modern English colony, even if allowed the utmost limit of self government, is under the full jurisdiction of Parliament, enacts its laws, subject to the veto of the home government, and is ruled by a governor sent out from England. Every British colony is now held down to this or a more severe condition by a military and naval force so overwhelming that there is no use even of discussing resistance or change. The Patriot Party must remain quiescent, and adopt, like our ancestors, 
the phraseology of loyalty until some distant day in the future when England's power shall wane. The theory of such Whigs as Chatham and Burke that colonies could be retained by some mysterious or rhetorical sentiments and without coercion or military force, has long since been exploded. Sentiment and conciliation and most elaborately friendly explanations are often used by England after complete subjugation. But conciliation without overwhelming force or subjugation merely builds up the Patriot or Independence Party. No community of people, naturally separated from others geographically, or by race, trade, or any strong circumstance, as Hamilton, Dean Tucker, and all the authors of the rights of man so often explained, ever willingly remains a colony. The instinct to set up housekeeping for itself and resent outside interference is as natural and as strong as the same instinct in the individual. The stronger the manhood in the community, and the more effective the occupations of the inhabitants in developing primal manhood, the stronger will be the tendency to independence, and the stronger and more desperate the Patriot Party. There will also always be a loyalist party, just as there will always be a certain number of individuals who prefer to live in lodgings, or other people's houses, and do not want a family. Sedentary, professional, or servile occupations often tend to increase the number of these loyalists. It is a question of mere calculation for the dominant country how much military force must be used to encourage the loyalist and keep the Patriot Party below the line of hope for in colonies, loyalty, like Napoleon's providence, is altogether a question of the heavy artillery.